And if you're listening on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the show, like this episode, so I can keep putting these out directly on YouTube because we're trying something new out. Please uh, subscribe uh, and like the show right now as you're uh, right before you get ready to drift off. Uh, and that'll make it possible for us to keep putting the shows out in this new new style we're trying. All right, everybody, we're talking about a season four, episode 21, The Drumhead. And again, I wanted to try try to keep up our uh, Klingon and that other species uh, uh, c- c- culture whose name I already forgot. Uh, I'm sure. Oh, Romulans, of course, Romulans. Uh, this episode starts off Captain's log. They got a Klingon exobiologist on board, scientific exchange program. Uh, but he's involved in some trouble, a little breach, uh, possible warp drive messing with it. And it opens with uh, Riker, uh, Tro- you know, after the captain, so like Riker and Troy with the uh, uh, wharf uh, looking on, interviewing this uh, uh, this person. Uh, let's say, let's see. He said, must be a mistake. They say, are you working with the Romulans? He has a very nice leather outfit on. Yeah, he did have a question, like, do, uh, do Riker and Troy uh, do all of these type of interviews, these interviews uh, where people are, uh... and then I said, is this the courtroom they're doing the interview in? Uh, he keeps saying he didn't do it, 12B9, take 36, he was on the computer. Yeah, let's see what happens, uh, let's see, uh, Jadon. Uh, schematic drawings. So he's like uh, sending send info to the Romulans, they think, or messing with the ship or and or. Uh, too much. Uh, he said, I wasn't involved with the messing with the ship. Uh, he, do, uh, uh, he goes, You're just saying that because I'm Klingon. Worf says, What? Uh, Troy says, Our chief of security is a Klingon, has nothing to do with it. He says, Just send me home then. And Riker says, yeah, we already called home. Uh, Klingons, uh, you're, you're waiting for you as soon as we're done. Then he does a Jedi move where he says, I have nothing more to say here. And they see Worf bring him back to his room. Riker's got a serious look on his face. He says, what do you think? And uh, Troy says, hard to tell. He's closed off, hiding something for sure. And uh, then they're on the elevator, the two Klingons. Uh, he says, you swore if you got, you don't even exist on uh, our home world. It's too bad. So sorry. Man without honor. And Orr says, like, when Scoot says men without ties don't dress for dinner. And they get off the elevator, walking down the hall. Uh, he says, hey, I got friends. I could clear it up back on our home world. I could talk to them. Restore your name, and you just gotta give me a shuttlecraft. He starts wharf uh, before. Uh, let's see, all passive aggressive. He goes, yeah, I can get you out of trouble without knowing about it. And then wharf does a bunch of action moves when they get in the ship. He goes, I don't know how you got this data off the ship uh, to the Romulans, but I'm gonna find out. And he goes, I'm gonna tell the Klingon High Council all about it. So you're gonna be in ho- trouble at home too, Mister. Uh, uh, know it all. Let's see. Worf and Dude on lifts. Uh, all passive aggressive. Worf tries to ignore powerful friends. Help me get away. Oh yeah, Dude puts hand out and uh, at the door to stop Worf. Uh, once in the room, Worf schools him. Uh, then the episode opens. There's the opening. She, Captain's log supplemental. We see two ships. Something about Admiral Seti. So I guess I'm going to look that up. I'm, I'm recording on locate. I mean, not on the road right now. So I'm going to uh, look this up right now. So I'm going to pause it. Uh, then there's intros all around. Okay, so I'm just going to do the facts in here. Uh, so uh, let's see. I have here Nora Seti, S-A-T-I, Admiral Seti, Rear Admiral Seti. Uh, 24th century, daughter of renowned Starfleet judge, uh, civil liberties a- advocate, Aaron Sati. She's a renowned investigator. Uh, we'll, we'll, she, there's a lot of family stuff in here. Uh, she worked, what does a rear admiral mean? Uh, that's one I look up here. 
A rear admiral was a flag officer rank used by naval organizations between the grades of Commodore and Vice Admiral. Uh, this rank was used by the Federation Starfleet and Earth Starfleet. Uh, some systems use uh, two tiers of rear admiral rank, rear admiral upper half and lower half. Wouldn't it be left and right half if we're talking about the rear? But I'm not, I mean, maybe, I don't know. On, do uh, Romulans have uh, a different shape of rear? Or port? is that starboard? I guess they shouldn't be doing material right now, but... Uh, uh, rear admirals such as James T. Kirk. Uh, so uh, Kirk was a rear admiral. A lot of people say that about uh, William, Bill Shatner, too. Okay, so that's just a little bit about uh, Rear Admiral Satsy that I, in Rear Admirals. Uh, so the episode opens. Let's go through my notes here. And then we'll go through the tape. Uh, it, would do, it starts with intros all around, but they, so Admiral Satie's arrived. We'll go through the dial. Like they say, let's get right to work. Uh, she has a staff of two, and uh, she wants to inspect the engineering room right away. She meets Data and Jordy. 49 hang. A visual log. 49 something. Oh, 49 maybe. I don't know. Visual log. Four days ago, it's oh three hundred hours. Somebody says, and uh, she says, "I think I'm gonna in, in, uh, need a full briefing." I put real, oh, really breathy. Maybe I said Earl Gray. Then she has a meeting with the uh, Picard. Earl Gray, uh, and for her, uh, she mistakes uh, when uh, he cling on Romulan connection. Uh, she is withholding something, alliance versus business at hand. Uh, Worf shows up, she gives Worf a long look. Uh, let's see, Worf shows up, she gives Worf a long look. Uh, Worf uh, finds the optical reader, so he finds a way. He found the way that the other Klingon was getting the information off, uh, and they can pass it on to other people, kind of like... Uh, What's that like a twenty three? For but anyway, they, they like he says they could pass it on to somebody and they don't even know, like a micro dot type thing back in the day. Yeah, uh, oh yeah, body top secret. Like you put a micro dot, it looks like somebody's freckle. So you'll freckle a uh, micro dot with microfiche uh, with secret information. I want you to contact Picard now. How question? Oh, Picard has a questioning look on his face at 38, 35. Uh, she turns fast. Extremely valuable, that officer in this. Okay, so let's see what ha- happened with, like, with the visuals. Uh, yeah, they say, okay, Captain's log, uh, Admiral Satie's arriving. Uh, she arrives with uh, two, two, two assistants, uh, one who doesn't really speak but does a lot of uh, uh, transcription, I think. Uh, Sabin, Genistar from Beta Z, and then Nellan Torre from Deleb 2, and then Riker gets to meet everybody. He bows his head. Uh, they say, well, how about we going to your quarters? That's a common question, and everybody's common answer is, nope, let's get right to work. So I guess that might be a test on Starfleet. Uh, and then it's just Riker seat of the staff. Uh, so Picard and the Admiral walk off. When Riker walks out of the room, he looks back at whoever was working the uh, transporter. Uh, Commander LaForge, uh, Commander Data, or, I don't know, Data, radi- rad levels are dropping, isolation doors down. Uh, they, oh, they'll be able to get in in 49 hours. Uh, they look at the visual log, which now they say, yeah, check the nest cam. You know, we got it all on there. It, it was a squirrel, it, it, but uh, this one, it's not. Uh, so four days ago, oh, 300 hours, uh, warp drive flames out. Uh, yeah, sensor log 44765.2, and uh, every, we don't, you know, it's inconclusive uh, if it was a squirrel or a Klingon. Any assessments? The data says a slow motion study suggests a uh, articulation flame, frame problem, and that was the the uh, what the uh, those are some of the schematics uh, that that uh, guy had. 
And Data says, "Well, we got other, uh, we got other evidence. We only we got some circ- plenty of circumstantial stuff. Uh, uh, we're building a circumstantial case. Her eyes are wide." And she says, Captain, I need a full briefing. That's when she says that before we go any further. By all means, Admiral. She looks back in on the thing. She says, I don't envy you two with your jobs. Uh, Good luck. Then we get a shot to the Enterprise. And uh, this is when the tea's getting made. So it looks like she takes her cream or tea with milk or tea. Uh, I don't know if they're both having Earl Grey, uh, but hers is a paler one where Picard's just, you know, this regular uh, robust uh, color. That's tough to tell. You know, it looks uh, it looks like a black tea, but, you know, we don't have any light behind it. Talking about, the you know, this alliance with the uh, Klingons and the Romulans, possible alliance we keep hearing about. And now Worf comes in. Worf says, yo, yo, yo. Uh, sorry, I didn't expect uh, the Admiral here. Uh, head of security, Worf. Uh, this is when Worf kind of says, yeah, here's how they did it. Microdot uh, Freckle. Uh, you know, optical reader. He, he had the, you know, optical reader part in there. And high-tech stuff, you know, they had it. You know, they used to have it in the uh, Cold War. But then it was only fiction, you know. He says, yeah, I'll be honored. She says, why don't you interview the dude? He says, I'll be honored. Uh, and then she that's when she turns fast, when Picard has that look. Uh, she says, he's going to be extremely valuable. Uh, and we see the ship again. Worf's uh, grilling the uh, other um, uh, Klingon. You know, Trace says, Freckles, man. And I know something's up. I don't know what it is. Uh, everybody's watching. Dude says it doesn't prove anything. You don't have any real stuff. Uh, he goes, well, I found this in your room. Uh, I, you know, a uh, uh, thing that puts data in uh, fake freckles. Uh, optical chip reader. Only one function. Uh, you know, reading of chips. Uh, this, In this case, in freckle form. And then the guy does a little bit of, uh, you know, you can't handle the truth type thing. And Romulans are strong. Humans aren't too much, you know, too much empathy, too much compassion. Worf doesn't like that. Uh, and the Admiral says, everybody chill here. And she goes, what did you do to the dilithium chamber, dude? And he goes, nothing. I'm, uh, you know, and she goes, coincidence? Uh, I don't think so. You were dealing in the plans. And he goes, I know, I didn't, you know, he goes, I didn't do that. And he, she goes, you're lying. He goes, not now, not now. Maybe I was lying about that freckle stuff, but not lying about that. Uh, and she says, Worf, take him away. And then we have uh, Picard pulls his shirt down, stands, uh, walks over. Her beta said, uh, says, uh, he's telling the truth about the um, freckles. He goes, and I think about the, that he didn't do anything to the dilithium chamber. chamber. And then they say someone else might be involved. And then she says, dun, 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 winter soldier time. Uh, there's someone else. And they do a slow zoom to Picard's face. Uh, let me see what else I got on here. Uh, my handwritten notes. Worf doing interview with Ambassador, her crew, uh, you know, freckle reader. Uh, case closed, Joe. That's what he says. Uh, you can't handle the truth. Like weak, they say. How did you do that? Uh, it had nothing to do with the Y line now. Klingon has on command. Communi- oh, yeah, I noticed he had on a um, communicator. And they said, I, I don't know if everybody has one. I just, it just stuck out to me. Okay, post conference, the beta said, beta said, beta said. Uh, says it's telling the truth. Uh, Zoom, someone else involved. The card look. Uh, then there's a commercial break. Uh, then more tea time with the Picard and the ambassador. This time from a pot. Uh, and uh, Picard, I think Picard takes one lump of uh, sugar in his tea. Double question mark. Uh, she has uh, some big, big glass uh, tea 
wrap or tea set. Oh, tea drop, teardrop earrings. Uh, she has some big glass teardrop earrings. And uh, they were getting along well, talking father. Oh, so her and Picard get along well for a little while. They talk about her father, one of Picard's heroes. Uh, she says, all that I am, I owe to him. And he says, you must miss him. And she gets uh, honest. Uh, we were quite a team. Or we could be, oh, she gets honest. I think she says, oh, well, you know, I'll go to the dialogue here and the video. But uh, I think she says, I usually am a, like a lone wolf. But now I think we could have, be a good team. And Picard smiles. Okay, let's see what the video shows here. We see the Enterprise. We get a, a rear admiral view of that. They're in her room, so she's bringing the tea over. So it's an interesting thing. And Picard prefers his tea straight, uh, right, straight in a glass. Uh, some people prefer pouring their tea. Picard's hands are crossed. Great, some nice plants in her room. Her tea set's interesting, too. It's like purple, green, and yellow, and red. Uh, so some nice colors. So I wonder if, like, how that, uh, how what's that thing called? The molecular constructor or whatever decides, uh, uh, to, you know, do that. Uh, oh, she says, yeah, my father doesn't do, told me to avoid partnerships. I said, well, it sounds like if I've, I've, said, I've, said, I've said the same thing. Yeah. Uh, no partnerships, period. Like she, he was talking about a business, so. And noticing now, though, I think her earrings are flat, and and then they're not exact. They're teardrop shaped, uh, but not 3D. And then they have some etching on the inside. I can't tell if it's a uh, bouquet of flowers or. I thought it might have been something else. Uh, if Picard really work like he says, he, he like works the compliments. He goes, "Oh, I bet you're the best debater in your family." Uh, you know, then there's an emotion. You know, where it said, "Jesus, miss my dad." Uh, you know, he was uh, he was the best. Uh, and this is when she says, uh, "In her her eyes are new, like really great acting again." Uh, uh, and it, this is a tough role because this is a really. Uh, I, I watched this episode a few times, so like a year or two ago, and it was like a. Uh, Really ranging role. Uh, then we have Picard and uh, 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 I'm afraid I forgot the name of the Betazoid gentleman, but uh, they're kind of going over their notes, uh, talking. He says, "She's I don't mind telling you, I'm surprised. You know, I heard your father was a man with no no name, and you were uh, a singer of Men Without Ties Don't Dress for Dinner." And he was the one who helped the uh, Romulans. And Picard goes, it's nobody's business but my own, dude. And he goes, well, you know, I had to think, you know, I have to suspect everybody, but I don't suspect you anymore. So I told the Admiral that uh, you don't have to prove you're loyal. Worf goes, don't worry, man, I'm on this. Uh, I'm looking into it. He has a serious Worf look. And that guy goes, good, you, we're counting on you, Lieutenant. Uh, and Worf goes, yeah, I'm going to get right back to work. Don't worry. Serious look from the Betazoid, dude. Now we're back in court. Uh, and who's on the stand uh, being questioned? And this is an unofficial capacity, I believe. Uh, uh, but Dr. Crusher, she's kind of kicked back, relaxed. Uh, and they said, Geez, so you met with this dude. Uh, he was under your care. Uh, like, uh, he had a lot of questions about freckles and, uh, they go, yeah, it didn't seem like any big deal. Uh, he was a pleasant enough character. Didn't have much to say. And they go, thank you. Uh, I think they do say like, who else did you work with? Uh, and they go bring in the next dude, uh, med tech, uh, uh, do like a soon to be furrowed eyebrow Tarsus, uh, and he sits down. They say, what's your name and position? Uh, crewman first class, medical technician. I was right on my guess there. Regard says, don't worry. This is totally informal, totally relaxed. You saw how chill Beverly was. And they say, Do, if you want counsel, uh, he goes, no, I got nothing to hide. And then maybe he didn't know there was a beta Z in there or beta Zoid. Uh, and they go, uh, the Admiral says, geez, you were from Mars Colony. Life on Mars. He, she goes, are you human? He goes, largely. 
uh, like, uh, he goes, I was also Vulcan. And he goes, these, these Vulcaneers are so fake. Uh, uh, and he goes, uh, he goes, they go, well, what was up with you and the Klingon? You used to talk to him, huh? He goes, yeah, we, he was, I was treated, you know, I was helping him. Uh, he goes, yeah, of course we talked. Uh, they said, does everything say anything strange? And he goes, no, no. And they said, do you ever see him outside of sick bay? He goes, yeah, in t- 10 forward, but I didn't hang with him. Uh, he was with a group of people, but I wasn't involved. Everybody gets a weird look on their face there. And uh, he goes, you're excused. No more questions. Uh, they, you know, he's a kid. He looks very, uh, Picard scratches his temple. He says, Mr. Worf. Uh, and then the bait is what he says. Uh, she, he's lying. He's uh, hiding something. Rickard goes, yeah, he's, it's, uh, he's a kid. And they say, well, it wasn't truthful. He's covering something up, uh, something. Uh, and he goes, I think this is it. This He goes, and based on my hunch, this is the person we're looking for. And Picard goes, oh, boy. And then it fades out. I don't know if it went to a commercial. Yeah, but, yeah, the Betazoid and Worf, uh, oh, they look at a screen. That's what I was talking about earlier. I am strongly motivated in this matter. That's one thing Worf says. Uh, the Betazoid notes about his father. No one's no one's concerned. He got nothing to prove. Uh, I will uh, find a conspiracy if there's one on board. We're counting on you. Stairs after Worf. Uh, uh, Dr. Crusher. Then next up was Mr. Tarsus, a young first-class med tech. Uh, informal in- inquiry 43587. Something born on Mars, well, you know, that's what we said. This all, uh, no relationship. Uh, I think that was with the, the, uh, the, um, uh, what was that? Uh, the, uh, anyway, whatever. I'm forgetting so many things. Uh, he says, Yeah, yeah, I treat, yeah, I worked with him a few times. Uh, see him out 10 forward with a group. Uh, uh, the group thing that caught my attention. Uh, but they're too busy with other stuff. Uh, Ricard rubs his temple. I liked that. Uh, and yeah, then there's commercial. Then we get in the ready room. Uh, it, oh, glass ship in his office. So I guess I'll come back and do these. It'll be easier if I look all this up later. Uh, back and forth. Ricard uh, sighs and stands. Uh, we can't wait for... Uh, Evidence. That's what this admiral saying. Picard says no. So we'll run through the dialogue in a second here. Uh, she really guilts Picard. Uh, Jordy got some, finds something interesting. So he calls up, and then Jordy and Data explain that basically it was just a defect in the engine. Uh, she plays it very softly. Uh, just a defect in the hatch cover, yeah. And it, of course, it was. She, she, at first, she plays soft, uh, but then they don't buy it. No, no, it's probably not. Uh, uh, just a roll. There is no. There, they said there is no. Uh, I can't stand it. I know you planned it. I'm going to set it straight this Watergate. There was no S A B A T O G E. They go. Well, this guy's got Confederates on board. Also, I wondered if this assistant types everything, and who whom are they? Worf uh, and I are a great team. That's what the Betazoid says. Uh, they will establish his Sabian's innocence. You know, hey, that's mispronounced. Says a kid's innocence. Uh, uh, Picard answers. Picard something. Oh, Picard appears. The courtroom is packed uh, with onlookers, so Picard's not happy. Uh, she likes, you know, uh, uh, she likes to have uh, people there. And then she starts grilling Dr. Crusher. Guard has an aside. As Betazoid gets a call and leaves, uh, get, like, this is total courtroom drama 101. He gets a call and has to leave the uh, courtroom or something. Or whatever. He does the old fake piece of evidence. Riker objects. Uh, so this isn't Dr. Crusher. They start, at some point, they're interviewing the young guy. And uh, the dude it goes deep, uh, and then he says, I refuse to answer, because it turns out he's uh, part Romulan, not Vulcan. And uh, then there's like an oh snap before the commercial. Uh, let's see the run through here. Yeah, we got the Enterprise, Ricard in his office, talking to the Admiral. Hey, sit down. Uh, get comfortable. I'll sit down, too. 
She says, yeah, I got to tell you, uh, Bigard says, I'm not, uh, no action against Tarsus on gut instinct, betazoid intuition. She goes, well, Sabin, oh, that's, uh, Sabin's the thing, the, uh, Bigard goes, you can't use a betazoid stealth. And they, they go, you got a betazoid. And he goes, there's a difference between a counselor and an investigator. Come on. She's helping. She's using her skills for help. And they go, well, use her interrogations. Uh, Bigard goes, yeah, I guess so. But he goes, I don't act just on instinct alone. Didn't you watch the episode where Jordy taught data about the differences? And he goes, you're asking uh, to kind of take Mr. Tarsus uh, based on, he goes, hey, you know, I can't accuse him of something based on nothing. And she creates the old straw person argument. Oh, what if this was Troy? Uh, wouldn't you keep an eye on him? And he goes, I keep an eye on him. Uh, and he goes, maybe I should reevaluate my behavior. And she goes, let's keep our priorities straight. Uh, we're trying to uncover stuff uh, on the ship. Uh, it's a red alert, you know. I don't know if we're living this episode in some sense. Uh, and uh, she goes, I want con- continuous surveillance on this kid. And that's when Picard gets up and starts space and goes to his fish tank. Uh, he said, if we had clear evidence, uh, and she goes, we will have clear evidence once we bust him. Uh, saving and Worf are on it. Uh, but she goes, we got to act now before, not later, when we have proof. And Picard goes, no, uh, he's the king of boundaries, man. He goes, I'm not going to treat somebody like they did something wrong unless they do. And she goes, well, you're just so generous, uh, Snowflake. Uh, and he's not a snowflake, so he just glares. Uh, she goes, what if next time it's more serious? Uh, and she goes, can't you? For-? And then that's when Jordy calls. They say, hey, get down here right away. We got some breakthrough in the case. Uh, and that's when the- Jordy and Data say, yeah, this is a blown hatch. Uh, defective hatch. Uh, or a hatch or frame. And we analyze it. It's 100% defective. Submicron. You know, just one of those ones. Uh, uh, you know, McKinley, they blame McKinley Station. Uh, they replace it with something. Uh, oh, undetectable defect data does say. So not really blaming anybody. Just saying the facts where it happened. The Betazoid doesn't buy it. Uh, he says, I find an accident hard to believe. Uh, and Picard goes, when my staff says something, they mean it. Uh, and then uh, the Admiral, she says, just because there wasn't uh, something damaged doesn't mean there's not a conspiracy. Uh, so this is like the drumhead. This is a really, really deep episode. Yeah, and they say, what about, you know, who knows? And uh, Picard says, man, this is a lot of pressure on Jean-Luc here. And Worf says, we got to look into this. He is hiding something. And they say, okay, we'll look into it. Uh, and Picard goes, let's get this over with uh, as quick as possible. And then we see the Enterprise again. Doors open. That's when the court is packed with the onlookers. Picard's like, you got to be kidding me. This is my ship. Uh, and he goes, with spectators. And she goes, yeah, it's uh, open sunshine. You know, it, it goes keep, keeps the rumors flowing. And she goes, you know, we got to, she's misusing this. We use the sunshine. Uh, she says, you know, keep it, keep it, keep it, keeping the light on everybody and everybody's eyes is better. And this poor young guy, he's up there. He's already uh, a little bit under stress. So Ricard looks up his info. Crewman Simon Tarsis, they go, okay, now you have us. I assigned you a counsel, William Riker, who nods. Uh, he goes, I don't need it. Uh, he goes, I didn't do anything wrong. And they go, Dr. Crusher, did he, this guy talk to uh, Jadon? And she goes, yeah, when he was working with him. And she goes, out, they go outside of sick bay, and they go, maybe at 10 forward, there's, you know, people talk there. And, uh, they go, I don't, I don't understand, uh, uh, it's like a social gathering. And she goes, why do you hesitate to give us those names? And Picard goes, she goes, tell us everyone who's there. And Picard goes, you know, if you have a case to make against Tarsus, make it now. 
Otherwise, I'm putting a stop to this pony show. And then the Betazoid uh, uh, stands up, Sabin or whatever. He says, uh, he goes, do you, he goes, you ever uh, work with Freckles? Uh, he goes, because uh, any Dexo Ribos stuff? Uh, and the kid gets really nervous. He goes, yeah, we all do. Uh, and he goes, are you sure you didn't, uh, he goes, don't you have access to the whole sick bay, everything, including exoribos, freckles? He goes, there's evidence uh, that uh, that was what was uh, messed up the engine, is something that was in sick bay. And the guy goes, I, I don't have anything to do with that. Uh, he goes, how can we believe you? Because meanwhile, the dude's lying. And he says, you're a liar. And Ricar- or Riker objects or for calling him a liar. Guard agrees. Uh, he goes, you know, the guy goes, you know, I'm trying to work my case here. He goes, did you lie when you applied uh, to the Starfleet uh, on your application? Isn't it true your grandfather is a uh, Romulan? And then the guy gets really upset. And Picard tell- Riker says, don't say anything. Uh, and the, uh, they say, we're waiting. And he says, on the advice of my counsel, I'm not going to say anything because it's going to incriminate me. And that's when it says, oh, snap. Uh, and goes to commercial. And we get a series of shots of the Admiral Picard sighing and then grimacing. And then that's when the ad goes, the break. And then we get the Enterprise flying by. And... Uh, we have a meeting with his uh, wharf's crew. They go, we, I want to know everything where Tarsus has been. Meanwhile, Picard's walking in the room. Uh, and uh, they go, we want to know everybody, his friends, anybody he talked to back in the day, polygraphs. Uh, and Picard goes, Worf, I got to talk to you, man. And uh, Worf goes, everyone's dismissed. Uh, get your reports to me as soon as possible. And they walk off. Picard sits down. And Worf uh, looks away, looks back. They make eye contact. And he goes, don't you see what's happening, Worf? Uh, and Worf goes, what do you mean? And he goes, this is, uh, he goes, this is like a drum head. He goes, this is a thing. He goes, it's a, he goes, I got to use it. He goes, it's not a metaphor. So Scoots has got to create one. 500 years ago, people used to, uh, a tap on a drum and uh, it would get on people's nerves uh, and uh, instead of uh, working stuff out in a logical manner uh, based on the facts they would just do that and Worf goes well he was he goes uh, yeah he admitted he t- lied on his application and uh, they go back and forth uh, uh, and Kirk goes yeah he made a mistake it's not a uh, we can't infer he did anything else uh, and actually, we can't even refer to that because he didn't answer if he, he, uh, and Ricard goes, well, he wouldn't uh, tell the truth. Uh, and Ricard goes, we're not sinking to that level. The seventh guarantee is one of the most important rights granted by the Federation. We cannot take a fundamental principle of the Constitution and turn it against somebody. And Worf's like a moron. We got to seek out whoever's up to no good. And he goes, that's how it starts, man. From legitimate road, uh, you know, the logic and fact to, to rampant. He goes, it's not short. He goes, uh, something's wrong and I don't like what we've become. And he storms out of the room. Guard has to take a breath uh, and pucker his face. And let's see, then we see... Uh, uh, then we see uh, uh, Picard meeting with uh, Tarsus, uh, having tea out of a pot, uh, uh, like a porcelain-style pot. Uh, and Picard goes, tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, Mars Colony, eh? He goes, yep. Uh, you know, it was like, uh, he goes, I wanted to get to be in Starfleet, though. Since I was a kid, I really wanted to. He goes, I was going to go to the academy, but I uh, trained as a med tech, served on outposts. And he goes, the day I got posted on the Enterprise is the happiest day of my life. Uh, and he goes, yeah, I didn't want to wait to become an officer. He goes, my parents wanted me to, and I thought about it. But uh, 
He goes, I used to sit under this big tree on the parade grounds. And Picard goes, oh, I know that tree. Uh, with the elm bench? He goes, yeah. It was my favorite place to study. Me, that was my thinking spot. Uh, Tarsus says, uh, I used to watch the drills and imagine I was an officer. And he goes, I know it would have made my mom happy. But uh, Picard goes, you didn't do it? He goes, nah. He goes, I was 18 and eager, man. Wanted to be out in the stars, uh, and I was spending four years on the ground in a classroom. It's a really romantic thing, uh, and it takes regard to back, you know. He, uh, he's got a H-E-A-R-T, and you can see where his eagerness, uh, and he goes, that's it, right? He goes, I'm losing my career, huh? He goes, no West Crusher, you know, no West Crusher move for me. And he goes, that was a big mistake, you know, not saying I was Romulan, but I wouldn't have gotten in if I didn't, probably. And you know, Kurt has to take it deeper. Man, what acting this is. Holy moly. Then we're in the hall with the um, uh, uh, investigation with Admiral saying, just Worf's going to check out Mars Colony, do a background check. uh and Picard interrupts them, rolls up behind them. He goes, I'd like to have a word with you uh, in private, off the record. And she's a little taken aback. Uh, and she goes, oh, well, you're my partner in this. Uh, and she sends uh, the assistant on the way. And she goes, I can't believe this. And Picard goes, yeah, I'm putting a stop to this. Too far. It's gone too far. You can't lie in court. Uh because it only happens in the movies, and not, not on my ship. Uh, you're hounding an innocent man. And she goes, how would you figure that out? Uh, and he goes, I talked to him. And she goes, well, I see. Uh, I'm sure he gave you a story about snowflakes. <laughs> and I said, man, that's, that's like one of my, that's just one of my sore spots when people say that. Uh, and he goes, yeah, he goes, he made a mistake. Uh, it doesn't make him anti-Starfleet. And she goes, you're naive, Jean-Luc. She's the one pacing now, Picard's sitting there. And she goes, you know how I've been, you know what I've been doing the past four years? I've been going from planet to star base to planet. Uh, no home, live on starships and shuttles, saving the world. I haven't seen a family member in years. I got no friends, just a purpose. Uh, uh, you know, when I was a little girl clutching a blanket, uh, you know, I was, uh, she goes, uh, this is an institution my father was a part of, and that was my cause, uh, to ex- just keep the, preserve this extraordinary union. Ricard's looking on, like, in dismay, and she goes, I'm not enabling you to block this. She should have been in those first three Star Trek, I mean, those uh, extra Star Wars movies, because uh, she could play, play a Sith Lord, a Lord S. Uh, and Ricard goes, no, these hearings are stopping. I don't care what you say. He goes, I'll go to Starfleet Command. And she goes, I got news for you. Uh, I've been telling them everything. And uh, hearings are not stopping. We're expanding them. And he goes, what? Uh, and she goes, yeah, I'm going to get to the bottom of this, uh, even if it means investigating every single person on this ship, including you. And she goes, public hearings. uh Admiral Thomas Henry is going to be there from Starfleet. Uh, he's on his way. Because you got to be kidding me. She goes, yeah, I don't report to you. I, I report to Starfleet Command. I don't need your permission for anything. And she spins and walks off. And Picard, t- as she gets the door, he goes, uh, he goes, what you're doing here is wrong, uh, unethical, immoral. And I'll fight it uh, every step of the way. She goes, do what you must, Captain. So will I. And Picard stares after her for quite a few minutes. Uh, then we see the ship again. Uh, there, we're at the bridge. Uh, warp engines are back online, ready to restart the engine. Picard's distracted. He can't even hear Data. Data goes, sir, can you hear me? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, go ahead, Data. Walks back to his seat. Uh, Riker looks at him. He knows something's up. He goes, you all right, boss? He goes, yeah, well, I'm a little pre- preoccupied, number one. Then the transcriptionist uh, says, uh, you've been uh, ordered to court tomorrow, uh, 0900. Uh, you're appearing before the committee. And Picard is stunned as he looks at his summons. They zoom. 
and goes to commercial on a pause from him. Yeah, let me see my other notes. Uh, drumhead trial, Worf meeting with his crew. Uh, dismiss, Picard sits with Worf. Uh, do you see what's happening? Uh, let's see, there's no, not a crime. Uh, Worf's intense. Oh, yes, uh, that is how it starts. Uh, Picard stands. I don't like what we're becoming. Uh, Picard and Tarsus in tea with lemon. I think there was might have been lemons there out of a teapot, white with, with black or navy mugs. Elm tree. I don't know what that is with a cucumber bench. Oh, no, that was the elm tree that they were talking about. A circular bench. Uh, a big Picard sigh at the end. Ambassador and the assistant uh, walking. Picard walks up behind them. She ignored Picard for a while. She did like a power move where she pretended she couldn't hear him. In private, off the record. Uh, in the office, uh, uh, she walks around the office with grace, touching things. Uh, my cause. She goes, doubt me and regret it. Uh, and then Picard stands, lays down the law. Her chin is up. Uh, hearings will be expanded. Admiral Thomas Henry. I'll, you know, Picard says all oh, everything I said. He said, "Yeah." Picard spaced out on the bridge. Uh, Riker concerned, preoccupied. Picard gets served. He does what? Double question mark. Yeah, okay, so we'll run through the, my notes, and we'll run through the actual. Uh, do not confuse this proceeding. Uh, oh, Picard uses innuendo. I think I liked that. We find out Picard has violated the Prime Directive nine times. Uh, she she uses some Riker language. She says, surprise, a H-E double hockey sticks out of me. Uh, looking into those reports, uh, she questions his uh, commitment to Starfleet, nods at the Betazoid. Uh, yeah, it was great stuff. I beg your pardon. Let me refresh your memory. Uh, I don't think we need the pre- preamble. Romulan spy. Yeah, something dirty. Yeah. Uh, Left Picard, Riker, Flair. I don't know. I'll look that up. My handwriting says, uh, Worf interrupts. Uh, where, where are your Betazoid? Uh, Worf to, to the court. Uh, Romulan collaborator. Your reward. Oh, then she talks about the whole time with the Borg that Picard spent. Uh, yeah, how much was it? Thirty-nine ships, eleven thousand peeps. Uh, she just, she just says, uh, "How do you sleep at night?" Uh, at six fifteen, I guess that's left in the episode because this was one of the few episodes I watched on uh, Netflix. I usually watch my Prime for some reason. Oh, so that's why my timing's off. Seven thirty. There's a good Riker glare left in the episode. Then six fifteen left in the episode. I said, "This must be one of the Picard memes, not the one where he's." Uh, I don't know. You you could look at it uh, with the hand on his forehead. Not the one where he's uh, 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 upset. This one was more like, oh boy. Yeah, Picard drops some Papa Santi on her. She says, how dare. It is a really good court. I mean, Star Trek really has good court, courtroom scenes. Uh, I don't know what uh, Raymond Burr or Aaron Burr would say about it, but... Romulans, she goes off the rails, and the uh, Admiral Henry's like, uh, she, he gets a great look of like, what? Uh, and then he's like, so uh, uh, it's so absurd, he walks out. It's like, he, he, she should be meeting, he, they should have brought in Counselor Troy right away to say, hey, maybe you should talk to her. Uh, and I have nothing to say. Even her betazoid is stunned. Uh, so she says, okay, it's time for a recess. And then uh, Whispering Court, uh, oh, the Whispering Court empties. It's her alone. And then Picard is in the conference room staring at the window and Worf comes in. And the episode ends. But don't worry, we'll run through it in a deeper way here. Okay, so we have Captain Log Supplemental. Admiral Thomas Henry's uh, worked closely with Satie in the past. Uh, and uh, this, uh, geez, who's your full name? Jean Luc Picard. Rank of position, Captain, uh, Federation Enterprise. Uh, three years have been on the ship since 4-1-1-24. And the big card goes, I want to make a statement. Uh, and she says, if you have a statement, you can make it later. 
And he goes, no, uh, our chat, he goes, yeah, he quotes it. He goes, I have the right to make a statement before questioning begins by law. He goes, sorry, I have to drop science on you. He goes, I'm concerned about what's happening. He says it looking at the ground at first, uh, slow build, uh, started when we, you know, thought someone was up to something with freckles and he got in trouble for it. Uh, but it couldn't end there. You know, another guy lied on application. Another guy lied on his application. That was a trial. And he goes, that was a sham, uh, insinuation and innuendo. And he goes, there was anything so substantive about that, uh, or proven. He puckers his lips. He goes, yeah, his grandfather was Romulan. Since when is that? Uh, not, and that's it. His career cost him his career. And he goes, if we become so uh, fearful uh, and so uh, quick to point the finger uh, that just because one mistake, that's it. Uh, he goes, just because he's related to a Romulan or is a Romulan. And he goes, let's not condemn uh, Tarsus or anyone else uh, because of their bloodlines uh, or investigate others uh, for uh, innocent associations, having friends, I implore you, uh, don't con- continue with this proceeding because he knows he's got her outclassed. And he goes, end it now. Admiral Henry looks on like, ooh, boy. And she goes, well, what about the prime directive you broke nine times? Uh, your general order number one, is it not? He goes, what's your point? Uh, or she said, then she said, oh, well, you broke it nine times uh, since you took over the Enterprise. And she goes, yeah, this is, that's a hockey stick thing. You even were surprised. Uh, and he goes, well, the circumstances. Uh, and she goes, yeah, we're looking into that. We're going to run some things uh, very closely looking into it. Uh, and then we'll have more questions for you about your commitment to the Starfleet. And we see Stars is his face. Then the Betazoid gets up. Uh, he goes, yeah, what happened? Oh, first he goes to slow build about the Borg stuff. Uh, and, uh, oh, no, they first they say, hey, didn't you help a Vulcan get to um, uh, Romulans? He goes, no, no, that was a trick. Uh, he goes, uh, it was in, near the neutral zone. Uh, he goes, it wasn't, she wasn't Vulcan, though. She was Romulan, and he still gave her the Romulan. They gave her back to the Romulans. It was a Romulan spy. And uh, they go, why, when, when you knew that, didn't you... Uh, uh, take out the ship or something. Uh, and he goes, cause, uh, she was on the other ship. Uh, and everybody starts getting looks like a uh, crusher wharf, uh, or stands up. Uh, he says, you, he goes, we, we, you can't just enter into, he goes, Captain Picard did everything he, his best. Uh, and she goes, where were you? Aren't you in charge of security? And wharf, wharf is like, what? Uh, and then they say, oh, isn't your father with the Romulans, Worf? Uh, Ricard goes, so settle down, Worf. Uh, Papa Picard's got this. Don't worry. And then they, they talk about the Borg. And they, you know, play, play it. Oh, it must have been so hard, you know, that you did, did it. Uh, you know, how do you sleep? Uh, Picard looks down. That's when he puts his hand on his head that I think is one of the memes. She goes, I got to question your judgment, uh, your loyalty. And he rubs his forehead. Then he takes a breath. He goes, yeah, he goes, there are some words I've known since I was a schoolboy. Within the first link, the chain is formed. Uh, The first speech censored, the first thought forbidden, the first freedom denied. That chains us all a record, as he said it, you know. He goes, as your papa, Judge Aaron Sati, or Santi. And she goes wide-eyed at that. He goes, the first time any person's freedom is uh, trodden on, it, it hurts us all. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Uh, he goes, that's what's happening. She goes, what? She really goes, she goes you are a R- Romulan consort, and you're using my father's name. Calls him a traitor. Uh, goes right off the rails. Uh, Picard looks up. Uh, she goes, you subvert the Federation. My father was great. Uh, he's in, he, his name's Integrity and Principle, and you shouldn't even be saying it. And uh, she says, he loves the Confederation, you don't. Uh, 
And she goes, I'm exposing you for what you are. And that's when the dude stands up and leaves, uh, uh, the other uh, admiral. She goes, I'm taking you down. He doesn't even say anything or look at anybody. He just like, so walks out of the courtroom. And then everybody gets a shocked look on their face. Uh, she knows she's lost her case. Uh, ain't gone too far. She looks down. Yeah, we, Riker, Riker, we got Riker look. Uh, she's kind of trembling. She's got, I got nothing more to say. And she slowly sits down. The mouth of the betazoid opens. Uh, he kind of looks like he just, just sucked on a lemon. He's, he calls recess. And Picard just says, and Picard's, <laughs> Picard's look is very unhappy uh, on his face. He didn't want to do it probably either. But yeah, because I had to do what had to be done, I guess. Uh, everyone gets up and leaves. And uh, just the transcription. Uh, oh, no. And then the transcriptionist leaves and the courtroom is emptied. One Game Boy looking thing on the table. Yeah, then we see the Enterprise again. And Ricard's looking out the window of uh, the conference room. Worf comes in. Hey, get bothering you, Captain? He goes, no, come on in, Worf. And he says, Mr. Worf. Uh, Worf walks up next to him and uh, he says, she's, uh, it's over. Uh, Admiral Henry said this. Uh, he goes, no more hearings. And Ricard goes, that's good. Worf looks down. He goes, Admiral Satsy has gone. Yeah, yeah, that's good, too. The guard gets a uh, closer window. He goes, Jesus, we think we've come so far uh, from the past uh, with all that, you know, not great human stuff. Uh, but then in a blink, blink of an eye, uh, it could, you know, could a cycle could restart. Worf looks down, shakes his head. And he goes, I bought into it, boss. Uh, I helped, uh, and he goes, I didn't see what it was. And he goes, well, she was a Sith Lordess. Uh, and he goes, not everybody twirls their mustache and is easy to spot. Uh, those who clothe themselves are, you know, well camouflaged. And Worf goes, I think after yesterday, uh, maybe they won't, people won't buy in as quick. Uh, Ricard goes, maybe. But it could be someone else. Uh, they're always w- with us. Just the right climate in which to flourish. Uh, spreading f- F-E-A-R in the name of righteousness. Worf thinks hard about it. Uh, hands behind the back. He goes, vigilance, Mr. Worf. That is a price we continually pay. And the episode comes to a close. Uh, so, yeah, that was the episode, uh, I guess, uh, I'll have to conclude the research another time. But that's a pretty good, I mean, really good, really good episode of uh, The Next Generation. And uh, good night. All right. Hey, everybody. It's time for uh, the uh, another episode of uh, Sleep with TNG. And this episode is a two-parter. We'll, we'll be covering the first part tonight. And it's Redemption. is season four, episode 26, which when I was writing this earlier... I thought about that. what an um, accomplishment that is. 26 episodes, in, I'm presuming, in a year of uh, quality television. I mean, that's an episode every two weeks. I mean, my math could be off, but I'm pretty sure 26 plus 2, 26 times 2 is 50. 26 times 2 is 52. Maybe there's 54 weeks in a year. Maybe there's 52. I'm not sure. But uh, really a great accomplishment. And this is one of these episodes. Uh, that not only stands up to like uh, multiple rewatches, but really reveals more and more depth. Uh, if you watch both episodes, uh, I don't know how many times I've watched this first episode because I watched it once, maybe a year or two ago, and then uh, a bunch of times recently. Uh, and it really is an amazing, amazing episode. If you're a fan of uh, Jean Luc and or Worf and or Bolt or uh, it was kind of the like I don't know the the ways in which you if you if you choose to project, project I I think that's one of the great things about TNG or Star Trek Star Trek is that you can project and identify with characters, yeah, particularly Worf and Data. You know the times you do feel like you're a little bit on the O U T S I D E or whatever. 
or you don't understand, you know, your, dis- your, your own journey of self-discovery and then doing it also through uh, Picard's eyes. This is just a classic. So it opens with Captain's Law, like headed to the Kling- Klingon homeworld. My handwriting says an installation c- c- ceremony, but it's an installation ceremony and hopefully to correct a grave injustice. It, what does that say? Roses? Uh, Worf, oh, he's got a robe on. So Worf's working out. Uh, he's doing a little, uh, like, Klingon martial arts practice or training. I don't know if they've seen this, like, uh, like, uh, like uh, I don't know if what to, to, to describe it other than, like, a robe. Uh, but he's there. Chadich shows up. That's Picard. Not time. Oh, this is just real. I'll read some of the um, the dialogues. It's so amazing. And you think about TV writing, or I think about writing a lot. Within the first four minutes, this episode sets up the theme and the the main conflict uh, in a very segmented television way, but it was still flaw. I mean, in my opinion, flawlessly. Uh, so Picard rolls up to Worf's room. Worf's working out. And they talk about uh, some, some amazing things. Uh, uh, basically, well, I guess I don't even need to read it. Picard basically says, uh, well, practice more info, nothing, the gourd. Uh, but, but basically, Picard says, are you going to try to right the wrongs when we're here on your home world? And Gar- Garon's going to be in charge. And basically, Worf says, I think this calls for more practice. Uh, uh, oh, because he says, I'm here as your chat each, not as your uh, captain. And he, sa- he says, uh, oh, yeah, Worf says, it's not time for me yet. Uh, and he says, patience is sometimes more effective than sharp things. And Picard says, well, patience is a human virtue. I'm glad to see you've taken on. But doesn't this situation call for a more Klingon response? Because this was like a cover up, uh, and you got the the the, the raw side of it. Uh, no escargo scheduled. Garon, what? Uh, effective for, for Bortas? Why? The lies must be challenged. Uh, like, uh, and Worf goes, "Yeah, I've grown weary of uh, this dishonor." Oh, and then the breaker calls. He goes, yeah, we got this vessel Bortas here. It says, it says it's going to be our escort. Worf goes, yeah, there's no escort. They go up to the bridge, and uh, Picard goes on screen. It goes, uh, he goes, yo, this is Gowron. Uh, Picard goes, what's up, Gowron? He goes, we've got to speak if we're going to be successful. And he says, successful at what? Uh, that's where I said, what? Bortas. Uh, and then he said to Gar- Garon, what? He goes, yeah, I must speak uh, if we're going to stop the trouble on the cl- cling- trouble in Klingon again. And then there's a zoom on Picard. Uh, episode opens. And I'm watching still the, the scene in playing in front of me is still uh, Worf's. Uh, really, I didn't realize his robe uh, was so, it kind of has like that puckered material. Really looks comfortable and like uh, good for a, uh, wicking of sweat and he's working out and, and staying cool and also looking cool honor will scorn have no chronicry the sisters of dunkus uh, pottery three fleet commanders how many football this is what my handwriting says uh, i do not see what i can do to assist uh you must see this duty to the end. It's beyond my purview. So basically, Gowron's, uh, oh, he says, uh, however, so basically, Duras's sisters are making trouble. Oh, for the patriarchy. That's what that says. Uh, I think they already have three fleet commanders uh, on their side. And Picard says, well, I don't see what I can do to assist you if they're not going to follow you, if they're going to follow Duras's sisters. Uh, and Garon says, you got to see me into being in charge till the end. And Picard says, let's be on my purview. Yeah, I'll deal with things according to Klingon war, law, but not anymore. Not enough uh, wharf, uh, tail, wharf tail ergos. Uh, Picard to data. Riker looks on. Wharf tail argues. Let me see what that is. Transporter room. 
dismissed, arms crossed. Uh, I would speak with you. Don't hurt tra- trails. Uh, I am not. Gauron's mind is blown. Live you with your uh, deezer like a Klingon. Uh, stop to 14. <laughs> That's what my notes say. And I'm not, I guess I'm not, I'm being serious. Uh, but so, okay. So where were we? Picard met with Gowron. He says, geez, you got to help me make sure I'm in charge. That's Picard goes, I'm just going to follow laws. And uh, Gowron goes, I don't know if that's going to be good enough. Then Picard says, Worf, take this guest to our transporter room. And then Picard says, Data, keep an eye on for Romulans in the neutral zone, a teaser. And keep our outpost stations, keep us alert. Uh, and Data goes, I, and then he says, uh, Picard goes, Riker, Duras are trying to make a move on Gowron. Riker goes back, but Romulans, I don't know, but, you know, we know the history. Uh, then Worf uh, dismisses the technician in the transporter room. He goes, I like how he says this, I would speak with you. Oh, and Gowron says, I don't hear the words of traitors, uh, like a little kid. And Worf goes, I'm not a traitor. And he goes, well, what do you mean? You said you were, your family is. Uh, and Worf goes, I te- took the discommendation to protect the Empire. And Garen goes, what? He goes, it was Doras's dad who did all this, not me. And he goes, you got any proof? Uh, and Worf goes, I, there is proof. Uh, and he goes, well, why would you do it? He goes, well, the pa- you know, the fa- he goes, he has the richest family in town. Uh, I didn't want to split the Empire. So the council got to blame my dad. And Gowron's like, you gotta be kidding me. The council knew. And Worf goes, listen, I know you're, I believe you to be a man of honor. I restore my family name. And he goes, dude, I can't do it. Uh, he goes, uh, he goes, I know you've, you've helped me out in the past, but, uh, Worf goes, what about when you're in charge? And he goes, well, I'll need the council's support. Uh, I guess they can't reveal this cover up. Uh, and again, the thematic stuff comes up. One war, Picard's telling him to be more like a Klingon. Worf's trying to pack his patience. Now he says, now you must live with your decision like a Klingon. Uh, yeah. Stop to 1-4. I don't know what that means. Uh, skip to, oh, no, to, it was in my own note to myself. Skip it because there was a page mix up in my notebook. Uh, then we get some guiding uh, whoopee moment. It really, good, really good actually. When you think about counselors on the ship, uh, and a little bit of comic relief, or ki- kind of a comic relief, or a lighthearted moment. So Worf's practicing uh, like his nerf, you know, nerf aiming, playing video games. Guinan rolls up, uh, and she says, "Mind if I join you?" Uh, was, you know, I thought I'd get a little practice in. He goes, "You practice?" She goes, "Yeah." Worf goes, "Well, I practice at level 14. And uh, Guinan says, "Well, I guess I could bring it down to that level." Uh, and she starts to work at it. Uh, uh, like she goes, "Yeah, I've been doing this uh, since way before you were even a like a twinkle in your mother's eye or whatever." And then she does with a casual conversation, you know, she goes, she's had a bet with the captain. I can make you laugh before you became Lieutenant Commander. And Worf says, not a good bet today. And she goes, well, I've seen you laugh. I really like it. And Worf goes, Klingons do not laugh. Uh, but obviously he's distracted because his aiming's off. And she kind of goes, well, that's not true. Uh, I've heard many Klingon, Klingon laughs. Uh, she goes, as a matter of fact, your son laughs. He's Klingon. And Worf goes, no, he's a child, one. And uh, two, uh, he's human, part human. And she goes, yeah, okay, so you're full, full, full Klingon, but you don't laugh. Uh, in a classic wharf line, he goes, I do not laugh because I do not feel like laughing. And Guinan says, well, other Klingons laugh. What does it say about you? And the truth comes out. He goes, perhaps it says I do not feel like other Klingons. And uh, Guinan wins the computer, th- the game. In the, the, the other game, the sub game, because it didn't really sound, it, it was more like... Uh, 
it didn't sound that truthy when Worf said it, uh, because he was saying it in a, a, a pesky kind of way. So it had to, you know, she planted the seed. And then she goes, Jesus, don't worry. I've been playing these games since before you were born. How's your son? He goes, it's not easy for him on Earth. And she goes, I could see how, you know, living with humans, he's killing and confusing, huh? And Worf goes, yeah, it won't be, it won't be easy. And she goes, no. But at some point, he goes, he's going to want to know what it's like to be Klingon, just like you're kind of on your own journey doing that. And, uh, I don't know, excellent, excellent scene. Uh, I, oh, okay, so then uh, Picard carols and has grapes, a snack. Uh, actually, oh, yeah, Picard has a plate with carrots and grapes on it, I think. We'll see here. Worf asks for a leave of absence, which uh, Picard grants. He's happy. Kapla or whatever. Good luck, bruh. He says, uh, and then it goes to a commercial. Uh, anything else? Have? No, that was it. Uh, let me just check what Picard had on his plate here. Oh, yeah, he takes it out. He's, I think he's got carrots and grapes. It looks like, like a healthy midday snack. Or, uh, and let's see. Then there's a commercial. Then Worf talks his personal law. I could track down my brother. Got to discuss some stuff with him. Uh, then old Commander Kern, one of our fa- one of my favorites. Uh, Worf starts to talk to Commander Kern. He goes too long. Yeah, no doubt too long. Then Kern gets all this Khaleesi talk going. Believe it or not, I don't know if the Khaleesi is watching this because he's, he's basically saying we're going to break the, the wheel. We're going to break the wheel. He goes because uh, he says we got to help Gowron. He goes Gowron's a part of the wheel, dude. And we're going to break the wheel, uh, the system, the whole nine yards, uh, or uh, whatever uh, the, whatever term we use for it, uh, kilowatts. And uh, they go back and forth. And it goes, you know, Kern says, just join us, Worf. And Worf goes, no, Gowron's the leader, man. And uh, uh, Kern says, uh, he spits in your face, man. There's no honor. And Worf goes, there's no honor via dishonor. By the way, I'm the older brother. Worf takes a patriarchal dominance. What is it between siblings? Uh, but he says, I'm the older brother. I make the decisions. Uh, he goes, well, we're not going to, we're going to be subtle about this man. We're going to wait till he needs us. Also, I could not find anything about this, but it seems like, so uh, let's see the time. It's uh Right now he's getting a drink, but there's like a bowl with like salt or sand in it. And I couldn't find anything about this on the internet. I mean, it didn't look very long, but, uh, I don't know if Klingons have a salt bowl or what, but it's like right, right around 15 or 14 minutes into the episode. It's to, uh, Kern's left as he's drinking. I think he even dips his hand into it. Let's just keep watching here. Right now he's raising his glass to wharf. Worf's about to drop the whole older brother thing on him. Yeah, right now he's his back turned. He's thinking. His hair looking majestic. Breezy. He shakes his mane a little bit. Kern goes, what? A WTF, man. And this is when Worf goes, no honor without dishonor or whatever. Uh, Kern walks up to Worf, uh, two or three inches ahead of him, tries to act dominant. And uh, Worf says, no, 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 bruh. Uh, but they're having a civil, civil, like, civil dominance discussion. Uh, like, uh, yeah, like, okay, so they're still talking. And I once just wanted to see if he goes to the salt, the salt pile or sand pile. Puts his hand on his brother's shoulder. We'll wait to uh, make our move later. All subtle, like, uh, when he needs us, we'll offer our support. Uh, we'll have an advantage, uh, and we'll get our honor back, the restoration of our family name. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, now Kern turns, heads back. Yeah, there's a pile of, he's got his hand uh, across. He lays his hand in the salt or the sand thoughtfully. He's holding on to it. He's kind of, like, gripping it, uh. Thinking sand or thinking salt, I could probably use this. He says, I got to go to the Mempa sector, get some more support. 
or says, call me later. He says, okay. And Kern says, no problem. But he does cross his arms. Uh, okay, then uh, let's see, where are we? I'll be ready. Uh, then we're at the Great Hall, the Kung An High Council, Picard stands, uh, Gear, Gowron, Murrell, you stand alone. I wish it. Uh, no other challengers. Basically, it's time for Gowron to become in charge uh, to get the robe uh, that symbolizes that. Uh, and then right, he says, okay, there's no challengers. And then he, Picard goes with the robe on him. And then they go, there is one challenger. I'll challenge him. I'm Duras's son. Uh, forget his name. It'll come up soon. Uh, and then someone says Larissa, or uh, I, I got I don't know the names right this second, but uh, is this your doing? Like Duras's sister, Lo Larissa, that's her name. Uh, she goes, yeah, we found out he has a son, uh, Bator, but uh, Bator, uh, Tor, oh, Tor all. Uh, well, Lursa and Bator, uh, Doris's sisters, they go, well, this can't be Doris's son. They go, okay, we'll check his genes. Uh, and Gowron's like, this is outrageous, man. I'm in charge. This is just a kid. Uh, and he's got a bit of spunk in him, this kid. He's got some attitude. What's his name? Toral. And, uh, they say, well, the arbiter will consider it. Uh, give us a few, you know, give us a bit. Is that it? Uh, Duras's son to validity. Oh dear, Picard has an oh dear look. Uh, then there's a secret meeting with Duras's sisters and uh, the kid, kid Toral, and a secret figure in the background. There may even be a Romulan already revealed. And to me, this was one of the great reveals at the like a great season finale, even though I wasn't watching it. Uh, then Worf is face Sammy's brother. He goes, I got seven sectors on seven squadrons uh, with me. And I think he said, let's meet up in the home world. Uh, then we have another great scene, a real small scene that I just didn't quite pick up on and the, the subtleness of it. Uh, but Worf's learning. Worf's using in data are doing research. And Picard comes in. Uh, and he goes, they're, they're looking up stuff, the proof for Duras, uh, that Duras' dad was uh, phony. And Picard goes, well, dude, I thought you were on a leave of absence. Are you still working? And uh, Worf goes, no, I'm doing research on Duras. Uh, and he goes, uh, okay, we got to talk in private, man. And he goes, basically, Picard sits him down and he goes, dude, you can't, this is a conflict of interest. You can't use... Uh, our, our resources uh, to uh, against Duras. Uh, is, so he says, we got to walk the tightrope of compromise or something. And Worf goes, I need those Federation records. And he goes, this is a compromise of our fundamental principles. You can't use your Starfleet to make change, political change. Uh, and Worf goes, I need to, man. And Picard goes, I'm lecturing you and trying to avoid my own conflict of interest. You know, it's like, I don't want Duras family in charge. Uh, I, I, you know, he goes, I got personal stuff and Starfleet stuff. And he said, oh, this is what he says. We walk the same tightrope between two worlds, you and I. We have to try to keep those uh, two worlds separate or we shall certainly fail or fall. And Picard goes, I'll tell you what, I'll open source all the documents to anybody, not just you. That's a fair way to do it. And Worf goes, thanks, man. And then Riker calls. He goes, you got a private message. Uh, so Picard gets it. Uh, he gets invited to the Duras' sister's house for tea. Serial Gorn, you come here, brave act. Uh, she touches his head. Picard is impressed with the Earl Grey. You see clearly, could be the end of the alliance, be our friend. You are like a couple of ranchers. What? Uh, nervous looks, a good day. Card speech time with due respect. Uh, he's just a boy. Okay, so basically what happens is Card gets called to see Laura Lursen Bator. 
And uh, they say, hey, Earl Grey, right? He goes, yep. Uh, they go, we just came here by yourself. That's brave. Uh, Picard goes, well, I didn't expect your invitation. They go, yeah, we should have invited you sooner. We just, you know, we know you don't like our brother. And they go, neither did we. And they say, we don't want to be your enemy. Uh, and Picard goes, that's great. Uh, they go, do you have a d- decision on Toral? And they, Picard goes, not yet. I'm working on it. Uh, they freshen his tea. They go, Jesus, Toral is going to help us. Uh, all, you know, next, he's the next generation, support of the people and all that. And Picard goes, well, I want to see if he has a support of the law. That's my job. And they go, well, you got to figure it out. Picard goes, okay, well, I'm in a pickle here because if I see Toral's challenge is valid, uh, you two will be in charge. Gowron will be out. Uh, if I reject Toral's claim, you'll say I'm just uh, like uh, serving Federation interests and you'll try a coup against Gowron. And that's when they say, you see clearly, but one thing is missing. Uh, uh, what if uh, you rule against us and we win? Yeah, that would be the end of the alliance with the Federation. And wouldn't that be unfortunate? Uh, and Picard goes, you've manipulated the circumstances with the skill of Romulan. I'll make my announcement tomorrow. Great tea. Good day. Okay, so then Picard goes, uh, where's the speech here? Okay, Picard makes a speech. With all due respect to this dude, he goes, I understand he's definitely uh, has the Duras bloodline. One day, perhaps. Right now, he's just a boy. Perhaps he shall. Uh, but just because uh, he has a bloodline doesn't mean he has a claim to leadership. He's never led anything. And then the, the dude says, uh, the Tor- Toral says, uh, follow me and I'll show you honor. Uh, and uh, let me see. What, let me read the things. Uh, and then O'Garron says, if you follow him, you're rejecting Klingon law. So Bergard basically says Gowron's in charge. Uh, you know, Duras had a claim. He's not here anymore. Gowron is. He, I already gave him the claim. And uh, that's it. Uh, and then seven people follow along. And then there's like a lot of oh dear looks. Uh, a lot of like looks. Uh, then there's an ad. I think on Frown Mound. Uh, that's what that says. Then at twenty eight fifty four. Oh, this is a great shot of the Klingon vessels. Uh, uh, Worf is. Uh, what is this? Worf Gowron pointing at throne. I got four squadrons. What? Uh, so Worf is meeting with Gowron. Oh, he says, dude, you're in trouble. Uh, how are you going to deal with Duras? And he goes, what do you, he goes, you're dishonored, bruh. And Worf goes, I got four squadrons. And he goes, how? And he goes, my brother Kern. And he goes, Kern's your brother? Why? And he goes, yeah. He goes, we hid his bloodline to protect him. Uh, and Gowron goes, he doesn't like me. And Worf goes, I'm the older brother. I'm in charge. And Gowron goes, what do you want? Worf goes, family honor. And Gowron's finicky. He says, uh, and Gowron really said, think about it. He says, well, four squadrons, not enough. Uh, he goes, uh, he goes, we need more help. Uh, and, uh, you could get Federation help. Uh, Picard listens to you. And Worf goes, I can't ask for my work. That's my work, man. And Garon goes, well, if you want your family honor, you're going to have to get a Federation help. Uh, he goes, are you a Klingon or are you hiding behind human sur- sur- excuses? What are you, Worf? Uh, are you trying to talk your way out of stuff uh, like a human? Or do you hear the cry calling you, uh, calling you to glory like a King Klingon? Uh, let's see. Listens to you. Okay, we got that. Uh, then Enterprise looks on. As it begins, uh, Klingon, oh yeah, Klingon, the, 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 some other Klingon ship shows up and starts going after Gowron ship. Uh, uh, Worf's on board helping out. Uh, there's, uh, does it say Dorf? It definitely doesn't say Dorf Skunk. That's what my handwriting looks like. Uh, but there's trouble. Worf's working. 
lost dwarf skunk general dislikes uh, Paul, Paul Picard Paul Picard has to sit uh let's see basically uh, there's two ships against the Borda, Bortas uh and Gowron's working, uh, the Enterprise is looking on, Picard says it's begun. And uh, Data's like, Picard, what are we going to do? They're in trouble, and Worf's on board, I think. And Worf says, or Picard says, we got to get away from here. we got to stay out of this. Uh, Riker goes, but isn't Bortas, shouldn't we help him? And Picard goes, engage, uh, we can't drag the Federation into this. Uh, so then they're like, oh, no, the ship's in trouble. Uh, shields are going down. Worf goes, uh, the ground's goes, let's go, let's get this done. Picard goes, or Worf goes, no, 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 no. Uh, let them sh- think the ship's uh, helpless, and then uh, we can trick Ruum. And then War- they go, War- War- Garen goes, okay. And then 35,000 Kelly cams, that must be kilometers. I think I looked it up, though, at the end. Uh, 20, you know, th- they go, okay, now they're in transporter range. They're going to drop their shields. So they take out one ship, uh, but the second ship manages to only get minor uh, hits. Uh, and they're like, now they're in trouble again. But then when a Kern's ship shows up and defends them, it, uh, Kern goes, yo, we're here to follow the banner of Gowron. And War says, uh, uh, the enemy took off, the other ship took off anyway. And Gowron goes, great job, Kern. I can't believe Lursa and Bator already moved against me. Meet me at the Great Hall. And then Gowron says, call the Enterprise and tell them to, to attend my installation as a leader. And then we have another captain's log. With newfound support, Gowron has chosen to proceed with the installation ceremony. The Enterprise has returned so that I may perform my final duties, Arbiter of Succession. Uh, let's see what else we have. Goss, GHOS, I could said a lot. Uh, uh, robe goes on. So Picard puts the robe on Gowron. Uh, Ma Dev Goss. Uh, Worf walks up uh, to him. Uh, with Kern, he goes, oh, geez, you both uh, proven yourselves. Your hearts are cling on, giving you your honor back. Let your name be spoken once again. And then there's an ad after they get their uh, honor back. Worf gets his honor back. Uh, then Klingon Enterprise, uh, Klingon Chip and Enterprise after the ad. Worf, Riker, Picard, and the Soul Leader Gowron. Uh, they're on the ship, uh, and Garon goes, uh, because of the treaty, I want your assistance in, against my enemies. Uh, and Riker goes, those are Klingons. He goes, all who oppose me. And uh, Picard goes, Enterprise or the uh, Federation can't get involved in internal affairs. Uh, and Garon goes, you already did the right of succession. You're involved. And Picard goes, this is, my duties are done, man. And then Worf butts in. He goes, Captain. We got to intervene. Uh, Duras, this is Duras is behind it. They're no good. Uh, and they're not good for the Federation either. You know that. Uh, they uh, conspired with Romulans. He goes, I beg you, support us in this cause. Uh, and Picard goes, Worf, I don't have to, Mr. Worf, I don't have to re- re- lecture you on non interference. Uh, we've sworn an oath. Uh, no matter personal feelings, I refuse your request. Uh, Gowron starts to st- pound, what do you call that, like, uh, go out, like, in a frustrated way. Worf's behind him, and Picard goes, Worf, uh, you got to get back to work, man. Uh, leave of absence is over. We're leaving. And Worf goes, Captain, I need an extended absence. Uh, and Picard goes, Worf, uh, nope, uh, time to get back to work. Your responsibilities as a Starfleet officer are incompatible with remaining on board a Klingon ship uh, during internal affairs. And Picard goes, Captain, please. Uh, and he goes, I order you to return to duty at once. And then Worf resigns. His commission as a Starfleet officer puts his uh, Enterprise badge on the table. 
And it's like a dun 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 moment. Uh, Worf was stunned. Uh, oh, Worf stunned. He's been stunned. But the captain refused him. And then uh, uh, Garon says, I'll wait you on the Bortas. And Worf walks out of the room. There's lots of music. Uh, and uh, g- g- then Worf's in his room packing. He's in a Klingon uniform now. And a doorbell rings. Picard goes, do you mind if I come in? Worf goes, no. And he goes, so you're going to be on working on the Bortas, huh? Worf goes, yeah. And Picard goes, you're going to serve them well. And, uh, yeah, Picard, really great scene, by the way, this one. Like, uh, hey, Picard goes, geez, are you certain you're making the right choice? Uh, and Worf goes, you know, I was raised by humans, uh, spent my life around them, but I was born a Klingon. My heart is of that world. Uh, I do hear the cry of the warrior. I belong with my people. And then Picard says, well, you're the only Klingon ever to serve in Starfleet, which gave you singular distinction. But what I felt was unique about you was your humanity, compassion, generosity, and fairness. You took the best qualities of humanity, made them a part of you. And uh, the result was someone I'm proud to call one of my officers. Uh, and he says, I'll have your tra- belongings transported. Which is something since I think Picard's getting a little like away with a little bit, uh, just because he told him at the beginning of the episode to be more Klingon. But then I, I don't know. Sometimes I start to wonder: Is Picard like God? Like is, in some sense, like uh, I mean, he does have this God-like power. But in uh, even though he's human, he is like superhuman in his uh, ability to deal with things uh, and be kind and generous. So maybe he knows how this is all going to work out. But then I cried. I'm not going to bounce around at it. Not on the first time. Maybe on the second or third time I saw the scene. I think on the third time, uh, Picard walks out. Picard goes, thanks. uh, And they go out of the room. And the whole hall is uh, all, like, the whole ship is there. All Everybody's there uh, waiting to say goodbye to um, Picard. I mean, waiting to say goodbye to Worf, uh, all of the staff, uh, and, uh, it was real, it was really a tearjerker, uh, for me. Oh, it was the third time. I even wrote it down here and, uh, everybody stands at attention. Uh, they're all looking like uh, at Worf with like respecting kind eyes. Uh, then they go to the transporter room and I think I wrote everybody that's there. Uh, but maybe I didn't, uh. Lift to surprise. Or maybe it was after they got off the lift. Uh, such a great dialogue. Uh, tear-filled moment. Worf gets to transporter permission. Uh, I think it's everybody's there. Like Troy. Uh, let me get a little fast forward here. Yeah, so Data, Jordy, uh, Troy, Crusher, Riker. Am I missing anybody? I think that's it. Uh, they're all waiting to say goodbye, but like in military style. And Worf's kind of uh, cho- choking back some feelings, I think. Uh, then he says, uh, permission to leave the ship. Uh, Picard says, permission granted, cupola, cupola or whatever. And then Worf says, goodbye. Uh, and then Riker dismisses everybody. He says, you know, basically get back to work. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Picard just kind of stays good behind, good behind, behind as everybody goes back and kind of just looks at the, um, transporter, uh, kind of stares off at it. Then we see some shots of the ships, uh, Duras's crew. Oh, then we go to, um, back to wherever Duras's sisters hang out. Uh, so they're there. His sister, their sisters, uh, Tor- Toral. So let's see, who's there? So, yeah, Toral, Duras's sisters, uh, some uh, Romulan dude, uh, and then a Romulan messenger comes in, hands a messenger, and then we see a char- the character in the background before, and uh, they see Jesus Picard rejected uh, Garon's plea, uh, Enterprise is left to orbit, and Toral says, oh, he wasn't tough enough, uh, Picard's weak, uh, 
And they say, be quiet, kid. Uh, and then the, the woman steps forward. You immediately hear her voice. She say, I know that voice. This really was such a reveal for me the first time. It's so sweet. Uh, and she says, celebrate later, Toral. Uh, we should not disallow, discount Jean-Luc Picard yet. Uh, he is human, and humans have a way of showing up when you least expect them. And uh, while she's saying that, we see that uh, the actress who played Tasha Yar, or Tasha Yar, and uh, pretty mind blowing because uh, she was in, she was in the big you know the big spaceship in the sky, and uh, that's how the episode and the season and the episode end. Uh, and we will do another episode. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll continue that. You know, the next episode we do will be that one. Um, but let's look at a couple of things. One thing I question I had, uh, let's see, Wikipedia, the ep- entry for this episode. Uh, this was the 100th and the 101st episodes of the series in the fourth and fifth season. I mean, I had a question about the, uh, this is about the plot. I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I don't know when they were, uh, when they were filmed. They're both written by Ronald Moore. Uh, and I mean, not to be, be, but the writing is really, really, really good. According to Wikipedia, Ronald Reagan was on set during filming of the first episode. Uh, it's one of the high, more highly recommended, uh, uh, episodes, um, it's on the Blu-ray, uh, reunion is a prequel to this, uh, and yesterday's Enterprise, which I think we might have covered, uh, is also re- related to the next uh, part two. It doesn't say anything about filming, so I guess they probably, maybe they filmed it, you know, a few months apart. I'm not sure. Uh, just in case you're wondering, uh, the baldric is what uh, Worf wears. I always forget uh, the sash uh, that goes over the left or right of uh, Klingons. It's uh, a symbol of their Klingon house. Uh, Worf, uh, wears his baldric as a member of Starfleet over his right shoulder. Uh, so I just wanted to get that. Now, those of you studying for SAT or any other thing, purview is one of the words of the week. P-U-R-V-I-E-W is from Middle English, uh, purview, provisio, uh, and the Anglo-Norman purviewista, uh, it is provided. This is from the Wiccan Wiccanictionary. It's a purview as a noun, the enacting part of a statute, the scope of a statute, uh, the scope or range of interest or control. I think that's what how Picard was using it, but it may be, yeah, as a noun, uh, range of understanding. It was a scope or range of his interest or control as arbiter, uh, as arbiter. What about leave of absence? That's a word we use all the time. This is also from Wikipedia. It's a period of time you were away from your job while maintaining status of employee. Uh, it can be used restrictively to exclude other periods away from the workplace, uh, like vacation, pay, paid time off, holidays, hi, uh, hi, hiatus, uh, sabbaticals. Uh, but usually leave of absence is used for exceptional circumstances, uh, but such an arrangement is a predefined uh, termination at a particular date or after a certain event has occurred, wharf, yeah, there's paid and unpaid, continue, you know, but they don't, I don't know how that, any of that works on, uh, I don't know how any of that works on Starfleet. Uh, Arbiter, oh, Arbiter is a character in Halo. Uh, Arbiter Clash, a Protoss ship in Starcraft, uh, but it's a person who decides uh, uh, things in arbitration. Arbiter is used in Dante in the game uh, uh, DMC. Uh, Arbiter, though, I, I think it, which one was the Arbiter? It was in Star. Oh, that's in Starfleet. I thought there was though the Protoss and Starfleet have uh, Arbiters. I think I don't know if Arbiter is a good long range one or if the Arbiter is that the giant one. I don't know. Nothing like a Starcraft craft reference. Then Kelly Cam is a Klingon U measurement. Uh, so this is from uh, fan memoryalpha.fandom.com. 
Uh, it's intended for use at a planetary scale and interstellar. Oh, insignificant for interstellar measurements. Uh, it doesn't wonder what it converts to. I mean, it sounds like kilometers, uh, but it just doesn't say. It would be nice, you know, have a conversion. Uh, it probably converts somewhere, but uh, yeah, I don't know. But so Kelly Cams, so let's just say it's like a kilometers, but, but uh, that wouldn't be accurate. Okay, and then perhaps I think that said once or twice in this episode reminds me of this song. I think I first heard it as a cake song, uh, but originally it was a song known as Quizas, 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 or UI in Spanish. Uh, but it's a, a, a famous, uh, popular song by Cuban songwriter Osvaldo Fares. Uh, who uh, wrote the music and the original lyrics for the song, which became a hit for Bobby Capo in 1947. Uh, the English lyrics were written by Joe Davis. They're not a translation of the Spanish lyrics. Uh, English version was re- first recorded by Desi Arnaz in 1948. It's also been covered by Bing Crosby, Nat King Cole, Doris Day, uh, Sarah Montiel, Celia Cruz, uh, Paco de Lucia, uh, Cake, uh, Samantha Fox, holy cow, really? Uh, Jerry Hollowell uh, from uh, uh, one of the original Spice Girls, uh, uh, Mari Wilson, Ruben Gonzalez, I didn't realize it was covered this many times, Emma Bunton, Pussycat Dolls, Point of Vista Social Club, uh, Andrea Bocelli, Il Divo, I guess this is going, uh, so it's been recovered a lot of times, uh, and here's the lyrics, uh, this is taken from the cake song, but it is the lyrics from, uh, so the songwriters are, uh, Osvaldo F- Faris and, uh, Joe Davis, uh, you won't admit you love me, and so how am I ever to know? You only tell me, perhaps, 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 a million times I ask you, and then I ask you over again. You only answer, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. If you can't make your mind up, we'll never get started. And I don't want to wind up uh, being parted, broken hearted. So if you really love me, say yes. Uh, But if you don't, dear, confess. uh, And and perhaps, please don't tell me, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. uh, if you can't make your mind up, we'll never get started. And I don't want to wind up being parted, brokenhearted. So if you really love me, say yes. Uh, but if you don't, dear, confess. Uh, and please don't tell me, perhaps, perhaps. So that's the song, uh, Perhaps, uh, Perhaps, Perhaps, by uh, Joe Davis and Osvaldo Faris. Uh, uh, Joe Davi- that's the song by Joe Davis and Osvaldo Faris. Uh, just reminding me of... Uh, uh, I don't know who the uh, times it gets uh, perhaps came up in this episode. Perhaps uh, I'll talk to you soon. Good night. All right, everybody. It's time to talk about Redemption 2. No, that wasn't uh, the second Redemption tour for your favorite 80s pop artist or 90s boy band. Uh, though it probably should have been. It could be. If, you, you know, if, if I'm fully compensated. Oh, actually, you'd be, you'd have to compensate. Uh, it's not the title of my episode, but you could just credit me with the idea and free tickets for the entire tour, which I know is, oh, well, no, but then I'd have, uh, never mind. How about just a friendly smile? Okay, this one opens. So this is part two. It's called Redemption 2. It, I don't know. Did anyone have an album, Redemption 2? Or was that a game? Uh, okay, so I'm distracted. So this starts off with last time, uh, because it's part two of the first episode, Redemption. I think I also wondered if they filmed this over, you know, apart from one another, or as one episode. And I don't think I could find that online, uh, though I didn't dig too deep. Uh, we starts off last time, we got Gowron. My pen ran out of ink here. Galron, civil. Oh, so we got to prevent the civil trouble with the uh, Klingons. You know, not many Star Trek's start out with this next generation's ones. I was would speak with you, and they're like, "This is Duras's kid." Uh, we have 
Oh, we have, we have, oh, we have Duras is here. Follow us. Oh, Worf says, I'll speak with you. It's Duras's dad. Then Duras's kid, Toral. Toral. Or Toral. Tor, I don't know. But follow me. Then some lasers, I think. Picard ain't, can't do it. Honor returned. That's Worf. Uh, off of the off the ship, uh, Enterprise out to Tasha Yar. Uh, do not uh, discount Picard or humans. They appear at the most inopportune times. And now, I didn't look this up either because, you know, I do my research before I record uh, oh, whose voice that was. Somehow I missed this page in my research. You know, if you're a, a patron and you see my notes, uh, usually a box, they put a box around the words I want to look up. Uh, this one is just for parentheses. Whose voice is doing it? And now the conclusion. Okay, it opens with trouble in space. We're on um, Kern's ship, Worf's brother's ship. Uh, Worf's like, withdraw. This is the first teaser of some subtle theming. He says, no way, man. Kern says, uh, chart a new course uh, right into that star. And somebody says, but sir, or something like that. Then there's two ships on their tail. They toss out words like corona and photosphere. The shields are failing. Maintain course, says Kern. I guess I thought Worf was going to be on Gowron's ship, uh, but now he's serving for Kern, who's, he shouldn't he be in charge? Just a question. Uh, let's see, S- stand by. Uh, the two ships go, the two ships on their tail, they go right into, they don't make it through the photosphere. Aman Yak, Aman Yak, what does that say? Two ships at Amaniac. Let me look here. Uh, closing, they go into the sun. I have no idea what my handwriting says there. Two ships out at Amon, Amaniac. Enterprise. I don't know what it says. Maintain course, closing, whatever. They don't get there and they're out. They go into warp drive. Then we have Captain Picard meeting Stardate. He says we're at Starbase 234 and uh, meeting with the Fleet Admiral Shant- Shanti and some other, like, uh, higher-up dude. Riker's there. Guard's kind of making his case. Let's see. Riker watches. It's worth us watching the scene a few times just to watch Riker watching Picard. What does that say? Oh, Picard basically proposes a blockade. First, he's like, we got to intervene, but in a, you know, way that is allowed. And Admiral Shanti's like, no, we can't intervene. And uh, Picard says, well, uh, this concerns us all, internal mass, you know, the whole thing from last episode. And uh, he says, well, if the, um, who, who, are, who are those called? The Romulans are involved. Uh, this is probably bigger. They think they're supplying them, and uh, they say using their cloaking devices. So we'll do a blockade. Well, how are you going to catch them? It looks like I said Tashin beams, but it's tachyon beams. Uh, again, you got to watch this just for Riker watching Picard. And I mean, that's really hard acting, like just having to be there silent and be in the scene the whole time. I think. I mean, I couldn't do that. For, I mean, I can barely. They can act. Tacky on beams, assemble your fleet, she says. Riker says, nicely done, which becomes another, I think this gets used at the tail end of the episode. And then the episode opens. We're like seven minutes into the show now. No, no, like it's, well, right now we're at 5.08. And I'm at 7.0 something, so that's funny. Then Captain's Log... Uh, something says, hey, that was relatively painless. Um, uh, I think it's Ricard saying well, we establish our getting the com- oh getting the permission was painless, uh, but implementing the plans ain't going to be easy. Gravitron, Riker. Oh no, let's see. Jordy, Data, Riker, and Picard. Twenty collapse. What does that mean? Oh, twenty ships. They're talking about assembling the ships for the blockade. He says, Jordy, can you do it with 20 ships? He says, more ships, the better. And then Picard's like, okay, get, get those other three ships. Uh, whatever, I, I don't know what they were called. Uh, 
a better data find offering will and Jordy data five oh data first officer I, I don't know what the, but he says uh, Riker you'll command that ship Jordy you'll be his first officer and then we get to kind of the BC plot uh, which is uh, data stays behind and he says listen I'm confused uh, uh, commander it looks like the Excalibur is the one that, uh, right, what, what better ship for Riker? Yeah, uh, but he says, Data says, uh, uh, why haven't I, why aren't I getting a ship to command? Uh, he goes, Can I ask you a question? Personal in nature. And Picard goes, Well, I need you here. Why? And he goes, Well, you, there's not a lot of senior officers available. Yeah, I only got 26 years of experience, but if you don't think androids are ready to command, then maybe I should work on my performance. And Picard goes, go ahead, get in charge of the USS Donald Sutherland. Uh, that's a ship with some gravitas, uh, if I ever heard of one. And he goes, there's nobody, nobody better suited than you until they name a ship after me. Then that'll be the most gravitas in a ship. Uh, so that's that scene. James, oh, uh, no one does it better. Something like, how does that scene end? Somebody says nobody does it better. May, oh, no better suited. No one better. It just made me think of that James Bond song, uh, Baby, You're the Best or whatever. But uh, he says no one better suited to the task than you. Uh, then we're at the big Klingon party oh but, but, but it's a battle post-battle party we get a little mike haggerty it's larg an actor everybody's probably familiar with we'll talk about that maybe uh kura intros oh uh, what's his brother's name not kura he intros wharf to larg larg's like uh they throw drinks around and then Worf has to do multiple WTFs in this. He says, dude, what WTF? Uh, shouldn't we be working on stuff? And his, like uh, Kern, that's his brother's name. He says, does it matter? And he goes, here we're all going on. So, uh, he goes, he says, is there nothing in your heart but duty? And I, I said, hardy, har, har. Uh, I didn't even laugh till just now. And Worf goes, there's no, there, there, well, he goes, technically there's D-U-T-Y in my heart, but I'm not going to say there's duty in my heart because uh, then Scoots will have a, will have a go at it. Uh, uh, but he goes, responsibility, Worf says, it's not duty. And he goes, We're, what about glory? We can't think about stabilizers because Worf wanted to work on the stabilizers. Uh, Son of Mooks, let's live this night like it was our last. And I think Worf tried to join in, but uh, then Lurse and Bator are watching, and they say, Worf's not like his brother. They say, no, he's trying, but he's not, you know, he's unsure of himself. Uh, and they say, maybe we could restore his confidence, hubba, hubba, hubba. Oh, there's also Worf was uh, kind of, the camera had him in like this half light for a little while, which was cool. What does that say? Tomarnin Verde. Oh, tomorrow. Oh, that was the. I said, oh, that's like that Dave Matthews song. Because that kind of is what they're doing. Eat, drink, and be merry. And, you know, tomorrow we'll big farm it. Uh, another ship we see. Then we see Timothy Carhart, the actor. Uh, what is that? His Hobbs uh, something. I forget it. We'll find out his name. Don't worry. So some name. If we trace this back, I wonder if, like, this guy may have been on Facebook before every other uh, dude that knows everything. But Data rolls up. Uh, this scene kind of played out a little bit like a play. Uh, it, it just when I was, I've, I've watched this episode quite a few times. And uh, requests, it, it, but it's, uh, so Data comes, he's command of the ship. Uh Hobson, oh, God, that's the dude's name, Hobson. He's Christopher Hobson. I know, like, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him in a bit. Uh, but Data says, I take command of this vessel, note the time and the date. Uh, dude says, I'd like to be transferred. Data says, why? He goes, I don't think I'd be a good first officer for you. 
data says you got a great record, uh, adequate record, I mean. And he goes, I mean, for you. And he says, I'm not big on androids being in charge, I'll be honest. And data, really, I really enjoyed data's commanding, uh, you know, it had imperfections, but uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, but he goes, request denied, dude, you get to work. And then if you saw Data had it rough, Picard's got O'Brien as his uh, bridge buddy. I don't know if O'Brien's the first officer, but uh, Picard said, okay. I mean, O'Brien does fine. I'm just giving him a hard Come on, O'Brien. I'm just giving you a hard time. Uh, everybody was like, O'Brien's on the bridge. Uh, you're short-staffed. And O'Brien Comedy Cast. That's my other podcast. Uh, probably just, I'm just jealous of you. I'll be honest. O'Brien, so don't worry about it. Uh, yeah, but they're getting underway. Burkhard says engage. Uh, so that's great. What else? So data goes to work. That was on the last scene. We see the Armada, which is cool. Then there's an ad, ad break. Uh, what does that say? The phasers? The fainers? Uh, it, uh, oh, the sisters? Is that what that says? Uh, Josh tries to calm them. So I guess the next scene is like, uh, yeah, Batur says, uh, Romulans are late. Where's the supplies? Uh, and then Sela, she's Commander Sela. She says, uh, uh, it doesn't matter. We t- took out Memphis system. We got Ka- Gowron, uh, and the convoy will be here in due course. Uh, and Lord just says, the Federation fleet left Starbase 234 for cooling on territory. Uh, 20 ships. They say, who's in charge? Picard. Uh, Sela goes, hmm. And Toral goes, what, do you, what is going on? What? And she goes, Sela, much like Picard, doesn't like you. She goes, silence the child. Uh, and uh, get the uh, uh, Romulans ready. Mova, Movar, Movar is her sidekick. Lorsa goes, well, 20 ships is a bluff. And Sheila says, maybe, you, you know, but trust me, I'm way more hyper intelligent, I would say, Sheila is, at least uh, strategically. What else do I have? Uh, perhaps. I don't know when that happens. She, they zoom on her when she says, perhaps, though. Better leaders, Gowron. Has some dusty supplies. Uh, better leaders, you failed. Worf, uh, we have to get to work. Uh, oh, so then the, the, we're at the Klingon meeting hall or whatever. And everybody's upset with Gowron. Worf's trying to be uh, an adult and uh, say, we got to get to work. Work together, get to work. We'll quit messing around with all this uh is because this isn't a locker room. Uh, it goes save the arm wrestling for when we're already a victory. And no one really wants to listen. Uh, Worf's breaking up all this thing. Now we can continue. Then we just see a shot of Troy walking on the bridge. And then Picard and O'Brien are talking about subspace anomalies. Yeah, uh, Picard calls Riker. He says, time to spread the net or something. Oh, spread the net. Uh, can't really say that's undoing in that. Uh, a data ship, all stop. Uh, this dude is so, Hobson, he put the uh, pass, he's so passive aggressive. Uh, so let's see, all stop. Uh, so let's see, let's get there. He says, uh, tell him we're ready. Hobson starts giving out orders. Uh, uh, Data says, he goes, yeah, we got a leak. Data goes, why isn't the backup ready? He goes, we didn't test the backups. So then he starts, he says, Terry, get down to engineering. And Data goes, how come the phasers and everything's offline? He goes, and then Hobson ignores him. He goes, Keith, I want you. And then Data goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hobson, bruh. Yeah, it's inappropriate for you to determine a course of action without consulting me, a uh, commanding officer. And then Hobson, I mean, really, this is like, uh, r- like totally out of chain of command. He s- speaks back. He says, uh, I'm worried about the people on deck. Uh, uh, he goes, everybody be- belay those orders. Uh, what should we do, sir? 
And Data says, this is one of the highlights of many when Data says, okay, now that you're going through chain of command, just redo what you did uh, and get back to work, uh, which I loved. He said, oh, go ahead and do this, 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 the stuff you just said. But not in a way like, a, like a, it's just great. Like, he makes me undo it and do it again. I love that he gives out the same orders. Uh, end scene. Oh, Data's face around 1845. He says, oh, I'm in a pickle here. They don't really have, they have a more, uh, they don't have a flashy bridge like uh, the other, like the um, Enterprise, the Lux Bridge. Picard FaceTimes Jordy and Riker. He says, energize. Then we see the Romulan seal. Commander Tachyon missions. Uh, it was something. Oh, coming from the fleet, they're scanning with Tachyon missions. Uh, they'll find us. Uh, and Seela goes, figure out a solution. I'll have to convince uh, Picard by other means uh, that he should get out of here. Let's see. Romulan ship. Oh, then they say, hey, Romulan ships, this is O'Brien. Picard, Romulan ship just showed up. Uh, it's hailing us. Uh, and then there's like a WTF moment. So, uh, Hey, Picard goes, put him on screen. And then he sees uh, Tasha, stands up. Uh, and then O'Brien looks up and sees her. And then he goes, uh, let me see what he says. He goes, Tasha? And she goes, nope, Commander Sela. I think then every person on the ship turned uh, uh, and looked. Uh, she goes, my mother was Tasha. Yar. And then there's like major drama music. And she goes, you got 20 hours to hit the road, Jack. Then we have Troy and Picard and uh, um, uh, uh, Crusher. And they say, what is it? Is this possible? No, unless it's a clone, not possible for her to be Tashiar's daughter. Could be a trick or something, but she's not lying. She thinks she's uh, her daughter. And... Uh, then they leave. Picard goes, thank you. Then he's alone. He pauses and thinks. You get a close up. Then Guinan comes in. And he goes, geez. Uh, she goes, yeah, news travels fast. Uh, and Picard goes, it's just a distraction. And she goes, you remember the Enterprise C? And Picard goes, Narendra 3. Uh, and she goes, well, what happened to the people left on that ship? Uh, they went to Romulus, Picard says, rumors. Uh, and again, he goes, nope, Tasha Yar was one of the people on that ship. Uh, and she made it to Romulus. And Picard goes, that was 23 years ago. She's only like 23, 26, so it's not possible. Or 22, 20, you know, 24, 25, 26. And again, goes, yeah, I know it's not possible. Or prob- probably, you know, likely. Uh, but I do know she was on that ship and uh, she was an adult or, uh, yeah. And I think you sent her there. And Picard goes, nah, I don't think. And she goes, uh, I know that you did. I just know. Picard goes, you never even met her. And then he says, well, if you have a vague intuition. And she goes, no, 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 no. You can't dismiss this. If I'm right, uh you gotta, you're got you responsible for the situation in some sense, which I think is a little bit drastic, but maybe she was just trying to empower Picard. So Picard goes, time to meet this Commander Sela. Yeah, then, let's see, I lost my pain. Colors, Guinan, vague intuition. Oh, then we see Worf and Kern for the good of an empire. Is something, something, yo. What happened? So Worf and Kern are like, uh, Worf goes, we got to focus, man. What are you doing with oh, in this nonsense? And Gowron, too. And Kern goes, you chose Gowron, not me, man. Now you don't like him anymore? And he goes, no, no, it's just I want more focus. And Kern goes, don't speak about this. Uh, either follow him or don't. Uh, he's our leader. The time for debate is over. Maybe it was the wrong choice for you to put on that uniform. Uh, then Worf gets uh, some uh, lackeys take Worf for, for a visit somewhere. 
for the good of the empire. Uh, something, something. Worf uh, no longer. So- I don't know. The time for debate is over. Worf. Okay, so then there's a commercial. Then Sila rolls in. Uh, uh, to to the ready room or the meet, you know, the conference hall on the Enterprise. They're both standing. Kind of a little standoff. Eventually, Picard sits. The first, uh, Sila's arms are crossed. A little Khalees gone. Only question on my mind. So we'll go through the dialogue in a second. Uh, at some point, she sits on the table with her knee up and kind of tells her tale. And uh, she says, all that's left is Romulan. Out, I'm full of them. 14 hours, and then Picard's thinking face. So she rolls in. She says, "What's some? What do we have to discuss?" Uh, Picard first say, "Oh, they play a little chess game." Picard goes, "Oh, we're just here doing work, no intention." And she goes, "Oh, humanitarian work." And Picard goes, "Well, keeping external powers out of Klingon affairs." Uh, and she goes, "Well, you wouldn't have to do that anyway, because we could slip by you. You wouldn't even know it." Uh, Unless you have a way to detect us. And she goes, but that's not really why we're here, is it? Uh, don't you want to know about Tatasha, Yarby, and my mom? And Picard lays out, well, she was, at, was it possible she was on the sea as an adult? Because she should have been a child, right? Uh, and she, they say, she goes, yeah, but she was 24 years ago. Sent there by you from the future. And I've seen this episode. I think we covered it even. Maybe it was yesterday's Enterprise, and I'm not sure. It was one of those time time Enterprise ones. Uh, and she goes, yeah, General Romulan General fell in love with her, made a deal, and then I was born. Uh, and Picard goes, can I see your mother? She goes, no. She goes, one night when I was four, she wanted me to leave Romulan, Romulus, uh, and I said, this is my home. And uh, so I stayed with my father, more or less. And she that's when she says, all's left Romulan. I never doubt that. Picard goes, doubts I'm full of that. But uh, he goes, I guess it sounds like it's true, but it's not going to affect my judgment. And she goes, 14 hours, use them wisely. Card thinking face. Uh, then but we see Bator kissing Worf, uh, who wakes up and says, let me give you a kissy poop. What? Uh, then they say, welcome, Sai. Yo, he sighs. Uh, what do you want? Uh, your family. Oh, they say, well, why, why don't we work together? Uh, your family does not value honor. But we could be friends. Uh, Toral need a, a firm guidance, and he's going to be a leader uh, no matter what. You could make Bator join us uh, and... Uh, and he goes, yeah, in a world without honor, where honor has no meaning. And then uh, Tasha, uh, uh, Sila calls and she says, dude, I don't got time for this. She must have been watching on FaceTime on mute. Uh, and she goes, yeah, I don't got time for this. I need the security protocols. Uh, uh, then we have Picard on the bridge. He says, uh, we must expose them, Gowron. Uh, so you got to make a move so that they make a move. Uh, and he says, uh, okay, uh, uh, what does he say? Um, very well. Somebody says that, and he goes, oh, by the way, Worf is with the Duras family now, you know, uh, not by choice. Get another Picard close-up. Uh, then Picard and Riker go over the game plan that to fake them out, uh, to fake Seal out. They're going to make a fake gap uh, to trick them. Uh, then we go to Seal's ship. Her ship has some cool neon on it. So if you like neon, join, you know, if you like neon, you like Romulans. Uh, Romulans, we like neon too. Uh, they say she's with meeting with her advisor, Mo, Mo, Movar or whatever. So they find out, the, you know, everybody's making their moves. Uh, and she says, do you have an idea of how to deal with this? He goes, yeah, big pulse, and we can disable their network. Uh, and then she says, okay. And they say, hey, wait a second. One of the ships ran out of gas, uh, and they got to redeploy. There's an opening in the net. Uh, and at first, Desila says, oh, wow, not enough ships. Uh, and he move, move R says, let's move R. Uh, 
And she goes, no. And he goes, it's what we're waiting for. And she goes, yes, so does Picard. He's giving us what we need. He expects us to take it. Uh, And she goes, we'll send an energy burst where the android is uh, in command. So that happens. Uh, Do we have a way through pulse? Uh, Yeah, we want to block off. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Go. Oh, it's go time now. Oh, eight, oh, nine, five. Uh, I don't know what, what any of that is. Uh, oh, that was, uh, Sela. She says that that's where they send the tachyon disruptor. Touch, uh, call the Sutherland. Do they say, oh, the, the O'Brien says, yo, there's a, it's all disrupted. They call data in the Sutherland. He says, yes, sir. 10 million kilometers of uh, non-detection. And Picard says, oh, boy, we better fall back. Uh, he goes, because, uh, yeah, that, he goes, they're going to go through. We'll fall back. We'll reestablish a new net, which doesn't seem like the best move, in my opinion. I mean, maybe it's just buying them time to outthink, which happens. And Hobson says, okay, everybody, we're supposed to go to Gamma Edron. And Data says, okay, uh, get the course ready. And then Data stands up. He goes to the computer. Uh, let's see. This is a great, great uh, couple of scenes. I even in my notes used to strong words to describe this guy. So Data goes to the computer. The guy sits at his side looking at what he's doing. Like he's in, like, holy mackerel. And uh, he goes, what are you doing? And Data goes, well, he goes, the tachyon, uh, there may be a residual tachyon signature. And he goes, well, we don't have a way of detecting it. Uh, And Picard, Data goes, I'll stop. Uh, And the guy goes, sir, the fleet's been ordered to Gamma, Edward, whatever. Uh, And Data goes, if we don't do this now, uh, it'll be too late. Uh, Reconfigure the sensors, ion particles. The guy still has something to say. he goes, uh, sits at his side, I'll stop. Uh, he goes, uh, uh, oh, yeah, the area's flooded with tachyon particles. We'll never find it. Data goes, I'm aware of the difficulties. Uh, the phaser's on. And the guy goes, what about the three decks? Uh, Data goes, we'll do, take care of that when it's easier. And this guy reminded me a lot of Facebook. I said, was this guy on Facebook before it was invented? Uh because he, he, his next couple of things, I've seen, like, uh, uh, the splainers. I mean, this guy was, like, splaining before it was a thing. He says, you know, he's projecting a meaning on the data that's irrelevant. He says, you don't care about the people on the ship. Uh, we're not machines. Uh, and potato, I was a potato. I don't know why I said that, but, but data goes, uh, Hobson, carry out your my orders or I'll relieve you of duty. And he goes, not to do, you know, not that kind, you know, he goes, the D-U-T-Y. And he goes, yes, sir. But he said, it was great. You should definitely rewatch this. Then Captain, oh, O'Brien says, Captain, uh, to Picard, Sutherland's not coming. Picard goes, call him. Then Hobson says, Enterprise is calling. And Data goes, sweep at maximum range. And he goes, aren't you going to answer the call? And Data just ignore like, this is how you're supposed to do it, too. He just ignores it. He goes, okay, overlay the display, highlight any signatures, concentrate a sensor sweep. Uh, still, just like commenters, he says, this is pointless. These readings could be anything. No way to Ferris to figure this out. And Data goes, okay, go conf- reconfigure for level six. Uh, the guy goes, level six? Uh, and the data goes, do it, uh, but very strongly, like uh, in a command, as a commander. Uh, then the guy goes, okay, I'm ready. He go like, uh, but Picard's calling. And then Picard says, do it, data. Hey, what's up? Uh, and data goes, stand by and get ready, Hobson. And Hobson goes, don't you hear? Uh, Picard's calling. And data goes, uh, go, go. And, uh, yeah, do this brief days of data aces it all. Do it. Uh, b- b- something. Uh, but then they detect the convoy. The data stands. Uh, they, they say, uh, oh boy, 
Hobson goes to their, bu- their head. Oh, Muvar goes, Sila, we're busted. Uh, and she goes, let's get out of here. Oh, and that's when Muvar says, they need this convoy. Otherwise, they can't win. And she goes, it's six over. Uh, and they go, uh, Muvar says, what should I tell Lursa and Bator? She goes, they're on their own. Uh, then Hobson says, okay, they're headed back. Data goes, make a full report. Uh, take phasers offline, clean things up. And then Hobson's fully been, he goes, yes, sir, Captain. And if I was Data, I'd say, too late, dude. Uh, you're, go- you're like, uh, you're going to be cleaning, uh, cleaning the uh, latrines for the next six months. Yeah, but Data's probably nicer than me. Uh, where are we? Uh, Data stands, heading back, make full report. Yes, sir, Captain. Data pauses. He likes it. Uh, Toral, is it, he's like, we're in trouble. We're defeated. Where are the Romulans? Uh, new Cape, uh, Toral, in Worf's care. Worf takes over Sister's Ditch. Oh, so the Sister's d- Ditch, Toral, as Worf takes over. Yeah, uh, Toral goes, how come the Romulans never came? Uh, so Worf takes over. Yeah, and that's it. Then, uh, oh, Toral, Worf, Worf is in command. Then Kern breaks in. And he says, hello, Toral, Toral, Toral. Toral. Yeah, then we have Captain's Log, personal, personal log, by the way, 450, 25.4. Regard goes, yeah, we got it. Gowron's victory. We're at the Klingon home world. Well, I'm going to do a full report. Then Ricard's in his the data says, can I come in? Uh, you know, I know I disobeyed an order. Even, you know, ends don't justify the means. And Picard goes, no, they don't. Uh, but I also can't have people find, just just following orders blindly without knowing the situation. And he goes, they noted it in your record. And Data goes to leave. He goes, Mr. Data, nicely done. And Data goes, great, sir. Yeah, then, nicely done, smile. Oh, Picard smiles. Uh, that was nice. Oh, then we see a Klingon light fixture for a little while. Uh, Gowron says, great report, Picard. Uh, one last matter to attend to. They bring Worf and Kern come in, then Toral. And they say, Toral, you're busted. And Toros goes, Duras family's good rules. Uh, and uh, Garon says, not today. He goes, Worf, uh, this is the family that took your honor. I give you Toral. And Worf says, I prefer not to traditionally take Toral to the big farm. And uh, they go, this is our way. Even Kern says, it. that's the Klingon way. And uh, this is... Cl- cl- this is, you know, just classic, a great, I don't know, great character. Worf goes, I know, but it is not my way. Great acting. Goes, he hasn't done anything, and I can't make him totally responsible for his family. And then they say, well, Kern's going to have to do it. Uh, one of the, this is actor, the, oh, Gowron reminds me of the, uh, this SCT. We'll talk about it. Uh, the real actor is Robert O'Reilly. But uh, Worf says, no, this is, they say, well, Kern could take Toral. Worf goes, no, 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 he's uh, mine. Just, uh, you know, put him in whatever. Uh, he, he goes, I'm sparing him. And then uh, Gowron goes, as you wish. And then Worf turns to Picard goes, uh, permission to return to duty, sir. And Picard says, granted. And then they walk off together. So great end of the episode. So, really good stuff. Now, let's run through some notes here. One thing was Tasha Yar reminding me of this game that I don't think I ever played called Yar's Revenge. Uh, and I'll link to it. It was for the Atari 2600 and the Game Boy Advanced uh, and Game Boy Color. And it just always had really cool uh, album art cover, like a little bit like a, a fly. Uh, oh, wait, I can't say that. They just always thought I had really cool album cover. Uh, so I'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, but uh, that's a game, Yar's Revenge. This episode could have been called 
I guess it's not Yar's Revenge, uh, but uh, another uh, great uh, comedian that Gowron reminded me of, uh, uh, someone that I grew up kind of watching and really influenced me. I guess I was watching it on repeat, uh, is Joe Flaherty uh, from SCTV, the Canadian st- sketch uh, TV show and group. Uh, he's also been on a lot of other things. Um, he was also on National Lampoon uh, Radio Hour, and he's, he's been in movies. Uh, he was in uh, Back to the Future Part Two, uh, Happy Gilmore. He's played other other children, but uh, he's on Freaks and Geeks. Uh, but he's just one of my favorite comedians uh, f- from watching those repeats of SCTV that I'll probably have to repeat again. Then anytime I hear a convoy, I think of uh, the song "Convoy" being sung, sung by like Homer Sim, uh, by being sung by Homer Simpson. But I said, "Who? What is Convoy?" It's a 1975 novelty song, according to Wikipedia. So for all, everything's been from Wikipedia. It's performed by C.W. McCall and uh, voiced by Bill Fries uh, and Chip Davis as a character, C.W. McCall. It, but it hit number one on country and pop charts, uh, and it's considered one of the 100 greatest country songs of all time. It uh, has CB dialogue, CB slang in the chorus, uh, something, something, great big convoy trucking through the night or something like that. And I don't know, when they talk about it, it just reminded me of that. Let's see where else it's been. It's been remade a few times. A lot. Uh, and. Uh, Paul Brandt version. There was a Christmas convoy. I don't see any mention of it in The Simpsons, but I know it was in there. I can hear Homer singing that. But I'm I'm almost positive. Uh, then these lyrics came up. Uh, Join us. Uh, this my daughter's been big on uh, Pippin. So this is from the musical musical Pippin. Uh, Join us. Leave your fields to flower. Uh, Join us. Leave your cheese to sour. Uh, join us, uh, come and waste an hour or two, do doodly do. A journey, journey to a spot exciting, mystic, and exotic. Uh, a journey through our anodotic review, antidotic review. We've got magic just for you. We've got miracle plays to play. We've got parts to perform and hearts to warm. Kings and things to take you by storm as we go along our way. And that's uh, from Musical Pippin. If you're big into 70s style musicals like Hair, uh, I think you should definitely check out Pippin. Uh, I, I haven't seen it. I've, I've listened to the cast album, uh, but I have not seen the musical. But my daughter lo- has seen it twice and she loved it. A local, just a local small version of it. Yeah, but we all know there's no small performers. Uh, what about, I, had, I went over to memoryalpha.fandom.com, you know, the Memory Alpha wiki, uh, to find out about the rules around cloning and stuff in uh, Star Trek. Uh, you don't know what clone means. Uh, but then I said, what is the legal, there was the Dominion, they did it a lot. Uh, this must have been an uh, episode I haven't seen. William Riker claimed that 100 or 100,000 Rikers, uh, if he was cloned, would diminish his status. Yeah, that's from the episode Up the Long Ladder. Uh, and the Romulans did make a, a Jean-Luc Picard version. I haven't seen this episode either. Uh, wait, is that in is the Romulans? Yeah, I don't want to spoil anything, though. You'd think there would, I guess I, I thought it'd be more clear on the law that it was outlawed or something. A couple other uh, performers in this episode that you'd probably recognize. Uh, one was Timothy Carhart. He played the uh, splainer. Uh, he's been on like a lot of CBS dramas, but he, I don't know where I recognize him from. Maybe Thelma and Louise or Beverly Hills Cop 3, or maybe I've just seen this episode so many times. Uh, but he really does a great job of being. Uh, not, like someone you don't root, you don't do not root for. Uh, he's done a lot of guest starring though: uh, Quantum Leap, uh, X Files, Midnight Caller, Empty Nest, Roseanne, Law and Order, L.A. Law, uh, TV movies, CSI. 
24, uh, yeah, lots of stuff. So you're judging Amy Frazier. So, uh, he's in the ghost ghostbusters. Uh, uh, so he's been a lot of things. Oh yeah. He's been a lot of movies. Uh, so he's somebody you recognize a working girl, pink Cadillac, hunt for an October air force one. Uh, so it's just someone I had to look up and then Mike Haggerty. Now this is someone holy, you recognize him. He played, uh, I forgot who he played. The, not like the, uh, somebody that was working with the Duras family, like the head of one of the Duras, uh, groups. Uh, but he's an American actor. He's been, he was on friends. Uh, he's on curb your enthusiasm, Martin cheers, Wayne's brothers, wonder years, uh, Seinfeld, Carlin show. He uh, started in the second city. He's known for his Chicago accent and his thick mustache. Uh, more recently, he's been on the Goldbergs, Back in the Day, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, uh, Entourage, uh, Desperate Housewives, uh, Deadwood ER. He's been in movies. Uh, you definitely recognize him. He's got that very thick. He has cr- creaky dull. He has creaky dull tones, for no doubt about it. Uh, so, just another person I want to point out. I think that's it. I, I, uh, oh, you want to know more about the musical Pippin? Yeah, let me look that up for you. Sorry about that. Okay, just shot over to Wikipedia again. Pippin is a 1972 musical. Uh, Stephen Schwartz and Robert, uh, Robert Roger O. Herson, uh, Bob Fosse directed the original Broadway production and helped on the book. Uh, uses the premise of a mysterious performance troupe. Uh, to tell the story of Pippin, a young prince uh, searching for meaning and significance. Uh, now, it happens during Charlemagne. Because I thought, when you hear the music, you say, okay, when does this take place? Uh, it takes place in the Middle Ages. The uh, show is pro- financed by Motown Records. Uh, it's the 36th longest running Broadway show. Oh, Ben Vereen was in it, uh, and Bettina Miller. Uh, there was a 2013 revival. It was conceived as a student musical titled Pippin, uh, and it was performed by Carnegie Mellon's uh, Scotch and Soda Theater Troupe. Uh, and the Wikipedia article breaks out the plot, which I was said I want to uh, infringe on. It does, uh, the newer productions might have an extended uh, ending. So Pippin was written to be performed in one act, and its single act structure does not accommodate easily an intermission. Many times, of course, it is broken into two acts, and there's currently a two-act version out there licensed by Music Theater International, and the intermission comes after Morning Glow, uh, that has an Act 1 finale, and the 2013 Broadway revival is performed with an intermission. So there you go, a little bit about Redemption 2 and uh, ending with Pippin. Uh, Good night. All right, everybody, we're continuing our, uh, like, uh, wharf kind of themed episodes here, uh, or, um, yeah, I guess I'd say wharf strongly with a, str- give me a strong side of wharf. Or, you know, I take my Klingons as a sh- strong, you know, I take, I prefer my wharf, uh, anyway. Couldn't think any j- good jokes there. Also, I don't want to, you know, get any, and then the Klingons bad side. Uh, so this episode is uh, season four, episode seven. I don't know if I said that reunion, and it starts off at the bridge. Uh, everybody's working. Uh, I'll go through the dialogue, but I said, "Is there class two, three, and four probes?" Which will be answered. Uh, we see a Klingon ship. Oh, you know what? I just noticed something. Uh, this one of the first few shots in the show is shot from a really low angle. You never pay attention to that stuff except for close-ups. Uh, Right now I'm looking at the Enterprise, uh, camera zooming in on it, or the Enterprise is moving. And yeah, now we have uh, Riker, Picard, and uh, Worf, and it was almost shot from the floor looking up at them, which I guess puts him in a place of authority. Klingon ship is, it appears, this is more gray than a normal, gray and red than the green. I really do find, it, this is a strange thing to say, but I find the green of Klingon ships very comforting. 
Uh, so this one, the gray one, I just said, huh, I miss that green. I don't know what it is. I just say, oh, that's a relaxing color for me. Uh, let's see. Cha- open channel. They get a Klingon ship that was on it. We know we'll go through the dialogue. Unexpected pleasure. Wharf capitalized uh, with an exclamation point. A nod. Urgent matter. Uh, Lieutenant Goren receive her guest. Uh, Worf tries to get out of it. This is a really good Worf episode. Uh, uh, Worf makes up an excuse, which, you know, we'll find out isn't, uh, he says, my dis- dishonor will offend, uh, because it's another Klingon. And Picard is stern, goes to transport to room two. Uh, Worf does a what? Uh, first, I don't know, let me see. Like, Worf does a what? Then there's a zoom on Worf Thoughtful. And as we see it, like, like uh, cause they say two to transport, Worf does a what? Not transport number two. And it's a kid, which we've met before, Alexander, which makes Worf even do, his Worf's mouth is wide open. And I think that's it. Uh, I think it opens after that. Let's see. Let's see. Where are they? Gamma? A Regulon system or something. Uh, some anomalies are there. Readings inconclusive. Uh, they send out two class one probes. Uh, Klingon appears. Uh, what is that doing there? But he says, let's talk to them. Uh, and I think I, I, I got to right, figure out the... Uh, I did a phonetic spelling of uh, uh, this person. You know, Kalar. Uh, is uh, Ambassador Kalar, who's the unexpected pleasure. Good to see you again, Picard and Worf, as she says. Uh, maybe, I don't know if she's appeared on another episode. I have this, is my first uh, Kalar experience. Uh, she's got an urgent matter, wants to come aboard. Yeah, Picard sends Worf, who says, you know, no, Worf's uncomfortable. Uh, then transports in with the kid. And the episode opens, right? Excuses data? What is that? Oh, this is after the open. Uh, my handwriting here is uh, Chad R. Touch on cloak. Bye bye, mommy. Uh, Wharf arms crossed, glove signed, walks away. Alexander plays. Uh, elevator, awkward. Some cherish, uh, can't make eye contact. Well, Worf can't make eye contact. Oh, boy. Uh, does this go deep? Uh, Worf won't ask uh, and walks off the elevator. Uh, she is in Kalar. Uh, why, waits behind. Then we have a meeting with staff. Uh, excuses data? Question mark. Okay, let's see if we could decode that, though. Bye-bye, Mommy. We understand that. Ch- Chad, our touch, and closed. Uh, I don't know what that says, uh, honestly. I thought it was like child care. Oh, child care. Touch and closed. Okay, so ch- ch- that's child care. Yeah, but Alexander gets dropped off at the kind of ch- child care. Oh, he hasn't had much contact with other children. I don't know what that, what my hand was, but he says, bye-bye, Mommy. And Worf waits, arms crossed, uh, and glares. And we learn right away, Kaylor says, hey, Worf, how about a little kiss on my cheeky-poo? He goes, "You haven't? don't you know I've been dishonored? And she goes, so what, are you going to uh, not give me the time of day? And Worf goes, well, I, ex- I ex- uh, respect our traditions, don't you? And she says, I thought you wanted to, to, to uh, like, to talk to me, maybe. Maybe about something small and uh, childlike. Uh, and then Worf, uh, very, this is very, uh, like, 90s, 80s. He says, must I ask you the question? And I feel bad for Kayla because, you know, she's, uh, like, in a position where she's, you know, crushing the patriarchy. And Worf's kind of, uh, I don't know. But he says, must I ask? She goes, yes, you must. Uh, and he just walks away. And she goes, what should I tell Alexander that he about his father? Okay, I don't know what this excuses data is. But they, like, uh, uh, waits behind. And there's a meeting, a staff meeting. This has been coming. Kempak uh, could keep the peace. Uh, he wants to meet with you, Picard, alone. 
It's about time, Picard. I think Kempex says that. Then he says, sit down. And, and they go, oh, they, the old Klingon dark reddish room. Kalar, or no, uh, Kempex out of de- de- breath. It talks about Viridium 6 or something. He's a bit like King Robert Baratheon. Really, I said, well, is this Robert Baratheon based on this dude? He wants, uh, oh, I didn't look this up, but he wants Picard to uh, arb- arbitrate. Uh, first he says arbitrate, uh, but then later Picard says uh, me- simple media. This isn't simple mediation. I said, yeah, those are two different things, Jean-Luc. And he said, Scoots, stay in your wheelhouse, buddy. And I said, sure. And then he says, I have my reasons. Uh, you can't be serious, which reminds me of the routine on the movie Airplane. You can't be serious. Don't call me Shirley. Uh, on the contrary, I decline. Don't insult me, yo. That's what a Kempex says. Uh, by the way, I already sent out the order, so you're doing it anyway. You know, Picard says WTF. Uh, Kempex says, sorry, brah. And he says, this isn't a simple mediation. You're actually asking me to choose the next leader. And uh, something about fight for the right to succession. I want you, oh, no. He says, is this my job is to pick the new leader? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I got Robert Baratheon, and I want you to figure out if it's Gowron or Duras doing it. He goes, because what was it, Lord Baelish or somebody else that did it back in the day? And I go, I don't remember. And then Picard says, Duras, that, like, rich kid, uh, punk? Uh, and he goes, yep. Uh, he goes, interesting. And he says, you could say that very well. I accept. And they cheers. And it goes to commercial, I believe. Yeah. First, when the KLR meeting, she says, yeah, we got trouble. Uh, you know, it's going on politics. Uh, and yeah, then they have the KLR meeting or the Kempak meeting. Sorry, KLR. Uh, so then we go to co- co- commercial. Uh, then we get a captain's log, supplemental, Kempex, uh, pat, you know, gone to the big, uh, he's joined King Robert, wherever King Robert may be. And we're waiting for Duras and Gowron, who both want to be leader of the high council. Okay. Uh, 11, oh, 1140, there's a great zoom on a Klingon ship. Really cool. Uh, we go back to the playroom. They're playing some sort of competitive block building game, which I said, I thought this was an advanced society. Why are they paying, playing a competitive block building game? And Alexander's not happy that he didn't win. Worf shows up, like, uh, it tells him he must earn uh, uh, victory. And then they're walking all a very cute scene. Or I guess touching. This was less cute, but uh, I guess it was super cute. But also, he did walking. Alexander goes, where are the other Klingons? Uh, Worf goes, there aren't any. It, just like a kid, he says, why not? Worf goes, Federation and Klingons haven't got along. You know, now they're just starting to. So no other Klingons have wanted to join Starfleet. And Alexander says, why? And Worf goes, don't ask so many questions. Uh, if you want to be like, you know. It's stereotypical Klingon. He goes, I don't, by the way, Dad. He doesn't say Dad. He doesn't know it yet. Or does he? Uh, then they go to Mom's room, Kaylor's room. Uh, she sends... She goes, hey, why don't you go in the room and play with your toys? Uh, Mom and Worf got things to talk about. Um, if you hear any snarling, it's the kind... Of, it's the, like, romantic kind... And Worf's all bent out of shape uh, about the kid. Uh, she says, he'll find his own ways. Uh, uh, you know, why are you gonna make, you can't make him be Klingon? He's also, she's half human. And then she goes back to this whole oath thing. She goes, what do you, uh, she goes, like, uh, she goes, you won't even, men- you know, acknowledge that he's your son right now. And he goes, why'd you keep a secret? Because she goes, you're so stubborn. I knew, I know your style. And he goes, well, I'm like a disgraced Klingon, so that's not great. Uh, and she goes, well, what happened with that anyway? And he goes, well, they said my dad was in with the Romulans. And she goes, yeah, I heard that. Uh, 
and that you challenged it. And he goes, yeah, well, I, I pulled my challenge. Uh, and she goes, you don't give up, though. And uh, he goes, so she goes, what really happened? And then they're saved by Riker Bell. Because Riker goes, Kalar, Worf, uh, one, are you two hanging? And uh, two, get to the bridge. Uh, let's see. Worf uh, still covers things up. Yeah. She can't believe it's saved by the Riker Bell. Other ships pull up of Warren and Bar- Borak or something, or the ships. Uh, they say, let's get this over, Picard. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's when uh, Duras calls, and Picard goes, we'll be there about an hour. He goes, what's with this delay? And Picard, you know, owns it. He goes, "It's a time I'm in charge, and it's a time I've chosen. And by the way, I'm in charge, uh, so... And then Doris goes, one hour, don't be late. Uh, and then Picard turns off the TV, he goes, uh, and he goes, Worf's not welcome either on a Klingon ship. And then Picard goes to Kalar, he goes, yeah, we'll, we'll be, he goes, meet me in about an hour to leave. Uh, he goes, we'll be a little late. Uh, yeah, then he pulls uh, Worf aside. He says, geez, I'm aware of your discomfort. Worf goes, permission to speak freely, which he doesn't totally do. He just says, Duras is a punk. Uh, Picard goes, you're making it personal. He goes, no, it's not personal. He's a punk. Uh, And Picard goes, I know that, but I follow the rules. Uh, You can't, uh," he goes, maybe his dad was, you know, he goes, I got to give him a chance. And then Picard goes, by the way, this isn't really about what you think it is. It's, uh. Uh, Kempek uh, Baratheon, uh, and so Worf's is stunned. Then he's kind of stumped, uh, and he goes about Duras. He goes, I know his heart is not Klingon. Uh, then we're on a uh, Kempek ship, and we get to see this interesting ceremony where everybody checks on the, the King Kempek's gone to the big, uh, uh, whatever, uh, uh, bird, bird of WAR in the sky. They talk about the Sonchi ceremony, and Duras is like, uh, let's get going here, man, right of succession. And he goes, you know who's going for it? And Picard goes, yeah, we'll see, we'll follow all the rules. Uh, and the Gowron goes, what do you know of Klingon law, human? And Picard goes, well, I'm going to go back to the Enterprise. And Duras goes, no, now. Uh, then there's like a like a, one of the computers stops working properly, uh, which causes a bit of a thing because it was like uh, someone downloaded something they weren't supposed to. Uh, we will proceed. No fishing it here. Poof. Uh, when the computer goes, uh, I don't know, not finishing it here. And then the computer goes poof. Uh, then we go back to war. If he shows up at a Kalar's room. He goes, I'm here on my duty as head of security checking on you. And she goes, oh, just your official concern? He goes, you know my feelings. And she goes, why don't you, uh, you know, to fill me in? And she goes, geez, I wanted to tell you about, you know, but I wasn't ready. And uh, she goes, well, you said you'd never be complete without me. But she goes, she goes I realized, uh, it took me some time to realize I needed you too. So Worf has a little heartache. I didn't even realize that. She goes, you're a part of me, Worf. Uh, and uh, they, let's see, you're a part of me, Worf. Uh, and then, you know, they kind of share a moment. Uh, and then she says, if you can't be his father, at least be his friend, which I really liked that line. Uh, but, I mean, mostly they talk about, well, what, what about him? Is he going to, you got to keep you away from my dishonor. Uh, then we're in the ready room, and, uh, oh, this is really good. Picard's, like, always, uh, this is a really good scene with Kalar and Picard. I really like uh, how she uses her body language. Um, like, she's just so chill, but she really uses the space. Um, I like how Kling- the, any actor playing a Klingon, whoever was, like, coaching, like, directing them or coaching them or just naturally, like, uh, I don't know if you pay attention. At least, uh, maybe I just enjoy, maybe I'm projecting. Uh, be his friend, meeting with Picard. See, she's so chill. Oh, this modern right. He can because so Picard's figuring out any angle he can do to buy time. I mean, really, Jean Luc. Uh, 
he goes, well, what about modern, right? He goes, what about an old school, right? And she goes, oh, gosh, gosh, darn, it's like so long and dull and boring. And Picard goes, long, dull, and boring, huh? Uh, I, like, I like that. I said, well, Jean-Luc, uh, you could listen to me. I mean, for buying time, he says, Scoots, not for sleeping. She goes, yeah, you're in charge, so you could use the old boring way if you want. Uh, and then she goes, permission to speak freely. Uh, what's going on with Worf's discommendation? You were with him. And Picard goes, can't talk about it, bye. Uh, then they roll into the meeting room. Jaduk is up. Oh, Picard says, yeah, we're going to use the old school Jaduk uh, or Jaduk uh, thing. They say, well, that's obsolete. Uh, and uh, Picard sits down and pulls his shirt uh, while they have reaction shots. Uh, yeah, because he goes, that's the way it is going to be. Uh, uh, long and boring. You got to make your case. Uh, and Kalar's there with him. They say, it's going to take hours. And she goes, it could take days, you know, if, uh, depending on how cooperative you are. Uh, then we have uh, Jaduk, oh, Alexander and uh, Worf in his room. And Worf's showing him his flatware collection of all things. Uh, and he says, no, 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 no. Part of your, oh, he goes, when you, he goes, when you use, he goes, when you use these flatware, uh, consider a part of your hand or your arm. Uh, he goes, not just a, a tool you're using. Because Worf's big into that. It's just one of his many secrets. Uh, and then, let's see. It was, it was just an interesting father-son moment, you know. I will speak to you with you alone. Why? What happens? Oh, oh Kalar and... Uh, I think this is Kalar and Gowron. He goes, what's going to take so long? Uh, and she goes, what card's taking so long? He goes, yeah, but you're his advisor. Quick, pick up the pace. Uh, you could get a good job in the high council or something, not just be an ambassador, which is like, at least in the U.S., what everybody wants to do. Few rewards with a little glory. Don't you want some glory? Like a head on the head council? She goes, you talk like a Ferengi. Just wait and see how it goes. Uh, and he goes, Kalar talked like that. And she goes, Kalar, or Kempak talked like that. And she goes, uh, Kempak was old and weak. I am not, uh, which I really loved. Uh, then we have Jordy, Data, and Riker working on it. Uh, and they make this Romulan connection. Uh, impossible. Wait, where's this? Uh, pick up the pace in the Empire. I am not. Uh, laugh. Uh, walk off. Uh, a molecular K. They say the computer meltdown was from a molecular kick decay thing. The only ones that use that are Romulans. That's a disk drive. Uh, then there's an ad with Picard and Worf, uh, Kalo, the whole crew. Uh, what does it already say? Picard's like WTF impossible. How could the Romulans mess up a computer? And Jordy says with Klingons and Romulans together, uh, but they don't get along. And they say, well, is it Duras or Gowron that's trying to make a new alliance? Uh, and Data says it, it could be a fundamental shift in the power. And Picard goes, yeah, let's put us a federation in a do tough position. And then Riker says, well, who is it, Duras or Gowron? And Kalar says, well, Gowron, you know, offered me a seat on the council. Rikard says, well, that's not too suspect then. And she goes, they say, okay. And then Worf says, it's Duras. Come on. Uh, it's the most obvious thing. The person I like the least. And Kalar goes, what do you mean you like him the least? And Picard goes, well, we dealt with him. He's not trustworthy. And she says, can you be more specific? And they say, uh, No. Uh, but we got a conspiracy, holy moly, you know, since the Winter Soldier, I haven't seen anything like this. And Vicar goes, Worf, you're coming to the next meeting to even, sh you know, poker style, shake it up. Uh, and he goes, they're not going to be happy. It'll be disruptive. Picard goes, darn tootin'. Uh, let's see, darn tootin', bad for Federation. Must be Duras, more specific. Uh, 
Rascal Renvial. Yes, it will. Oh, oh, just so, uh, yeah, this is in uh, Kalar's room. She goes, can you go load up some personal records? Uh, and they go, yeah, no, uh, you can't read people's personal logs, uh, restricted. She goes, okay, give me the rest of the uh, reports then during the last visit to the Klingon Empire. The handwriting looks like Pascal or Rascal Resvial Research. Uh, one of the, she's like, I'll go through it one at a time. Another cool ship zoom. Close. Okay. Then they, the meeting is closing the final phase. They say, okay. Like they go one where they come in to the scene at the end of the boring part. They say, okay, the meeting's over. We're going to have, have a recess. Then we'll get into the final phase. Uh, Picard, how's it going? Uh, Oh, he goes, how's that investigation going? It was like, uh, you're figuring out the computer thing. And both uh, Duras and Gowron say, well, you know, it's, it's like uh, something weird. We don't know, uh, but it's something weird. Uh, melted the computer down. And then Worf takes it. He goes, yeah, well, we actually investigated it. He goes, it was a Romulan uh, disk drive that caused a computer problem. And Duras goes, well, I better go back to my ship and check that out. And so Gowron stares down Duras and goes, as will I. I like this Gowron for now. I don't know. I got. Uh, I don't remember the episodes after this I've seen, but I don't remember because I didn't know Gowron this well. Uh, so I guess I don't know him at all. Um, classic Worf, uh, move through. What does that mean? Classic, oh, Worf goes, oh, we're more thorough. Uh, as will I. Seven beacon diplomatic access to Klingon net. Uh, I don't know what seven beacon means, uh, but that's uh, Kalar. And she gets on the Klingon net. She found some more cover-up stuff because Duras sealed all these records and changed them. And she goes, all autobiographic files about Duras. Uh, then we're back at, uh, I guess we're on the Enterprise, because uh, Duras and some uh, lackey are in a room, and he goes, uh, dude, I just got an alert. Kalar's looking into the Klingon central net about you. And he distracts the guard, the, the uh, uh, lackey, which was too easy. Uh, these, you know, these Federation people are way too trusting. Uh, and we have a Duras and Kalar meeting. Uh, she, he goes, you were looking into me, huh? And she goes, yeah, I know everything at this point, more or less. And he goes, uh, Worf's father's the one that's, uh, and she, she goes, come on. Uh, she goes, what happened? Which, why did Worf take the blame for you? And he goes, drop it. And she goes, you, did you sell us out to the um, Romulans or not? Uh, and the scene ends on an ad break. Do not pursue any further. Clearly, she's going to pursue it because she, she's super cool. And then we get an ad break. Beverly's getting to the bottom of the disk drive thing. She goes, they did a dyno scan, and it was somebody from Duras uh, that installed that disk drive. Uh, then we have Alexander Worf and Alexander. He says, "One time, I'll, one day, I'll sell you, show you the holodeck." And they go into Kalar's room, deck eight, room one forty-two. And Duras has her going to the big, uh, you know, the big, the big, uh, big, you know, big, she, 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 she's with King Robert, visiting King Robert Baratheon. And we have this great hand-holding moment uh, with her and Worf and Alexander. Worf channels his inner lion and says, look and remember. Uh, then Worf uh, busts out of the room, uh, goes back to his room, takes off his uh, communicator and grabs his flatware. And then Riker, Picard, and Dr. Crusher are in the room, I think, uh, or maybe they're at Med Bay. And they say, where in the heck is Worf? Uh, and they say he's not on the Enterprise. Uh, he's on the Vorn, Duras. Uh, 
Uh, then we cut to Worf on the, uh, on the Vorn. And Worf rolls up on Duras. First, he gets introduced though, by Duras's people. They say, uh, uh, you have Worf's here. And he goes, well, what is he doing here? And he goes, well, he has the right uh, to, 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 uh, he goes, you know, the thing where you try to, like, everybody tries to cut perfectly, cut, you know, cut a meal for a child, like cut up the kid's meat and stuff so they could eat it. He wants to have a competition with that. And the guy goes, Duras goes, you got no rights. And he, Worf goes, Kalar was my mate. Uh, and everybody, even the background people were like, what? And it's go time. And clearly it's a fast one. Worf and like, uh, Worf's very good, like, at cutting up, uh, I think this was more of a, this was some sort of uh, tougher meat, too, so it took some cutting, and you gotta get those into really small bites, uh, and Data and Riker are headed to the ship to shut this down, because this is in violation of, uh, Starfleet regs. Worf's in total Worf mode, and, uh, I think he says, I'm the only one. Then that is how it shall be. Oh, he said, Duras says, why do you want to compete with me, man? I'm the only one that can clear your name. And he says, uh, yeah, I'm the, uh, yeah, I'm the only one. Uh, so then actually Worf uh, is so fast that Duras says, you know what? Uh, might as well not be a Klingon anymore. And he says, I'm headed. To, I'm going to go visit Bar- Bar- Baratheon. I'm going to teleport away forever. And without clearing Worf's name. And then, oh, they were like one millisecond too late before Duras left, and they could have stopped it, Riker and Data. Like literally a millisecond. They go, Worf. Uh, and then Duras went bye-bye. Ships out. Duras ships out. Uh, Picard. Oh, then we have a just great Picard thinking face. And I also kind of changed my view of uh, how many people watch these episodes. I mean, Picard is just such a, um, I don't know, well-balanced, uh, I mean, not perfect, but close to it. That I said, man, how many people, uh, this is really the first time I said, like, is this whole series like Picard is like a, like almost like a benevolent being, like a, an all nearly, I mean, not all powerful, but all caring, like benevolent, loving being. He said, I could go to that, like, and do, like, say, okay. I mean, I guess it would be more of the teachings of Picard. Yeah, because he's not transcendent. Uh, we'd have to cook that up. I don't know if that's what the next show's about, but uh, I don't think so. Yeah, maybe it, like, tries to, to, to subvert that idea. Okay, so he's stern. He has a thinking face. Then he looks up sternly at Worf. He goes, you've been a great, uh, uh, your service has been great. Uh, Worf goes, so that was Klingon law I was following. And Picard goes, Klingon law, but he goes, so there's, uh, yeah, but uh, this is a starship. Uh, he goes, we've got 13 planets of representatives here, and they all have their own belief systems and values. And I respect those, but we serve Starfleet. Uh, and if those are two things are in conflict, you got to resign. That's just the rules, man. And he goes, do you want to resign? And Worf won't look up. Worf will make eye contact with him. Uh, he goes, no, sir. And Picard looks down. At first, he's like a little sad, but awful. He goes, okay, well, that's good because I don't want to lose you. He goes, we're going to get a reprimand on your permanent record. And he goes, and another thing. He goes, now that Duras is gone, why don't you just tell the truth uh, and air out the lies? Uh, and Worf says, well, every member of Klingon High Council shared in that. Uh, and he goes, well, the day will come when my brother and I convince them to speak the truth. But that today's not that day. And then we get a long, long Picard look. Uh, then we see Alexander. Uh, Worf looks back at his uh, cutlery collection. And uh, he says, Jesus, you're going to go live with my parents at Starbase 73. They're great. And even Scoots would say, whoa, boy, is his parents great. And Alexander's like, why can't I stay here? He goes, well, you want to, you deserve a home, a family that I cannot pr- 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 provide. And he goes, she's a miss, miss her too. 
And uh, Alexander goes, are you my father? And he says, yes, I am your father. And at first they hold hands, and then they do this big-time hug. It is so lovely. And, you know, what a, I mean, what a journey of an episode. And uh, it comes to a close. Uh, so it's a really classic episode, I think. All right, let's, let's look at some stuff that came up in this episode. One was like, how many pro- types of probes are there? I mean, space probes, I mean. And it went over to memoryalpha.fandom.com. Uh, so probe is an automated spacecraft, uh, you know, used for search tasks starships can't handle, collecting information, uh, maybe going places that need to be smaller, uh, places that might be, t- like, uh, weather might not be great, deep space exploration, or remote recording of uh, telemetry or other things. Uh, Let's see, before, uh, when it was the United Earth Probe Agency, before Starfleet, uh, uh, they would send it out. Uh, Some were uh, modified photon torpedo casings. It does look like uh, what we saw. Uh, They might not want to go on, uh, they probably shouldn't land on a planet. Yeah, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, but there was, uh, let's see, there's Class 1 probes, which was featured in uh, uh, five episodes of TNG. Uh, class 2 probes, which were in TNG and uh, uh, Deep Space Nine. Uh, class 3 probe, uh, which was in a TNG episode. A class 4 probe and a Class 5 probe. So it looks like there's like a Class 6, 7, 8, and 9 in a Class A probe. Uh, so, I don't know which one's the most advanced. Maybe they tell us that. Uh, yeah, other cultures have probes as well. Yeah, I mean, I think a class one, I don't know if that's the best or not. Uh, the pictures are really inconclusive. Yeah, but I just, my first question was, you know, had they mentioned other probes? I, I assume so, but, you know, I've been wrong. I've been wrong many times before. Okay, here's your word if you're a student or you just love words. Uh, it sounds like a simple word, but it's not. Stern, S-T-E-R-N. Uh, and it can mean harsh. Uh, what is that? An adjective. Uh, severe in manner or character. Uh, showing or expressing displeasure or disapproval. Uh, firm or unyielding, uncompromising, or difficult to endure. Stern. Yeah, then there's a stern as a noun, a nautical, the rear part of a ship or boat, or the rear part of a section. Uh, I think that's it. I was just wondering uh, if it was related to uh, one another, but uh, I don't know. It, uh, it didn't say that there. Okay, Viridian. Yeah, I think it's Viridian. Yeah, I think this is where the episode started, maybe. I already forgot. It's a primary, it's a Viridian star system, beta quadrant. Uh, it's on a, like, uh, even Spock saw it on a star chart. Uh, is that it? Yeah, that's all that I got over it. Uh, oh, wait, here maybe is more. Oh, no, that's not. So that's just a little bit about that. I may have talked about this movie on the podcast before. Uh, It's a 1980 movie by uh, uh, David Zucker and Jim Abrams. Uh, uh, It came out in 1980. So it was before uh, my time, but I've seen it many times, many, many, many times on TV. And had a lot of celebrities uh, airplane uh, with an exclamation point. And it's a satire. I don't know if it was the first movie. uh, it's a parody of uh, movies that were popular in the late 70s. Uh, so it's kind of based on that. Uh, what was who, who wrote those books to, like, hotel and airport? I, I forgot. Uh, my, not, oh, I, I almost had it. Uh, it has uh, surreal humor, slapstick comedy, lots of puns and gags and obscure mentions. Uh, it made eighty three million. This is in nineteen eighty on a budget of three point five million, and it was a multiple award winner. 
like uh, it's definitely worth checking out. It's definitely aged, so it uh, uh, not all that uh, you know. It's a uh, thing, but uh, so it's uh, Jerry Zucker, uh, Jim Abrams, and David Zucker. Uh, they wrote Airplane. Oh, where they were, they were still performing at the Kentucky Fried Theater, which they founded in 1971. And Craig from uh, Script Notes worked with the Zuckers for a while. That's how I know how to pronounce it, because I would have said Zucker, but he said it's a Zucker. Zucker. It was like Zucker, like Zucker. So, uh, no. So maybe I am saying it wrong. I think it's Zucker, though. But it's a Z-U-C-K-E-R. Because it's not like Zucker. Because you'd say Zucker, Zucker, but I think it's... Uh, but anyway... Uh, but yeah, they were, you know, they had a comedy troupe. They were doing a lot of stuff. Uh, they did commercials. Uh, let's see. To obtain material for the comedy routines, sometimes they watched late night television and reviewed the tapes and watched the com- late night commercials. Uh, and they unintentionally recorded the 1957 film Zero Hour and found it was a perfectly structured classical film. And it became the uh, series. It's like they they said it was the serious version of our film. And so they tried to stay close to the dialogue and plot of that movie because uh, this was a this must have been their first film. Uh, they even thought they would have to negotiate the rights. Oh no! But then they tried to stay within the allowance of parody. Oh, but they did get the rights for twenty five hundred dollars. Uh, the script also contains spoofs of television commercials, uh, but they removed them. Uh, but they were unable to sell it. They knew John Landis, who encouraged them to uh, write a film based on their sketches, which became the Kentucky Fried movie. And that was the first time they said they'd been on a TV set. Uh, uh, we learned that if you really want a movie to come out the way you wanted it to, you had to direct it, though. Uh, so, yeah, and then they cast, like, Lloyd Bridges, uh, Robert Stack, Leslie Nielsen. Uh, and, yeah, it was released. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's a little bit about it. I'll, I'll link to it for a little bit more if you want to read about it. Uh, also, this is that's from Wikipedia. So is this, uh, you got to fight for your right to party. Uh, short, sometimes shortened to fight for your right is a Beastie Boys. It was the fourth single on the album from 1986, Licensed to Ill. Uh, Wikipedia says it's one of their best known songs. They think it once was one of their best known songs. Uh, uh, it was written by Adam Yauch uh, and Tom Cushman, who also appears in the video. And uh, it was supposed to be also a parody of. Uh, Songs like Smoking in the Boys' Room and I Want to Rock, but most people had uh, went over their heads uh, that it was actually goof on the party lifestyle. Uh, the video uh, is very comedic. Uh, and let's see. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, there is a lot of cameos uh, in the video. Uh, Rick Rubin was was even in the video wearing ACDC and Slayer shirts. Let's see. In 2011, Adam wrote a, a surreal comedic short film based on it to make the comic uh, do the 25th anniversary. And there's been a lot of remakes. It was won a lot of rewards. Uh, that's all that's on there about uh, about it on uh, Wikipedia. It also reminds me of the song. Uh, Party for Your Right to Fight from uh, Public Enemy album, It Takes a Nation of Millions to Hold Us Back, which probably is like one of the top of three or four uh, like albums, which used to be a thing, uh, the like biggest impact on my life, and is still like one of the greats. Uh, so if you haven't listened to it, uh, I mean, Party for Your Right to Fight is not the best song on there, but it's it's on there. It's a good one. And I just wanted to read it. It's the second studio album by hip-hop group Public Enemy. It came out in 1988. Uh, they set out to make the hip-hop equivalent of Marvin Gaye's What's Going On with strong social commentary. It was recorded in 87 in New York. 
uh, they intended it to, to make music with a faster tempo than the first album for, for performances. It charted for 47 weeks in the Billboard 200. Is certified platinum. It had over a million copies sold. Uh, critically, it was successful. And uh, like I said, a lot of people consider it one of the greats of all time. Let's see. So their 87 album, Yo Bum Rush's Show, uh, was acclaimed, by, but it wasn't. It didn't hit the charts, uh, which is what you had to do back then. Uh, it only sold 300,000 copies. Yeah, but they toured and they were recording a lot. Uh, and uh, by the time the album even came out, they were already recording Nation of Millions. Uh, and they they, yeah, they set out to do this Marvin Gaye social commentary album. And uh, there's even a, a live track on there, I think, uh, from shows. Oh, maybe two live tracks from London and Philly. Uh, let's see, recording it, uh, bring the noise, don't believe the hype, uh, rebel without a pause, uh, most of them have been the first tracks competed, completed, yeah, but they, like, uh, really, uh, like, uh, got, I mean, this is really deep, uh, even for Wikipedia, so you could really read a lot more about the production, everybody who had a hand in this brilliant album. Uh, a lot of the messaging on it, uh, its release, its legacy, which uh, has a huge, huge legacy. It just, like, uh, socially, it, it's amazing. And just sound-wise, uh, it's amazing. Uh, with, you know, I don't want to start singing, but, but, but yeah, it's one of my, my it really changed my, my life, that and a couple of other uh, things around that time. Or had a great influence on me. Okay, one last thing was like, uh, now you know. And I said, isn't now you know like NBC's uh, PSA thing? And then I said, oh, no, it's G.I. Joe. And, but then G.I. Joe's knowing is half the battle. So then I Googled the NBC one, but it's the more you know, uh, which is the public service announcements broadcast on NBC's channels uh, with educational messages. Uh, uh, they feature, feature personalities from NBC shows and uh, even presidents and uh, news people. Started in 1989. Uh, they before that they had one to grow on was their PSAs from '83 to '89. And on Telemundo, it's uh, El Poder de, de Saber, the power of knowledge. Uh, it was uh, and, and Dr. Rosalind Weinman uh, who developed the campaign and wrote most of the on-air PSAs. This is from Wikipedia. And ran, ran the campaign for 10 years. Uh, Steve Bernstein did the first uh, Comet, Comet Tail Star logo. Uh, they won a Peabody in 1993. Is, they had a lot of guests over the years. Uh, 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 Amy Poehler, Joan Rivers, J Jack McBriar, Steve Harvey, Angelica Houston, Questlove, Jimmy Fallon, uh, a lot of our past presidents, uh, first ladies. Uh, it's also been widely parodied on TV shows. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of TV shows in here. And let's see, what else? Is CBS is CBS Cares, it says in here. So it's just a little bit about it. I don't know. It made me think of it. Uh, so that's it. That's a little bit uh, about uh, what came up in this episode. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll see you soon. Here's some thanks and good nights. All right, everybody. We're back with uh, Star Trek The Next Generation coverage. It's been a while, uh, or more than a while, from, from your recording. And we're covering uh, Star Trek The Next Generation Season 1, Episode 25, I believe, uh, The Neutral Zone. And this is one uh, Max from Cards recommended, and I've seen it before. I watched it a few more times, then I did my notes. It opens with uh, First Officer's Log, not so not uh, so Riker's Log, uh, 419-86.0. Uh, we see we have a beardless Riker, 04030. I don't know what that stands for. I know they're going to Starbase uh, 718-04030. I don't know what that is. Uh, 
there might be notes about something else or something. We see an ancient capsule. They see an ancient, ancient, ancient camp capsule. It could be headed towards Kazesis a binary system. Yeah, but somebody says, I think not Riker. Oh, he says it's a piece of space junk. Uh, oh, because Worf says, you want me to send it into Kazesis binary system? Or, or uh, adjust its heading so it doesn't get uh, destroyed. Uh, and Riker says, I think that's no, space garbage. Also, have a note here to look up about stuff about Worf in season one. The data standing very straight. I had a couple of data questions. I didn't have a chance to research on this. I mean, presumably he has actually excellent posture. Uh, do I need to readjust or weld? Request permission to uh, investigate. Uh, so you say, leave it be, then they break it. Because Captain Picard's off on a mission. Uh, he's going to be back in several hours. Data says, request permission to investigate this ancient vehicle. And Riker says, it's a derelict. Uh, why you want to know? And he, uh, Data says, history. This is history, yo. What, we're, we're, I'm curious about it. We got out of the time, don't we? And Riker says, you better be back before the captain gets back. And then he goes, Worf, keep an eye on him. And they say, aye, sir. And then we see a shot of the capsule. Oh, that was what the capsule has 04, 03, and 02 on it. That was those numbers I said earlier. Because we see a shot of the capsule. They energize in. There could have been a dot matrix printer on the left side of the where they energize in. Solar Geminar. Oh, solar generator. Worf glares when he looks at the computer. He did research kind of computers at the time of when this episode came out, which was 1987. Uh, So we'll talk about that later. Uh, There's a clanging that gets Worf's attention. Uh, Then he says, he tries to open the door. He says, it must be the seal stuck or something. Uh, I don't know if data was showing how strong he was or that you just use the the handle because he opens the door without a problem. I put what question mark. Uh, it's a bit like the video game fall to the outs. Uh, and there's frost on the glass. There's capsules where you do a long sleep. Uh, acoustic paneling inside. I said, that's nice. Uh, like sound absorption panels. Uh, we get some Disney music and bells as they look in the different ones. Uh, O2 is running, running close to empty, I think. That's what my handwriting says. Uh, then uh, uh, Worf says, Commander, look at this. And then there's like a Dis- Disney theme park music uh, on the Discovery. And then the, there's the episode, o- the episode opens, the neutral zone. And they found three people. There's some mystery music. They're sleeping right now. Data's talking extremely loud. Like he's doing, like, it caught my attention. He's doing loud talking, just him and Worf. And uh, I said, well, somebody, maybe maybe Data has to go in for a hearing test. Uh, Refrigeration, something Geordi, shuttle's coming. They say, the captain, uh uh-oh, oh, no, everybody get back, Uh, Data. I don't know what this says. This is my handwriting. I'm not trying to be funny. We got some poop circles. Do it quick. So let me look through here. Yeah, let's see. They find... Uh, oh, yeah, they're on extended journey. Uh, what, what, are, what are they... Why are they here? These are just for refrigeration only. Uh, captain's shuttle's approaching. Number one, I want to get underway. We'll make the data get back here. Unusual situation. Uh, we got three peeps, uh, and we need to bring them back. Data or Gregor says, "You're going to bring them back here." And Data says, "Yeah, we got to uh, do it quick." Uh, I don't know. But we got some poop circles. That's really what my handwriting says. It has nothing to do with anything. It's probably something else, uh, but I don't have no. Oh, poop, peep, people. Oh, that's what it was. It was a joke. Uh, wasn't as funny as what I thought it was. Uh, peeps, peepsicles, uh, that's what I, the joke I wrote, that I couldn't read my handwriting. We got some three peepsicles. Uh, do it quick, Captain on the bridge. Uh, Picard starts, he says, give us, before, uh, 
80058173. Got it. Uh, and then he says, number one, we got to have a staff meeting. And Jordy kind of questions. He goes, he goes, that's the neutral zone, boss. Uh, he goes, yeah, no dumb. I'm in charge. Uh, he goes, uh, warp factor eight. I, sir, warp factor eight. Engage. Uh, all business, that's what I said. That is correct. Uh, he says, save it for a staff meeting. What are you doing talking in front of the people that, uh, come on. Card stands during the staff meeting, his arms like hugging the chair. He says, yeah, we got an assignment here. We're missing some outposts. Can't find them. No communication. Uh, and they say Romulans. Uh, and they say, yeah, that's it. There haven't been any talks since the Tomid incident. Uh, that was 50 years ago. We haven't heard anything from a Romulan. And Rick says, well, remember, every, this is all rumor or conjecture. Send on ship. Uh, Oh, the strategic, uh, whatever that Starfleet or whatever says, they're going to send one ship to Enterprise. Uh, and they say it's a gamble. Uh, send us out your first encounter. It could be a setup. Uh, uh, Riker says, let's assume that. And Picard says, uh, well, we're not going to, we're not really there to use force. We're there to establish relations. Uh, so if we use force, we failed. And if we can't establish relations, we have to convince them of our resolve. Uh, it, it looks like they're the ones seeking trouble, and we don't want to give them that. We want to really know what they really want. We want to get to the bottom of this. Uh, give me a full profile. Uh, 19 hours and 20 minutes will be there. Okay, let's have a meeting in six hours. Stay sharp. Uh, Qualcomm, no ball shard. I don't know what that means. Oh, he says, any questions? No one has any. Uh, so then, I'll start. Card to Crusher. Uh, oh, Card goes to see Crusher. She, she, he says, so what is it, Doctor? She goes, it's the people from the capsule. He goes, capsule people? WTF? Uh, she goes, we thawed them out, the peepsicles. Uh, he goes, I don't even know what you're talking about. D data. Uh, she goes, I didn't know what to do. They're all sleeping. Uh, they had some minor stuff we fixed on all of them. Uh, now back of them, tart, tart, frozen after, WTF. Uh, yeah, it made me wonder, what's the lifespan, current lifespan on uh, Next Generation? They said, oh, people used to worry about the big farm back then. Uh, now, you know, that's one of the silly things those 20th, 21st century people did, 20th century. And I guess it worked. Uh, data, get up here. He goes, look, I'm never critical of people being curious, uh, but they were already at the big farm. Uh, data said, it seemed like the proper thing to do. He goes, we'll have to treat them like they're humans. Uh, and he calls Worf in. Repeat to their no choice uh, wake up builder. Let's see. So they say, okay, well, oh, before you wake them up, get uh, Wharf up here. They're going to be awake soon. We got no other choice. So then Beverly wakes one of them up. Uh, she kind of, the woman who wakes up, she's kind of smiling, like with a kind of dopey look on her face. You know, like she just woke up from a big sleep. Uh, she kind of smiles at a couple people until she sees Worf. Then she falls back asleep, and there's comedy music. Uh, and they say, welcome to the 24th century. And then there's more discs and more comedy. I think Data says, I checked the discs. Uh, uh, this, oh, uh, oh, about different things. You, you watch it. Uh, one of the other, per uh, let's see, so that was... Uh, um, Claire, Claire Raymond. Then you have Ralph Offenhouse, uh, Lisk Fine, uh, Lisk Fine. I don't know what that means. 55, maybe that was it. A rich dude. And then LQ Sonny, Sonny Clemens, uh, he doesn't even have a file. Some, he's a musician or something. And also he's in the club Scoots is in, uh, Too Afraid to Live, uh, too scared to not, you know, uh, why? 
Oh, why, this is a question. I mean, it, it, it's answered, actually. At the time, I asked, why isn't Troy up there? Uh, he calls in number one. He goes, number one, you got to deal with this stuff. Uh, he's so irritated. But Cardi uh, pulls his shirt down. He says, keep them out of my way. Then Picard explains, they are in blue, one, two, three, six, four. Data looks over his shell as a, what is that? Let me see what happens. So, you keep him out of my way. Riker's trying to explain everything to the people. And they're all dressed in blue. Okay, that's what that blue thing says. Uh, I don't know what one, two, three, six, four means. Uh, 2364, that must be the year. In their terms, uh, Data looks over his shell at a, what is that? Uh, it, we're on the vessel. Oh, they say, what is this, a U.S. ship? They say, no, no, United Federations of Planets. Earth's a member of that. Oh, yeah, 2364. You're all in excellent health. Uh, worked. What are you? Android, is that a robot? No, there's differences between those two. Uh, what about a uh, wharf they talk about? That would be a little bit more. Uh, they say, is this some sort of a hallucination? No, 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 this is real. Uh, I love it when Data says, who are you? One of the do oh, let's see, I got ahead of myself. Klingon, 370 years ago, this was a long shot. Who are I love it. Data says, who are I loved that moment. That's probably one of the high moments of the thing. And uh, let's see, they talk, I don't know, there's a lot of exposition, pride, thorns, uh, shade. Uh, so uh, Claire throws some shade on her husband, Donald. Uh, Ralph humble brags. Uh, they say this whole thing you got, well, you, this was a fad after the, you know, the popularity of the game falling out. Uh, he says, I got to make a phone call, read the Wall Street Journal. They say, what are you talking about, dude? Take it slowly. Then we cut to Troy. The reason why Troy wasn't there is because she's busy researching the Romulans and uh, covering that with the, the card. Oh, Data says, hooey, hogwash, malarkey, jive, an intentional fabrication. Uh, so let's see, Troy says there's a little, very little on the Romulans. Uh, extremes uh, you know can be nice and then not nice related to the Vulcans but different very curious belief beyond superiority beyond arrogance uh, fascinated with humans uh, uh, but they don't initiate anything so you have to commit yourself uh, Ricard goes oof good to know counter okay uh, counter measures uh, data shows uh how to use the food, uh, whatever that thing's called. Uh, he's teaching Sonny how to use the food thing. Uh, he, he said he gets a uh, drink, and I said, is that a real drink or a fake drink? Uh, then there's twang music. Uh, cut on the TV, he says. Uh, something delusion, sir? Stopped in 2040, TV did. That's not good for us. Uh, it's not that long off. And they say boring. This is like modern kids without the internet. You kind of Riker laughs. Uh, they say I got to get to the bridge. The dude, the rich dude, says, "With whom?" He even uses proper. With whom are you speaking? Because uh, the card calls in on the speaker, and he goes, "The captain." The guy goes, "Well, I'm rich, man. I'm I'm used to like talking to captains. Uh, you ever heard of Captain Stubing? Right." Uh, and they go, is that the one from that show? He goes, I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, but they say, yeah, let's get the boss in here. And then the the, uh, the sunny guy, he says, Data, we got to hang later. Like, he's using, like, uh, he's using all sorts of slang, which Data likes. Uh, captain, good. All up to the captain. Oh, the guy, rich guy says, I got to call Geneva. And Riker says, I'll pass it along. Data and Riker walk in the hallway, talk. They throw some shade on the 21st century. They say, if this was the best, these are the people in the 21st century, I don't need to get over there. Unusual humans. Uh, yeah, then they check in, we're back in the ready room. Uh, Picard says, I want a report. 
They're six hours out in the neutral zone. Uh, six hours away. No nine outposts. I don't know what that says. Uh, can't get a hold of anybody. Any of the oh, any of the nine outposts. Uh, they're all gone. Uh, we have to uh, consider information we have about the Romulans is out of date. Data says. Uh, they say, okay, well, uh, what what are they? Is uh, are the Romulans trying to start something? The Enterprise, the regard says, well, no, with the Federation, but you know they're, they're sending the best, of course. That's us, uh, Riker. Grab, you know, pulls up his pallet or whatever. What do you call those things? His lapels. Regard says, what do you recommend? He goes, no, nah, I think we should assume the initiative. Worf says, I agree with Riker. This is it. We got to seize the day. Carpe diem. Regard says, data. And Data says, well, that's based on one premise, uh, the intent of the Romulans. If the premise is sound, the proposal is. And I thought Sherlock Holmes would have liked that. Uh, maybe. Uh, let's see. Little Forge says, but if their, their intent isn't, you know, trouble, then what is it? Uh, then the rich dude just calls on the speaker. Captain Picard, uh, Ralph Offenhouse here. And Picard's not happy. Ralph calls, I said. Uh, talks about the QE2. The lie when, when Picard rolls in. Picard rolls in on him. He goes, excellent. I've been waiting to talk to you. Oh, first Picard says, number one, did you give him permission to contact? I said, don't you guys have pin numbers on this thing? Or like touch ID or face ID? So Picard goes, uh, uh, first, oh, the first he's still talking back and forth to talk about the QE2. He goes, this isn't a cruise ship. Uh, and he demands a phone or radio. Uh, he goes, I uh, got to make contact with my firm. And Picard goes, those things are for official ship business. Uh, and the guy goes, well, how come you don't need a pin number? Like Scoot said, they said, uh, people will exercise self-discipline here. Except for you. He goes, we've got a lot going on. Not just you three. We're dealing with something. Uh, and he goes, I don't care, man. This is the ego talking. And he goes, I'm cognizant of where I am and when. It's simply, I'm, you know, I, I'm not like a... He goes, I'm upper class. You're working class, military. And Ricard is kind of dealing with this nonsense. He goes, a lot has changed. He goes, people aren't obsessed with accumulation of things. No hunger. No need for, for, for possessions. We've grown out of our infancy, you infant. Uh, and the guy goes, it's not about possessions. It's about uh, control. And Ricard goes, control's an illusion. And I couldn't tell if this was like a parallel conversation for the Romulans, because uh, I'm not like uh, my intellect isn't on that level, but I think it might be. Other than, oh, I said, other than kids being on the ship, this must be like Picard's, like, uh, worst day as far as, like, why do I got to deal with this? Uh, and then he says, Troy, you got to come up here and help these people adjust, uh, get these people under control. We cannot continue to afford their distractions. Uh, Captain Scenic Station 5. Uh, let me see. They must have been coming up uh, or something. And then Troy talks to Claire for a little while uh, in the hall. Oh, this is when he runs into Troy. Uh, Then Troy talks to the the country dude, Wade. I don't know who Wade is. I don't think there is any Wade. But she kind of tries to calm everybody down. Oh, no, that's not Troy. That's, uh, uh, oh, the guy wants, yeah, he's trying to get some, uh, Rx from uh, Crusher, Sonny. Uh, grading palm jam on music, Mom. Painting behind them with red craters. Oh, when Troy's talking to Claire, there's a cool painting behind her with red craters. LQ, big wand, birch marble. Oh, in his room, there's a big bur- 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 marble sta- sculpture. Oh, because he gets data sent to his room. Uh, and Dave goes, hey, what's up? He goes, I want to have a party. Suds and sounds. Uh, 
And he goes, you're doing good. He goes, yeah, I like to party, man. It's just the same dance, different tune. I need a guitar. And Dave goes, I could replicate one. And he goes, okay, get get it to me, man. You sack it to me. And they say, Dave, we're near the neutral zone, by the way. Dave goes, I got to get out of here. The guy goes, what's the neutral zone? He goes, I didn't know if this was actually, he goes, a buffer between the Romulan Empire and the Federation. I liked how it was just tucked in there. because is that not, he goes, are you going to have Romulans at this party? He goes, no, that wouldn't be appropriate. Uh, something to do. Same dance, different tune. Neutral zone. No Romulans at the party. There's some music. Uh, Captain's log supplemental with the neutral zone. There's no bases. We can can't find a trace of them at all. Period, which is weird. Uh, and we show the crew talking about it. Couldn't have been any technology we know about. Uh, some great force uh, with ins- inf- insufficient information. Uh, to figure out, could it be natural or something? Uh, you say, let's go to the next station. Uh, then the old rich guy is there, which was weird. I mean, in a way the episode pays off. Uh, he's buzzing around. Uh, mind your own business. Uh, oh, that's he's with the uh, LQ or whatever. And LQ says, mind your own business, because he's like talking trash about the ship and everything. He goes, I'm an expert at negotiations. He goes, they're just trying to do their jobs. We don't need them swimming in our soup, uh, NYOB. And he goes, I'm not letting my fate be decided by others. Uh, I got to go, what's going on? Uh, grabs guitar, pattern replicator. Uh, the rich guy storms out. Terret 9, in conduit, identical. Uh, conditions identical. Uh, everything's out. Uh, Riker wants to go to red alert. Uh, he says, well, it's a little bit more defensive than, uh, I think, I don't know. I don't want to send the wrong message. Uh, and war says, yeah, let's go to red alert. He goes, well, uh, no rash actions. He says, uh, we still have three other stops. Uh, let's proceed in a calm and orderly manner. Riker says, well, how about yellow alert? He goes, that would be prudent. Make it so. Yeah, the rich dude, Ralph's walking around. He figures out how to use the lifts, lift, uh, voice activation. And uh, let's see. Worf, you can't get we shoulder up Riker, Captain. Wait. Uh, let's see. He goes up, uh, Worf says, there's something coming, large and moving, can't get a view, shields up. uh, Riker wants to boot up. He says, let's wait, let's let them, we don't want them to read our intent, uh, then they'll take a similar posture. Riker says, we got sufficient evidence, uh, so does Worf. uh, Here it goes, no, then they say, well, it's weakening, they're gone. uh, and uh, we lost him. Picard says D double A to the M N, uh, and he goes where he goes where are they? And then he goes uh, they go they must have worked on their cloaking. But Picard goes yeah they, they wanted to see our intent. Uh, and then Ralph's there. He says who in the heck? Why do we you know? And they see, R- Riker goes get him off the bridge. He goes no. He, he, like he literally there's like two security people. He says no. Oh, shields up. That's what I couldn't read. Do sneaks on board. Ne- negative, uh, Jordy. What does that mean? Because uh, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, then the ship comes in. The Romulan ship materializes. Uh, they can't believe they're seeing it. Uh, and uh, because it's, it's stay calm, open hailing frequencies. Uh, Got our answer. Dude, who are they? Too often can't get him off the bridge. Oh, two officers can't get that dude off the bridge. Uh, Captain, they're back. Uh, a green, the green colored ship comes in. They take a, goes to a commercial break. Uh, amazing. Never thought I'd be this close. And they hail. And then he says, it's John Luc Picard. Uh, and Picard says, they say they're armed. He goes, yeah, but they haven't done anything. Picard knows they're not going to take the initiative, I guess. Uh, 
And one dude says, I'm a commander Tabak. Uh, Picard goes, what are you doing on the side of neutral zone? This is Federation tur- turf. Uh, and other dude says, uh, or the other Romulan says, it was necessary. Picard goes, it could be aggression. And they go, if we were aggression, you'd know it. Uh, and they want to do stuff for the right reason. We're here because our outposts are missing too. And missing in the same way yours are. Morph says, well, what gives you the right uh, to come this far? And they say, silence your dog. Uh, Guard goes, answer the question. And they go, well, what are you asking us questions for? And they go, well, do you think we did it? And they go, no, too technologically advanced. Uh, Guard goes, who's responsible? They, they, and Ralph, uh, they don't know why they give him this role. He says, they don't know. They're hoping you know, but they're too arrogant to ask. Uh, and Riker goes, you're out of line, mister. But Picard goes, he's right, unfortunately. And they go, we don't know. Uh, why are all these outposts missing? Picard goes, how about in a proposal? And they say, an alliance? No way. And he goes, nothing so grandiose, just cooperation. We'll just share info about this. Uh, and they go, okay. And this one issue sounds good, only if it's convenient. And then they say, Picard, you're you're a thoughtful man. I'll tell you that. Uh, we've had more matters, more urgent, uh, and we shouldn't have been dropped our guard down. Federation expanded. Our outposts vanished. Uh, we've been negligent, but no more. We're back. Uh, and uh, they say, we don't let, you know, they're still kind of saying, and then the Picard goes, get this old rich guy off my bridge. Uh, so pretty good, a really good scene. 390, 3915. Uh, there's a good look. Uh, uh, so Riker and Picard look. Uh, then you get the dude off my bridge. And Troy, like, has, like, uh, uh, one of those, like, g- genealogy sites up. Uh, for Claire, she finds, like, her great, 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 Wait, great, 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 great grandson named it Donald too, like her husband. Uh, maybe they could have find you know find each other. Uh, then Picard has a proposal. Uh, he he says you can't stay on the Enterprise, uh, but we're going to end up with the Charleston. They're heading to Earth. They'll drop you off. Uh, and the rich guy says, "What about I don't have any? I don't have any rich stuff. How am I going to?" He goes. Uh, Material needs no longer exist. And this is like the end of the season, remember? So he says, well, what's the challenge then? And Picard says, the challenge, Mr. Offenhaus, is to improve yourself, to enrich yourself, and to enjoy it. Uh, and then the country guy goes, no one's going to remember all my antics. Uh, and he goes, what if you say, I mean, this would be great fan fiction. Because he says, Data, why don't you come with me be my side man? Data says that does offer, does that offer does present a, s- a certain fascination. Uh, then our bridge, Jordy says, well, we could uh, take him to our loft nine to be faster, uh, because Charleston's going to be there for a while. Oh no, Starbase thirty nine Sierra in five days. It saved them months. Uh, Kirk goes, they need the extended time. They're not ready for Earth. Uh, and Rick goes, pretty we can't take the pity we can't take them ourselves. It's like having a visit from the past. Uh, and Picard says that would take us in the wrong direction. Our mission is to go forward, and it's just begun. Set velocity warp six, Mister LaForge. And Jordy says, I sir, warp six. He goes, there's still much to do, still so much to learn, Mister Forge, Mister LaForge. Excuse me, engage. And there was kind of like some music like Superman. And I didn't know how long the season break was for. Or if they were, already knew they had a second season. But a really strong ending. And, uh, yeah, that's how the episode ends. Now, a few things that came up. One was Riker's beard. I, I found two things. I didn't realize it was uh, on the uh, Urban Dictionary. So over at UrbanDictionary.com, there's Riker's beard, a euphemism for a moment in time, typically in pop culture, when something that was lackluster or underachieving surprisingly became much better and exciting, uh, which, like, uh, thought that Riker's beard coincided with the show hitting a real good stride. 
Also, they say Heather Locklear joining Melrose Place was that show's Riker's Beard moment. Uh, all of them are like uh, hard to follow, but uh, yeah, just like it's the opposite, I guess, of uh, Jump the Shark. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Then there's a, a article from SyFy.com, S Y F Y dot com, or an excerpt from an interview. Uh, with uh, Jonathan Frakes about uh, why Roddenberry wanted Riker to have a beard. And let's see. It talks about the Star Trek, the next generation, uh, Blu-rays, the second renaissance of the show, uh, the actors being interviewed. This is uh, uh, by the articles or the interviews, Danny Roth, January 14th, 2013. And because we got to find out this fun fact, the Riker beard, oh, they talk about that uh, thing. But how did it come to be? Uh, Frakes grew the beard during the writer's strike that took place between seasons one and two. Uh, but when Gene Roddenberry felt it should stick around, uh, uh, Gene said, Jonathan, I love the beard. It'll be nautical. We'll shape it. And that way it'll be decorative. Uh, and yeah, I think they have actually a video interview with him. So uh, I'll link to that. They did just want to follow Worf a little bit here. Yeah, let's see. Family history. I just wanted to go storylines, backstory. Uh, Worf was assigned to the USS Enterprise D in 2364. Relief Flight Control and Tactical Officer, Lieutenant Junior Grade. Uh, but the next year, so that would be season two, he became uh, acting chief of security. And then the next year after that, he was transferred to the operations division. And made formal, oh, acting chief of security, then formal chief of security. Uh, so that was just like why he's dressed a little bit differently. Uh, it just caught my eye. Derelict, here's a nice SAT word, probably in the earlier parts. Uh, derelict, D E R E L I C T, it's an adjective. Uh, abandoned by owner or occupant or uh, lacking a sense of duty. Or as a noun, in this case, in this show, something voluntarily abandoned. Or a tract of land left dry by receding water. A derelict. Also, derelict a dialect is a, a, a third base. I don't know if that's, I think it was the first album, maybe. Uh, with Prime Minister Pete Nice. Uh, let's see. I, I, sir. This one I had to look up on Wik- Wikipedia. It's a phrase commonly heard in present day na- naval language, and uh, I, just one. It came, I, I, A, Y, E, came in the English language of the 16th century or early, t- early 17th, meaning yes or so. Uh, it was also used as formal for voting in the House of Commons. Uh, the most common use of aye, aye, sir, in naval, e- meaning a order has been received, understood, and will be carried out immediately. Oh, so it's like an aye, aye, sir. Received, understood, and will. Oh, so it has uh, different than yes, which could just mean civil agreement without an intention to act. Uh, aye, aye, I understand and will comply. Yeah, it's interesting. I was glad we, I'm glad we looked that up. Okay, I pulled a few articles here about timeline of computing in 1987 uh, when the show came out, when this episode, when these episodes first aired, because I was just thinking about the, uh, I don't know, just we used to disk drives and stuff, and I was like, where were we in 87? Uh, so the Mac 2 and the Mac SE were released March 2nd. Uh, and uh, so they probably did have 3.5 inch drives. The IBM at PS slash two was also introduced in April. And yeah, they had the 3.5 inch drives or three and a half inch drives, uh, which could store, could store 1.44 megabits is on a less expensive amount, only 720 K. Uh, Acorn Archimedes in the UK. Uh, let's see what else we had. Uh, some sound cards, uh, compacts started getting VGA. Oh, wow. VGA came out in 1987. Wow. Okay. Uh, 
So that's from Wikipedia. There's also this computerhope.com, computer history in 1987. CompuServe uh, introduced the GIF standard, the GIF standard in 1987. Uh, Texas Instruments developed DLP, which is used in TVs today. I think maybe not anymore, though, in 87. Uh, Woz, Steve Wozniak left Apple February 6, 1987. First South by Southwest, uh, first version of Microsoft Microsoft Excel. Oh, the first ARM processor, Acorn, Acorn Archimedes. Microsoft shares were 100 bucks. Uh, First email from China was sent to Germany, September twentieth. Uh, oh, this was when if you if there's if you ever seen Criminal Live, that it was in nineteen eighty seven with the Max Hedrum thing. Uh, Apple HyperCard, Microsoft Works. Uh, so it's a little bit more. I wanted to look at pricing though. Let's see. So this is PCWorld.com. Uh, Benji Edwards, uh, 25 years of the IBM PS2. There's a little, it's a good little history article. I just wanted to talk on the price, uh, though. The four initial models uh, that came out in April 87 launch were uh, the Model 30, the Model 50, the Model 60, and the Model 80. It ranged dramatically in power and price, and low in the 30. Which was like a PCXT. I think we had a PC Cologne, PCXT Cologne. Oh, yeah, 8086 CPU, 8 megahertz, 640K of RAM, 20 megabyte hard drive, and it costs $2,300, which would be about $4,600 in 2012. Uh, in the high end, the Model 80, it was. Uh, would it, it did cost 11 G's, which is like 22 G's. So, uh, and neither one came with an operating system. You had to buy PC DOS 3.3 for about 120 bucks. So, there's a little bit about computing. There's, I looked up frosted glass. I ended up not looking up the right thing, though, uh, because I was thinking of like frost on glass. Uh, but, um, this, you know, it's always interesting to find out what comes up. So let me see. Frosted glass. What else do we have? The Tomed intro. So, yeah, frosted glass. Let's see. We got frosted glass uh, produced by sand blasting or uh, acid etching of a clear sheet of glass. A pitted surface on one side, rendering the glass uh, translucent by scattering the light and blurring images. This is what you would use in your bathroom, right? Uh, so just an interesting, I don't know, I, I, I looked it up, the Tomit incident. This was this is memory-alpha, fandom.com. Uh, Tomit incident was a confrontation between, oh, I, I hit the wrong button here, uh, the United Federations of Planets and the Romulan Star Empire in 2311, which led to the signing of the Treaty of Algernon which banned the Federation from using cloaking devices in the withdrawal of the Romulan government until 2364. Uh, it might have a, con- a connection to the Beta Quadrant Star Tomid. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, in a couple of uh, books, um, which in that story, it was a staged thing. Yeah, where the Romulan ship, the Tomid, crashed, like, uh, stopped accidentally uh, on a Federation base. Um, and when quantum singularity confi- confinement of uh, Tomid failed, uh, well, it took out 13 Starfleet outposts and the USS Agamem- Agamemnon. And uh, all the bases were, oh, but in reality, all the bases were empty and rigged to emit false life signs. Uh, uh, it sounds like a big cover-up on the Starfleet. Uh, interesting. I don't know. So you could read more about it uh, in one of those two books uh, that are in the link. Another SAT word, conjecture. C-O-N-J-E-C-T-U-R-E, noun. An inference formed without proof or sufficient evidence. We're pretty familiar with that nowadays. Uh, or a conclusion deduced by surmise or guesswork, or 
a proposition as in mathematics before it has been proved or disproved. Uh, it could also mean obsolete uh, conjecture. Also, as a verb, uh, is to arrive at or deduce by guesswork or to make conjectures. Uh, conjecture, don't conjecture me, bruh. Uh, here's what I, here's a couple of pieces of tidbits. I wanted to look up the lifespan. Uh, this is from Memory Alpha dot Wiki two Wiki. Uh, humanoids was known to vary. Comparative lifespans, the swarming moths of going off for uh, Bajorans. I'm just looking up. Hu- I want to know humans and Terrans. The average, okay, here we go. The average human lifespan uh, had greatly increased uh, during the 20th century. 22nd century was 100 years. Still roughly the same during 2250, but was 120. 120 years by mid 24th century. Uh, so, and Leonard McCoy had reached 137 and by 2364. So, it's just my general question when they're talking about the big farm there. Uh, alcohol, like, like, cause, uh, whatever that, Sonny Clemens or whatever wanted some alcohol. Uh, alcohol is a colorless liquid chemical. This is also from memory alpha that fandom.com. Uh, is from uh, due to its uh, emboldening effects called liquid courage. Vulcans don't drink wine and don't drink alcohol. Uh, let's see. In the 24th century, alcohol was often replaced by synthol, which had all the properties of alcohol without the del- del- deleterious effects. Oh, Starfleet replicators could uh, produce real alcohol. Okay, so that was my main question was uh, if that guy was drinking real alcohol. He could have been. But we don't have a total definite yes or no. And then finally, the Queen Elizabeth II came up, uh, so also called the QE2, a floating hotel, retired ocean liner, uh, built for the Cunard Line, uh, was operated as a transatlantic liner and cruise ship from 1969 to 2008. Uh, since April 2018, have been a floating hotel in Dubai. Was designed to provide transatlantic service from her home port of Southampton, UK, to New York. Uh, named after the earlier ship RMS Queen Elizabeth, uh, which was she. This ship uh, served as the uh, flagship from 1969 until it was succeeded by the RMS Queen Mary II in 2004. It was designed in uh, Cunard's uh, offices in Liverpool and Southampton, built in Clyde's Bank, Scotland. She was considered one of the last great transatlantic ocean liners until Queen Mary II entered service. It was also the last oil-fired passenger steam- steamship to cross the Atlantic in scheduled liner service until she was retrofitted with a diesel power plant in 86 to 87. Undertook regular world cruises during 40 years of service. This is all from Wikipedia. Uh, she undertook regular world cruises during 40 years of service, uh, predominantly as a cruise ship. Uh, had no running mate, never ran a year-round transatlantic service. Uh, did continue the tradition of regular scheduled transatlantic service crossings every year. Uh, was never a Royal Mail ship. Uh, Retired in uh, 20, November 27, 2008. Uh, uh, private uh, part of Dubai World, maybe. Uh, let's see. Uh, though it took a while. Uh, let's see. In 57, uh, it was obvious transatlantic ta- travel was becoming dominated by air travel due to low cost and speed. At that time, it was 50-50. And the increase in air, like uh, they had the Boeing 707 and 58, uh, and it was becoming more and more expensive to operate some of these ships. Uh, uh, but despite revenues, they didn't want to get, Cunard did not want to give up its traditional role. Uh, so it decided to uh, replace its uh, aging, aging ships with a new ocean liner, the Q3. Uh, let's see, anything else? Uh, two engine, uh, well, 
is a lot more. I mean, you could link to it and check it out. Uh, really interesting, you know, all this history and stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's it. Uh, welcome back uh, to the crew of the Enterprise. Good to be back with you. Good night. All right, we're back. We're talking about uh, Star Trek uh, episode, season two, episode eight, A Matter of Honor. And uh, you really, I really enjoyed this episode. Uh, I mean, it has like if you like Riker, whole oh boy, is this the uh, episode? Is this a good episode too? Uh, let's see, Riker in charge. That's the first thing I put. Starbase one seven nine or Wes and Data. Wes and Data are working together. Wes is in gray. This is hailing. Uh, then they say, "Hey, we're ready for the transfer." Data has the bridge. I guess Riker rolls out. Let's see. Hailing frequencies open. Oh, yeah. Riker's calling uh, Starbase 179. Ready for your transfer on your mark. Okay. Commander Data, you have the bridge. And then he heads below. And Data's kind of sitting at the helm, uh, chilling. And then we see a planet, red planet, uh, desert-like, uh, clouds or dust. I put steeps or whatever they're called, S-T-E-P-E-S's. We'll look that up later. Data ready. Also, another question we'll research is data left or right-handed or not. Uh, and then uh, four uh, cadets or something come in. Riker gives them greetings. Uh, it put Wes, oh boy, because Wes is, uh, he makes a mistake, like a, mistake he, he assumes uh uh this ensign that he knows him uh, just because he like uh mordak he says what are you doing here and the dude says i'm not mordak man i'm mendon i'm from benzar uh and i mean it, like uh, i guess if we look at it through uh, one perspective, it's like Wes is a young, he, he, like sometimes you have to make these uh, mistakes. It's a little bit culturally insensitive and, uh, uh, you know, her, I mean, yeah, probably uh, like, uh, I don't know. Menden doesn't, uh, he definitely has his own inter- internal issue. Like, uh, and to, to con- continue the thing, I said, he's kind of like, a. What are they like? I looked up there. Well, we'll talk more about it. But I, like, he's a he's a bit blue, a grayish blue character. With uh, I, th- I forgot where they're from. Let me see. I got some. Uh, uh, welcome to the Enterprise uh, Cultural Exchange or the Exchange Program. Everybody follow Crusher for the indoctrination program or something. And I said, what? Uh, he said, oh, actually, the the dude Menden says, oh, no, naturally we look like we're from the same geostructure. Uh, and then Riker says, good to have you here, Ensign. We have briefing and indoctrination. Indo- I don't know why I find indoctrination just doesn't sound uh, like something I'm interested in for the Enterprise. Uh, and then Riker gets a call to br- 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 go to the phaser range. Yeah. Uh, from the boss, uh, from Picard, who I guess was down there the whole time. Oh, also, the the dude is a little bit, uh, at some point, I guess I don't know what, Riker gives a look to O'Brien, who has a laugh. I think that's from Menden. Oh, yeah, he says to Riker, I'm happy to be assigned to the Enterprise. It wasn't just luck. I requested it, and I know I'll be great help. So he's very, um, I don't know, emotionally connected with Menden. It, because certain personality part, parts, you like over enthusiastic. I think that's like, uh, like where you're being over enthusiastic to cover up a little of, uh, you know, FRI, GH, and then but T at the end. Uh, and you say, okay, like maybe I'll overcompensate a little. Maybe that's what Menden's doing, or maybe I'm just projecting a Star Trek characters, which is, you know, one of my hobbies. Okay, what do we got here? Nuber one. I don't even know what that is. Uh, Nuber one. Is that even a word? Is that really a thing? But Picard and uh, Riker down at the phaser range. Uh, kind of worth watching them practice uh, shooting at these lights. Uh, ones that they're on blue and gold. What the heck is Nuber one? That does sound like something they would say. It says O'Brien has a laugh. Nuber one. 
Uh, but they say, okay, well, Picard says, what do you think about these re- re- exchange kids or young adults? Uh, he says, positive. Uh, Menden's eager to please. And uh, Picard goes, that's a Menzite trait. Uh, uh, and, and then Riker, this is a really fun scene, actually. He says, hey, what about uh, an off? He goes, They're saying, we're thinking about somebody from exchanging somebody from the Enterprise. Riker goes, huh, tell me more. And he goes, well, there's a Klingon vessel in the area. Riker goes, I didn't know that any, like, a Starfleet officer served on a current Klingon vessel. It, it's so good. These two are really good together. This is even season two. Picard goes, no, no, neither have I. And Riker goes, it might prove beneficial. It, you know, they're really taught, like, they're they're just like, this is like kind of like a professional flirting talk, or I don't know how to describe it, because it's not quite subtextual, but, because uh, they're talking about what they're talking about, but they're, you know what I mean. And he goes, no, neither have I. It might be beneficial, Riker says. Uh, Picard goes, well, Worf's the best, right? He goes, no doubt, bye. I don't know why I said bye, but, but he says, yeah, for sure. And the record goes, well, who would you send? And Picard goes, hmm, good question. Maybe a volunteer? And this is when you, like, uh, like I don't know if this is a power move or not, but Riker goes, I might be interested, not that. And then Picard misses a target, and he pretends he didn't hear them hear him. And I think Riker laughs. Let's see. Uh, colors. Uh, uh, black, blue and yellow circle, Riker raising an idea, Klingon vessel. Well, I put loving this subtext and talking around it. I might be interested. Darn, uh, Picard says when Riker's talking. And you think Riker laughs there, yeah, because he thought it was a, it, it was a power move. He, goes, he has to repeat himself, uh, which, I don't know, maybe it's just a way of Picard testing, saying, are you serious, uh, and Riker says, in a charming way, he says, I wouldn't mind the assignment, sir. And Ricard goes, why? He goes, no one's ever done it before. Why the heck else? Uh, he goes, you know, you heard of Brand the Brave? And Picard goes, no. And he goes, well, one day you will, dude. Like, forget that other nickname. And Picard goes, what are you even talking about? Riker goes, I don't know, Scoots is putting words in my mouth. Uh, he goes, nobody's ever done it before. And it's like it's already done because Picard says, well, I'll notify Starbase of your acceptance and they'll make arrangements. And so I put nice uh, because no one's ever done it. Nice. And then the the episode opens. Captain's log 42506.5. Departed to Klingon. Roberta Worf. Clear something up. Talk about my captain. Okay, let's see what really really happened. Uh, uh, Worf and Riker in the hallway talking, and he says, uh, Worf goes, yeah, I know a lot about my heritage. Riker goes, yeah, I want to clear something up. He goes, what are the duties of the first officer? Like, uh, goes a debate, there's like a debate, a serious debate club with your captain. He goes, yep, you're supposed to out-debate him if you can. And Riker goes, what? Uh, wouldn't that be like chaos? Uh, and Worf goes, no, no, no. Keeps the captain on uh, the top of the game. And by the way, your second officer is going to try to debate you right out of school. And Rick goes, wow, that must take some getting used to. And Worf goes, it's been working fine for centuries. Uh, Ian, he goes, it is different. And Worf says, many things will be different. So I liked that method of attrition. Uh, Many things will be different. Okay, then the blue, uh, Menden, sorry, I wanted to call him blue guy. Observes a lot. He has, in quotes, helpful comments. He's like walking around with his hands behind the back. Uh, like I said, we'll try to look at him through the lens of empathy. So, but it is a little bit difficult because he's kind of like a explainer and, and like a like he knows all. And he does have this uh, like a journey in this episode. Uh, so he walks around with his hands behind the back. Uh, first off, I put WTF like. Uh, because I don't, I didn't look this up, but it's like like some like exchange dude can just walk around the bridge, like looking at people's stuff. Astute. Somebody says the word astute. Wes is a bit taken aback. He even shakes his head, like, uh, like, are you kidding me? Like uh, with this, uh, 
he gulps too. Oh, it's a, sh- it's not a pleasant shaking of the head. Like it's a fresh, like a, then we have Riker eating Klingon food. And this is the Pulaski season or Pulaski. And she's good in these scenes. Cause she says, she, she's like, uh, representing kind of like the audience. She says, what are you, what are you eating? And, uh, Riker's full bore, uh, snacking on this stuff. Uh, Pippius, uh, Targ, Ga, Pulaski, uh, Pulaski, yeah, she says, uh, Ga, and he goes, oh, yeah, uh, he goes, you want to try anything? She goes, no, 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 and she goes, are you going to be able to eat all this stuff, uh, and he goes, uh, well, I got to be, you know, I need to be full, you know, I got to be able to be, be participate, uh, and she, she goes, okay, well, the, you know, they're same, like, uh, I don't know if they're mammals, but she says, you know, their physiology is similar to ours. So that she tries to give Riker some peace of mind. She also is like, not, she's like a little bit uh, judgmental of their ways of doing things. Uh, Riker says, you want to have something to drink? She goes, no, I'm abstaining because it's your last hour. I'm bored. And they said, abstaining from something that doesn't have any alcohol is interesting. A feast before transfer. I didn't realize this was like a fe- like a thing. Uh, Riker goes, your sacrifice will not go unnoticed. Good job of kissing my uh, side of my beard. Uh, then Picard shows up. He goes, oh, this is the feast before transfer. He goes, I've done it before. But he goes, I'd f- pick something else uh, more palatable. Riker goes, this is the palatable stuff. And then Picard brings it back to the ground. He says, okay, well, we know so little about them. So much to learn. He really great opportunity, and I envy you, uh, Riker. And uh, so that's cool. Uh, I envy you. Riker really does seem to enjoy the food. Riker gives transportation, sentimental, note, efficient, bridge, Klingon vessel approaching. The wharf looks uncomfortable, Klingon. Okay, so let's run through this here. So in the hall, uh, uh, Worf gives Riker a little uh, transponder, uh, just in case, precautionary. And, but he says, no, not precautionary, efficiency commander. And then we're on the bridge, uh, Klingon's approaching, hailing, pa, uh, uh, Picard says on screen, I'm Picard. He goes, I'm Cargan, the captain of the Klingon vessel, Pa. Maybe, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but uh, he goes, get your first officer on board. Uh, Picard goes, by the way, a great, Riker's a great guy. He goes, I don't, like, no thanks. Uh, I'll see myself uh, screen off. Uh, and then Menden goes, to, to all people, Wharf, he goes, not very hospital, uh, hospitable, are they? And Worf is like, dude, get back to work. Uh, he goes, it's not your concern. Observe your station, Ensign Menden. It was like, what? What is this? This dude does need like his journey this episode. They said, Blue Dude, Klingon leans back. Uh, that was on the screen. Then Blue Dude has a comment for everything. Uh, then he does uh, a scan of uh, their thing. Oh, he goes, sorry, I didn't mean it. To offend you, and Worf goes, you didn't. Uh, and then he notices, like, there's uh, something on the hall of the Klingon vessel, but he doesn't say anything. Uh, and then Picard goes, beam Riker over, acknowledged, O'Brien sends him over. Picard goes, Data, you're on the bridge. Um, inconclusive was the scan that, K- that Menden ran. Oh, Brian. Heck no, for me, because maybe he says, are you going to go over there? Oh, yeah, he goes, no way for me. He goes, I'm trying to get a date with, like, in the Arboretum, because uh, maybe he hasn't got that date yet. Uh, and he goes, are you worried? The record goes, no. He goes, well, and the record goes, just get me over there. Uh, let's see. For me, energize. We watch the vessel head off. Uh, Menden stops Picard, uh, which uh, Picard goes, resume course, uh, take over data, I'm going to observe. Uh, and he goes, yeah, he just wanted to introduce myself, I'm Menden. And Picard goes, good, okay. 
He goes, you got a couple ideas to run by here. Uh, I'm really swift on the uptake. In Picard, which is a little bit weird, he goes, and this, he goes, we follow chain of command, which I'm like, wait a second, don't all, I mean, maybe men, uh, Benzites don't follow chain of command. I don't know. He goes, Worf is uh, your point of uh, contact. And he goes, sorry, I just wanted to impress upon you. And Picard goes, no, sorry, uh, we should have explained it better. And then Worf goes, Ensign Menden, you may impress me. Uh, which is like, man, do I love Worf. Uh, no need to apologize. Yeah, he does a hair toss, like a slight hair toss when he says that to me. Very red. I don't know what that means. Riker, oh, the, the inside of the Klingon ship's got like red lights. Uh, Riker has to let them know who's in charge. Uh, so let's see, Riker goes in, oh, the, the, his second in command goes, uh, he's kind of like playing Riker. He goes, uh, he goes, hey, you never seen anybody like you before. He goes, well, I'm average everyday human man who just happens to be your commander. Uh, and he goes, what was your order again? He goes, take you to command and uh, command the captain. He goes, yeah. And Riker goes, let's get to it then. And then Riker gets on there. And we kind of learn, like, he's like, hey, I'm from Starship Enterprise. He goes, not anymore, dude. You're Pa or whatever. You're Riker, first officer of Klingon Pa. He goes, you tend to disobey any Federation orders. Uh, he goes, no. And then Cargan goes, where's your loyalties? And Riker goes, I don't understand. He goes, uh, we, we, he goes we're peaceful, but this is our ship. Uh, he goes, I got to count on everybody. He goes, where are your loyalties? And Riker goes, uh, I've been assigned to serve the ship and obey your orders. I'll do that. Uh, and Cargan goes, uh, are you going to take an oath? And Riker goes, what do you mean oath? I just said I would. Uh, and then Clock starts to debate Riker. In a very 80s action, the 80s uh, like TV shows had these action debates. Uh, so this is like one of these action debates because uh, he says, uh, point of order, uh, and Gargan uh, uh, says, I recognize Lieutenant Clagg's point of order. And Riker goes, you got something to say to me, Clagg? Say it outside of parliamentary procedure. And Clagg says, okay, I don't believe you. And he goes, are you debate? You, do, do you want to debate me? And he goes, correct. Uh, and he goes, do you have a second? And the captain, and the captain goes, I leave it to the band, you know, whatever. And Picard goes, uh, so they have an action debate, and Picard, like, totally out-debates him because he's got the skills of, like, uh, Picard's got, like, alpha empathy and compassion, so he can use both those skills. Uh, and that guy's just younger coming up. He was using all, like, uh, ag aggro debate, which Picard says, well, I agree with you. And he goes, oh, oh. And Picard goes, you know, accept that I'm in charge. And he goes, well, huh, okay. And Picard goes, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I follow Cargan, you follow me. He goes, or do you want to be debated right off the ship? And the guy, Clagg, he goes, I'll, I'll follow you. And then Cargan says, and Riker, you'll follow me. And he says, of course. Let's see if I missed anything. That is correct. I can count on you. Loyalties. Uh, okay, like the commander sat down and watched the debate. Uh, he really enjoyed it. Uh, when it's done, Riker blows out like of an O mouth, like like that. Uh, and then Worf, we're on the uh, Enterprise bridge. Worf says there's an unknown substance on the dorsal section of the engineering. Uh, or Menden finds it on the dorsal section. They magnify it. Uh, it's like rust or something, subatomic rust, we'll say. Uh, but it's doubling in size, like every 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, they see, they go, where is it from? And they go, uh, and Menden goes, it was on the Klingon ship. Uh, and Picard goes, who'd you tell about that? And Menden goes, nobody. Uh, it was working on a report. And Orf goes, you're supposed to report anything that's out of ordinary. And Picard goes, come on, dude. And he goes, uh, but I didn't have a full report. Uh, I couldn't, like, I didn't have all my bases covered. 
And Data goes, how'd you come to that uh, decision? He goes, Benzite regulation, uh, full analysis and resolution is our procedure. And Picard goes, that's not our procedure. He goes, it's uh, in any possibility of rust or anything else you reported. Uh, decision is not yours. Uh, you got it? And then goes, yep. And he goes, okay, get back to work then. Keep figuring it out. And he says, it's going to take a while. And Picard goes, go ahead, take your time. Just get it done. Data supervise. And he goes, aye, sir. And then Picard walks off and Worf goes, and I'm going to teach you some etiquette. Uh, he really says that. Uh, inner probe prioritize. Uh, how did you come to that decision? Something gone wrong. Oh, internship gone wrong. That's what I put. Uh, then there's a break. Uh, Riker's log. Uh, I guess his personal log, right? Yeah, and he goes, yeah, I'm on Pog. Uh, impressed with everybody. They're very single-minded. And they're in the mess hall. Riker's getting and giving looks from everybody. And he's pretending, he, he's like using his experience. Mm, bre, bre, is this Brexit? Uh, Pyrus? Uh, and they go, what about the Roke? Roke? He goes, oh boy, is it good. And they go, what about some guy? He goes, yeah, oh yeah. He goes, huh, I never had it in this fashion, prepared this way before. And they go, do you want something? <laughs> yeah, this is like, like you know, they kind of give Riker a hard time. Uh, and they go, you know, there's no uh, old debaters on Klingon ships. Uh, and Riker goes, I'm sure they debated with honor. And Clay goes, yeah, maybe you'll stick around. Uh, then they talk about Riker's looks. Uh, and I guess, like, uh, dating on the ship is a lot. I guess it's a lot on both ships. So somebody says, well, I'd like to, maybe we could have dinner together. And Riker says, we're having dinner right now. Uh, let's see. But they also say, man, you got a sense of humor. Uh, we didn't think you, 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 you uh, humans had a sense of humor. Because Riker even cracks some jokes that they all, uh, oh, they say, would you say you're a typical Federation officer because you have humor? Uh, and Clegg says, you're not what I expected. Uh, and he goes, oh, I was thinking the same way. Uh, he goes, I never, he goes, Worf, Worf doesn't really laugh. Uh, he goes, so I didn't realize Klingons, and they go, there's much to learn. And Riker goes, that's why I'm here. Uh, and Clyde goes, feel free to ask any questions. And he goes, okay. Uh, or maybe Riker says, oh, yeah. He goes, uh, I don't know. They talk about families, uh, uh, you know, history, Romulans, uh, you know, ups and downs, uh, like, uh, you know, family stuff, like Worf and everybody else. You say, oh, it's family stuff, huh? And Riker goes, yeah, Riker closes it well, he, or the writers do. He says, yesterday. They did not even know how to uh, eat guy. Oh, because they say Klingons don't express the way, feelings the way humans do. Uh, let's see. Our future, a little down about the Romulans and his dad. Yesterday, did not eat guy. Everyone happened. Everyone, I don't know what that is. Uh, uh, but Picard data... And Menden are uh, checking relevant new stuff. Uh, the Klingon, uh, they already have 12 centimeters of rust, uh, which Worf glares. Uh, they say, find them. It's not good that they have a rust hole on their hull. Hull. Then we see Riker uh, walking. Ask for a repeat. Uh, oh, yeah, it's a space rust. Uh, no way. And they see this hole is growing. We only got eight hours. This is on the Klingon ship. Uh, um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, they say, okay, we got eight hours. Okay. They say, what is tactics? What do you think? Because uh, they think that uh, Enterprise planted this rust. Uh, and they say they scanned that area of the ship for two minutes. Uh, it must be a, they did a rust deposit for some reason. Like, uh, basically, this is the only. Uh, other ship we've encountered, uh, Riker goes, it's normal to scan ships, uh, 
And they go, well, why would you use a rust beam? He goes, we don't, we don't use rust beams. We're allies. And the Riker goes, it's not uh, how we work. Uh, and Rikargan says, no, uh, you, you don't rust a Klingon ship. Uh, time for, you know, time to get to, like, uh, and Riker's like, what? Uh, and they go, yeah, we got to do, we got to, we're going to have to rust them first and debate them right out of space. Yeah, it makes no sense, Riker says. Uh, Indeed, uh, then I think there's an ad break on a Riker. They see cloak the ship, and there's a Riker close up. Uh, then there's an Enterprise shot, and then Will uh, tries to help Menden. Uh, he goes up to him, he tries to be nice, uh, and he says, Geez, you just made an error. Uh, and he goes, You can't recover from an error. Uh, that's not how Benzites work. And R- R- Will goes, you know, we've really learned about resiliency on this ship. It's try too. He goes, don't worry, you're resilient. I can see it. He goes, thanks. Uh, but he goes, that's it. Uh, and he goes, I don't know why you're trying to be nice to me. He goes, uh, and he goes, well, people make mistakes. He goes, you didn't put the rust on the ship. Uh, you just saw it, and then you didn't know procedure. And the dude goes, uh, why are you being so nice to me? And Wes goes, because I thought you might need a friend. Uh, and, you know, Menden's kind of like, uh, I guess he has like one of those negative egos that I'm familiar with. He goes, well, it must have really like, uh, you know, have guy all over my face, you know. And Wes says, well, this is what the ex- exchange program is all about, learning uh, and exchanging information and, and then uh you know, like, uh, growing. And he goes, uh, resi- that's kind of part of resiliency. I don't think the dude quite get, gets it. Cause he goes, I'm going to like, he's an all or nothing thinker, which I know. Well, he goes, I'm going to succeed brilliantly and work really hard. Uh, very all or nothing. Will's hands are crossed, but Will's happy. You know, he tried to help. Uh, then they, we see the Klingons. They see Jesus rust is like, uh, Toast, uh, and they go, Riker, go down and look uh, at one of the portholes. Uh, and Riker goes, uh, they, and he says, dude, keep an eye on this guy. Maybe he rusted the ship. And Riker had de- de- debated this dude, Clagg, who says, well, why would he be here f- to rust a ship he's on? And Cargan goes, because he's human. So they're, uh, he goes, uh, I don't know. And Clyde goes, I don't know. He goes, he might be up to something, but uh, he's very brave. Uh, he goes, he goes they don't, they're don't. they not Klingons. They don't think the same way we do. And they say, okay, we see the Enterprise. It's headed towards us. And I guess it's another all or nothing thing. And he goes, Cargan goes, see, told you so, Riker. He goes, Riker comes back. And Riker goes, what do you mean? And he goes, the Enterprise is following us. And why? And the cook, Riker says, well, why don't you ask them? And they go, 15 minutes, we'll be meeting up. And Cargan goes, uh, prepare my debate suits and get the rust, rust, you know, rust the device ready. Um, let's see. Know your rank. Uh, what is that? Bridge data. Keep an eye on him. Second starts. No, no step down. Stare down. Oh, there's a couple stare downs. Intercept course. Riker's back. You almost had me believing. I know what that is, but uh, something like it definitely not. It looks like it was never written in English, even though I'm sure when I wrote it, uh, it looks like if you took trapeze and triangle and combined them into one word with none of those letters. Uh, like or maybe it says T N G P R Z P Z U E. I don't know. Following us, uh, why ask him? Reasons clear. Lots of debating. Bridge data standing. Uh, and they say, well, where's the uh, Klingon vessel? Well, it's cloaked or it's been rusted away. Uh, they may be here to help. Uh, I think that's back on the other one. Uh, this is when they meet up, uh, uh, cause they say, well, what if they're here to help? Uh, and he goes, uh, they're not here to help. Or, uh, don't forget my rank. Uh, right. Cause I'm just trying to help you understand. 
Uh, and Kurgan goes, uh, he goes, I'm captain. You're supposed to obey me, your oath. Uh, and Riker goes, yep, you're right. Uh, he goes, okay, tell me the easiest way to rust out the Enterprise or debate your captain. Riker goes, no. And he goes, well, you have to. He goes, well, I'm not going to tell you the Enterprise secrets. Uh, and he goes, well, then what good is your oath? Uh, what good is Starfleet then? And Riker goes, I can't break a past vow. He goes, those oaths uh, supersede. But he, he's almost debating. He goes, those oaths are prior oaths that supersede my oath with you. And Cargan says, those oaths are in conflict, which Riker says, no, they're not. I'll obey your orders. I'm going to serve on this ship. Uh, and do what must be done. Uh, but it, it, uh, your orders don't supersede my per- previous orders or oaths. And Cargan goes, good, because that was actually a test to see if you were an oath breaker. And now I see you aren't, uh, so you're very, you're in my good graces again. So I don't know if that was the Klingon trying to save, like, uh, like face with the rest of his crew, or he was real, it really was a test. Uh, so also during all this, uh, there's some really good shots. Uh, the second in command is looking on, uh, I forgot his name, Clagg, uh, with a dreamy look. He's watching Riker, uh, uh, and oh, he even gets a, Riker even gets a hug. He goes, you're really a Klingon for the captain says, but the Clagg really has dreamy looks for Riker. Uh, then we see Menden working. On the computer, he seems happy. And let's see. Oh, he goes, yeah, I figured out the rust. Uh, he goes, it's like a titanium uh, thing. And they go, neutrino, a neutrino beam, a tunneling neutrino beam will clear it right out. Uh, and Parker, Parker, Parker goes, great job, uh, do it. Uh, and uh, then he says, Worf, add that to the hailing message. The message is neutrino beam will clean the rust. Uh, then we're back on the PA. They say, okay, they changed. Now they want you to use a neutrino beam. It's rust. Uh, and Riker says, see? And Cargan goes, no, nah, they're not. It's not true. And then it's, but there's still a quote. Uh, then it's like Picard Captain's Log 425 07.8. Uh, we're looking for the Klingon ship. Can't find it. Uh, can't find any debris. Uh, data says that. Uh, and Data says, no debris, they must be here in cloaked. Uh, and Cooper Carr goes, okay. And then Data says, we should probably go to Red Alert. He goes, make it so. Morph goes, I. So then on the Klingon ship, they say, okay, now they're on Red Alert, shields up. Uh, and Riker goes, yeah, that's a procedure when things are strange. Uh, of course, you put your shields up. Yeah, they just de-rusted their ship. Uh, uh, let's see. Assume cloaked agreed. Make it so. Oh, I love it when he says that. Uh, uh, Riker. Okay, so then, let's see. So, back in the ship, uh, they, Cargan goes, well, they're f- fools for putting their their debate shoes on unless they're ready to debate. Uh, and Riker goes, you only get one shot at Captain Picard in a debate, so you better have some opening line. He goes, I only need one. Uh, he goes, prepare my debate, you know, my debate, uh, like a speaker or whatever to launch. And then Riker says, well, it's, he goes, you w- want to be closer so they could hear it and that there's no lag between your speaking. And he goes, so 40,000 kilometers, it'll give them, he goes, it'll also give Captain Card less time to respond. And they go, wow, that's actually smart. Uh, and they say, okay, count down to 40 kilometers, uh, and Riker, you'll call, you'll give the word for the final debate. Uh, and then okay, Riker says, okay, and they go, any questions? He goes, yeah, one thing. He goes, I don't trust your judgment. Uh, he goes, you're ca- causing a confrontation debate when we don't need to. And the guy, Cargan goes, are you finished? And Riker goes, sure. And they go commence, and then they go we're closing, and then Riker pulls out that transponder and turns it on, and the cargan goes, "What is that?" Uh, he goes, "Nothing. <laughs> Just pulled it out of my boot at this opportune time." And cargan goes, "Hand it over, then." 
So then we switch back to Worf. who goes, yeah, the transponder's on. Uh, he goes, uh, he goes, it's the one I gave to Riker. And Picard goes, okay, O'Brien, lock on that. Uh, and O'Brien says, well, we're not quite in range. Uh, and Picard goes, we've got to stretch it. Uh, you know, it's a transponder. And uh, uh, he goes, we got to know what's going on. And he goes, Riker's the only one, so beam him onto the bridge uh, on my command. And O'Brien goes, okay, wait till 40,000. Uh, so then Worf's counting down, transponder room's counting down. And because he got to switch the shields off and beam him on. And then they're at 40,000. Uh, and then on the pod, they're at 40,000. So they're going to drop their cloak and get ready. So everybody's getting ready for this 40,000 moment. And as soon as they get hit, uh, Cargan gets beamed over uh, to the bridge. Uh, we prepare, energize, standing, something fueled flak. I don't know what that means. Uh, and then Riker goes, I'm your captain now. Uh, and then what is this? Oh, Riker has no honor. That's what the dude says when he's on his ship. Or on the bridge of the Enterprise. Uh, and Riker says, uh, yeah, I'm your captain now. I've relieved Cargan. He was acting irrationally. He goes, serve the ship as I have. Uh, and yeah, Cargan throws a fit. I was tricked by Riker. He's not uh, honorable. Uh, and Riker goes, okay, turn off your shields uh, and obey my orders. Uh, and they go, well, what are you doing? He goes, don't worry. I'm on the ship. Uh, he goes, so that's my order. He's cloaking shields off. And I, re- I repeat, cloaking shields off. It's a pa. Uh, he goes, uh, he goes, Cam- Captain William Riker, Captain William Riker of the pa. He goes, so lower his shields and surrender. And Picard goes, shields lowered, surrendered. And Cargan goes, I demand to go back to my ship. Uh, and Picard goes, get him ready to beam back. Uh, and uh, then Brian goes, okay. And then he goes, Riker, we can fix your ship right away. He goes, Riker goes, thank you, Captain Picard. And this one was a little bit more subtle. So let's see, here to assist, lower your shields, uh, lower your shields. Uh, thank you. So then Riker and Cargan are together on the bridge. Uh, and he goes, Cargan goes, you should have just debated me out of space. And Riker goes, I don't want to be in charge. And he goes, well, you tricked me. Riker goes, who cares? You're back in charge. And he goes, get back to work. Uh, and Riker refuses to listen, uh, which uh, means that he gets fired off, the sh- gets kicked off the ship. And then Clagg, who uh, loves Riker, uh, he says, yes, Captain. He goes, he whispers. It was really great. I loved it. He goes, whispers to Riker, you understand Klingons better than I thought, Commander. Riker goes, thank you, my friend. You know, I wonder if they cut out one more scene with Menden. I mean, he did, like, fix the thing. But he doesn't have, like, a like a, like a a full proper conclusion of, like, well, I learned to listen and not be a know-it-all. But Riker and Picard are together and... Uh, he says, well, that was the short assignment and the shortest in the history. Ricard goes, being well away from you, it was like the longest. Well done. And Riker goes, I learned quite a bit. And Picard goes, now nah, how to uh, uh, reformulate an initial debate when you're getting kicked off your ship. And Picard goes, welcome back, number one. Uh, and he goes, Worf, take Riker for a walk. Uh, and then Riker says, geez, that really worked, Worf. And he goes, I'm glad I did. And he says, you come from a brave and unique people, and I'm glad you're with us on the Enterprise. And Worf goes, thank you, and welcome home. And that was the end of the episode. A good, a good episode. And let's see what, what we had to look up here. Uh, a couple of interesting things. Uh, oh, the word hail. Uh, in this situation, let's see, this is from Wiki, 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 the dictionary on Wikipedia. Uh, let's see. Uh, hail is a noun. Uh, balls are pieces of ice. Uh, 
Hail is a verb, uh, to pour down in rapid succession, to send or release hail, or said of the weather when it's falling, or two, which is a variant of hail, H-A-L-E, uh, for health or safety from the 13th century, uh, like in uh, Paradise Lost, uh, is to greet or give a salutation to, to salute, uh, or to name, designate, or call, or to call out loudly to gain the attention of. Uh, uh, there's also an adjective, uh, an exclamation of respectful or reverent salutation, occasionally a familiar greeting. That's where the uh, football term Hail Mary comes from. Uh, so that's a little bit about it. I'll link to it. Uh, but then it brought up, like, okay, what are some of the other. Oh, that's still Wiki Dictionary. <laughs> Wiki Wiki Dictionary. Yeah, but then there's like a, the hail is a form of precipitation, which is distinct from sleet or ice pellets, uh, though they're confused. It's irregular balls or lumps of ice, uh, which is called a hailstone. Uh, ice pellets usually are cold weather. Hail does not usually occur in cold weather. Unlike other forms of water ice, uh, which is made of rime, ice pellets are smaller and translucent. Hailstones usually are between 5 millimeters and 15 centimeters. Uh, uh, they're most possible in thunderstorms like cumulonimbus. Uh, it requires environments of strong upwind, upward motion of air within the storm. Uh, and lowered the heights of, of the freezing level. Uh, in the mid latitudes, hail is in the interior forms in the interior of continents, uh, while in the tropics it gets confined confined to high eleva- uh, elevations. Uh, any sort of storm that does create a hail is a hail storm. Uh, they can be irregular or and clumped together, layered. Uh, Transparent ice or alternating layers of transparent and translucent ice. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit about it. Uh, it's just interesting, uh, you know, especially for kids when you see it. Uh, now, what about step or steep? I don't know how to pronounce the word, I'm being honest. S T E P P E. Let's just say it's a step with a silent rest of it. Uh, in physical geography, it's an eco region. Uh, Grasslands, shrublands, temperate grasslands, savannas, shrub, shrubland biomes. Uh, it's characterized by grassland plains without trees, apart from those near rivers and lakes. Uh, the prairie of North America is an example, though it is not called such. A step may be arid, semi-arid or covered with grass, shrubs, or both, depending on season or latitude. Uh, the term is used to denote the climate encountered in regions too dry to support a forest, but not dry enough to be a, a desert. Uh, there's usually uh, characterized by semi-arid or continental climate. It, it can go like uh, from warm in the summer to cold in the winter. Uh, besides the difference between summer and winter, the differences between day and night can be very great. Uh, there's the highlands of Mongolia and northern and northern Nevada, which can really uh, exemplify those extremes. This is all from Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, especially the mid latitude ones. Uh, there's two types. There's a temperate or true step, uh, which is in the continental areas of the world. Uh, Further subdivided, like the Rocky Mountain ones, and then there's the subtropical ones uh, with a Mediterranean-like climate. Uh, there's subtypes including shrub step and alpine step. Uh, the Eurasian Eurasian uh, the Eurasian grass step of the temperate glass grasslands, savannas, and shrublands had a uh, a role in the spread of the horse, the wheel, and Indo-European languages. Uh, the Indo-European expansion and, and diverse invasions of horse, horse archer civilizations of the steppe uh, eventually led to the rise of uh, Mycenae Greece and the amalgamation of Indo-Europeans uh, 
uh, in the pre-Greek population. Uh, there was the Dorian and some the late Bronze Age, a lot of stuff. Uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff. Like, uh, it, I don't know, I've just always seen that word. And if, I, I thought it would have been like the flat place, uh, like a flat mountaintop. Uh, but I was wrong. Uh, and I love being wrong. Now, here's a question that came up. It's like, is data left or right-handed? And he is uh, left-handed. Uh, Noon- Noonien Sung uh, programmed his uh, androids with a dominant hand. This is from Stack Exchange. Uh, uh, Brett, I guess Brett Spiner is left-handed, someone said. Uh, Noonien, like his grandfather, Arik, or Arik uh, was left-handed. Why did he make his uh, androids left-handed? Uh, let's see. According to the most upload, upvoted answer, uh, data and lore are left-handed because Soon scanned his own brain to provide the basis for the positronic brains. Uh, and since Soon himself was left-handed, his neural pathways were laid down with the same handedness. Uh, when data, uh, oh, with Lal, uh, is Lyle's handedness is not canonically confirmed. Uh, she uses both hands. It could be ambidextrous, uh, because data scanned his brain for Lyle's brain. Uh, so it's just interesting. I mean, I just was wondering, uh, and now we know data's left handed. Uh, and let's just finish up with, uh, Benzites. Oh, let's do a stoot if you're taking an SAT. Uh, a stoot, S A, uh, let's see how do you spell it. Uh, Astute, uh, A-S-T-U-T-E, quickly or critically discerning or shrewd or crafty is the uh, adjective. Uh, astute, uh, so there there you go, just in case you get that on a test or you want to use it. Uh, well, that's an astute thing you said. Uh, you know, you could use it for fun uh, all the time. Like if someone, uh, you know, you know, your dog breaks wind. You could say, that's very astute of you, Koa. Okay, so then I headed over to Memory Alpha Wiki, uh, Memory Alpha, Memory Dash Alpha. com for Benzite. Uh, there are species of uh, humanoids native to the Federation planet Benzar. Uh, their contact was limited before the 24th century, but in 2364, uh, Mordak, uh, the creator of the Mordok strategy became the first Benzite to join Starfleet, edging out other candidates, including Wesley Crusher. Uh, relations between Benzites and the Federation expanded at this time. Uh, then there was officer exchange programs, uh, uh, and Starfleet officers served on Benzite ships and vice versa. Uh, following Mordok's uh, footsteps, other Benzites, such as Hoya, eventually enrolled in the Academy. Uh, which was also seen on Deep Space Nine episode The Ship. Uh, the ship uh, uh, Benzites are known to be meticulous. Uh, uh, even the regulations are, uh, which kind of played out in this episode. 2374, uh, during the, the Dominion stuff, uh, well, that's like, I want to know. So Benzites are smooth, hairless, uh, blue or green skin. Uh, they have tendrils, uh, and, uh, they don't normally breathe oxygen and nitrogen. So they wear like a breathing apparatus, which kind of seems to put out some, like, uh, whatever they can breathe, uh, which seems like it has a little bit of water vapor. Uh, so that's just a little bit about, uh, Benzite. Uh, so thanks. And, uh, here's some thank yous after this and plenty more to go. Uh, load up other episodes if you need it. All right. All right, everybody, it's time to talk about The Next Generation, Star Trek The Next Generation, Season 3, Episode 10, The the, the Defector. And I guess this round of TNG episodes we're reaching what was an unintentional theme, but will now become more intentional. Or that uh, some reason I, like, like so this is, like, seems like we'll be covering some Romulan and, um, uh, maybe Klingon-style episodes, uh, this round of episodes, because this is a Romulan in neutral zone themed episode. 
Yeah, that'll be cool. Then we can hit up the B O to the R to the G in the next round or something. Also, I love the Q, you know, finish off the Q episodes. Uh, but for now, the episode opens with a campfire, and there's two gentlemen sitting around the campfire uh, talking, or are they giving lines? Uh, is this a play? Is that Picard? W- one of them is Patrick Stewart, uh, like uh, holding a pike. Uh, and another gentleman, there's a tent behind them. He said, is this a play? Like, I thought it was a play performance, even though I'd seen the episode once before. Um, what does that say? Retention? There's a nice horse bray in the background. And a chicken call. That took me a second. Uh, Date is, like, remember, I don't know if, like I said, uh, Sansa looks, like uh, the Starks, Sansa in particular looks good in a hood, uh, like a hoodie or a cape, the hood of a cape. Um and Data also looks good. He's got a very stark, like a Game of Thrones, I guess, ask. His is kind of green cloak uh, with a hood. We got one of the people around the campfire is rocking some chain mail. So is Data. Uh, like Sansa, chain mail warms the hands by the fire. Then we realize there's a double Picard because uh, Captain Jean Luc Picard is reading along. Maybe as a director. This was my notes. Uh, uh, it will read through a little bit of dialogue, but then Data stands at the dialogue, a little bit annoyed. It's a Shakespearean dialogue. I don't know, first of all, Shakespeare asks, uh, and Data stands annoyed, says something back, and then Picard, uh, he likes it. He says, splendid, splendid, and collapse. So, yeah, it's like, uh, it's uh, from, we'll talk about, like, Henry the, the Life of Henry V by Shakespeare. Apparently, this is from Act Four. Or three, yeah, four. And uh, uh, it's uh, Williams and Bates, uh, John Bates. Uh, and they're talking, and then uh, they say, who, who, like, uh, somebody else shows up, who is Data. Uh, but really, he's the king, I think, undercover. And, you know, they talk about their thoughts about the king. Data's kind of trying to, stay, you know, say the king's just like them, just like them. Data's getting it, uh, trying to get inside info. So we get a thematic, uh, possibly a thematic, right, for brighter minds than me, uh, this thematic carry through. But then we also get a little bit of a data story, which is, you know, I mean, we always, well, I always enjoy it. Yeah, uh, but let's see. Yeah, they, so they like they have a long dialogue. Doth you know ask, uh, and then it's a break in the scene. And Picard goes, "She said you're getting really good." And then the characters are like, "Who's talking?" Like they they're still in action mode. Uh, and then Data says, "Yeah, I'm gonna sp- study some more performances." Brana, Olivier, Shapiro, Colinark. And uh, Picard goes, well, this is more about you learning the human condition through Shakespeare. And you do that by your own, what comes up for you, not through other people. Uh, then Riker says, uh, yo, Captain, get down here, unidentified class in the neutral zone, heading towards Federation space. And Picard goes, okay, Data, we got um, we got to hit the road. Uh, but they, they, they clear that out. Uh, Data says, well, why would the king go undercover? If he's a leader, shouldn't he be leading up front? Uh, and Picard goes, well, tell it, like, what is it Shakespeare saying about the king? The king wants to empathize uh, and connect with uh, uh, the, the soldiers uh, before this big action. And then Data says, you know, how about we do a performance for the crew? And Picard says, well, let's not rush it, all right? Also, Data's wig is a bowl cut, like uh, not the same as I would have had as a kid, but it is that style. Okay, what else do we have? Uh, oh, Data had to stop Picard from getting P I K E D by by zone by Picard in the hall talking. He said, "Is this foreshadowing?" Well, let's not rush it. They're on the bridge. Worf looks annoyed, or his normal war face. Uh, Romulan scout ship is ha- open hailing things. Uh, what does this say? Hail of right, hailing us. Uh, oh, they're hailing us. Uh, he says open a channel at first. Uh, or maybe he says open hailing, hailing us, open a channel. 
uh, whoever's on there is requesting uh, asylum. And they say on screen, then there's action music. Uh, we see that Ronald Moore wrote the episode. Bo- booking, brooding time. Oh, this is a question. I didn't get a chance to investigate this. Uh, it was really unrelated to anything. Well, it said, okay, so how many holodecks? Did it, maybe I'll look this up, but like uh, uh, for another episode, like how many de- holodecks are on each ship, right? Because pers- if the human condition is anything like it is now, they you know they get food and everything, but the holodeck would have multiple uses, right? You know, uh, education, adventure, escape, uh, enjoyment, pleasure. So how do, do only officers get to use the holodeck? Like if I'm like a regular enlisted person or just a ca- visiting contractor, because, I mean, the holodeck must be going 24-7 unless it's only the like the uh, Picard gets to pick who gets holodeck time. I mean, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not cut out to live in a world where there's holodecks. It just not quite uh, ever. I don't think ever. You say, well, he went out, you know, I'd be like uh, Moriarty. They say, just put me in there then. You know, like, make it like a Charlie Booker thing. Like, just get me in there and keep me in there. You know, I'll live my life in the the holodeck, you know, depending on the program. Okay, then, uh, what is this? Romulan versus Romulan, very green, red alert, uh, 41 seconds, you got Picard. This is after the open. Guard's not happy. Let's see. Oh, yeah. People on ship. Uh, just checking my notes. He says, "Explain yourself." Uh, the, the dude on other thing says, "Need some help here." What does it say? One forty by two o five. Move uh, five kilometers. All stop. Uh, so that's the orders given out. Extend the shields to the scout ship. Uh, then. Uh, they're face to face with the Romulan ship. Picard says, "Lock phasers, open a channel." Picard kind of does a speech, and then the vessel heads out. So let's see. Visual screen. Oh, open the channel. Of course, to intercept. Stay out of the neutral zone. Oh yeah. How long are you before they get into Federation territory? Formula forty-one seconds. Picard says, "You've crossed into the neutral zone, and you're engaged in action. What's your tent?" They don't answer. That's when the dude says, how about some help? Uh, uh, good data. It's like, yeah, that ship's not doing great anyway. Position. Oh, that was like a one zero one four zero two zero five. Okay. They extend the shield. So it's not going to last long. Uh, and then they say, well, the warbirds are like, I can add us. Uh, regards says Romulan vessel. You're in Federation territory. Unless you withdraw. And then it's out. Uh, Riker says, what's up with that? Uh, that's uh, weird. Back uh, headed towards the neutral zone Romulan territory. Uh, then the power goes off in the scout ship offline. Uh, transporter to beam whoever's on their board. Worf and Riker head out to meet whoever it is. Uh, energize. Uh, they said, holy shoulder pads. Uh, Romulans have serious shoulders uh, or solar shoulder pads, shoulder-enhancing devices. Uh, I must just see your captain, the Romulan says. Uh, cannot wait, uh, which Worf and, R- Worf and Riker share. Uh, look, uh, look at one another. Uh, let's see. Captain's log uh, says, uh, yeah, we got a Romulan defector. Low-ranking logistics, but a lot of information, a lot of secrets. Entree base, I don't know what that says. There's some secret base, E-N-T-R-E, W-T-F. I put, uh, we just missed a base. Uh, somebody says that. Uh, they say, geez, after the Battle of Charon, you know, Romulans are still mad. And uh, they want to claim the neutral zone. If 48 hours, will be ready to go. Oh, and then Riker says, WTF, uh, we missed a base. And they said, yeah, it's going to be a great base for them, not for you guys. You better t- take it out. Uh, I guess Worf says the Federation will not permit that. Uh, this is, I guess, Worf, Riker, and S- Sadel or whatever. The person's name changes a few times. Uh, 
Oh, it would seem so. That's what he says. Uh, yes, they say W A R. Yeah, Worf's like, nope. He goes take out the base show. Riker's, I said Picard's so cool. Oh, yeah, this is on the bridge. Also, Riker gets to drop his, like, light swear words a few times. Uh, cause he wrote Picard because I'm sure you're very t- tired. Uh, what, Worf, why don't you take him up to a medical and uh, you have him get some rest? Uh, the dude goes, no doubt you got more questions for me. Goes, Picard goes, no doubt. Uh, and the record goes, he's got a double hockey stick of a story. And Parker, P- 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 Parker Picard goes, uh, yeah, well, what do you think? And the record goes, well, I don't think they, they'd know we wouldn't want them to build a base. Uh, so Data says, well, it's a Romulan ploy. You know, they want to, they test the enemy's resolve and make you act. Remember the last episode Scoots did? And Riker goes, yeah, trying to make us look like the aggressors. Uh, and then Picard completes the thought, yeah, Romulans will have an excuse to respond then. And Data says, that would not be an atypical Romulan ploy, sir. Always a chess game, Picard says. Uh, and then Geordi's rubbing his hands. At least we get to check out their ship and really go over it. And I liked this one. Um, let's see. So cool. Well, I can see you're tired. That was definitely one of my favorite parts is Picard you, you, is a uh, really boundary establishing in his leadership. Uh, heck, a heck of a story. Uh, uh, Jordy, data, data, something. Oh, so, so they say, okay, Troy and Riker, you talk to this dude. Uh, and data goes, can I go along? Picard goes, nope, I need you on the bridge with me. So much to do. You know, we got to establish uh, peace here, bro. Uh, we got 48 hours. Then the scout ship goes bye-bye. Uh, then we go to mid-bay. And Riker's like, dude, what's up with that? He goes, why wouldn't I put the ship on auto bye-bye? And Riker goes, excuse me for being a little bit confused, uh, but I thought you were defecting. And he goes, yeah, but I'm, uh, he goes, oh, all you want to do is exploit me uh, and take advantage of me. Meanwhile, Crusher's working on him. So she's like, dude, dude sit still. And uh, he goes, how come you're so good with the Romulans? And she goes, some episode Scooter didn't see. Gal, Gal, Galadora, on. And uh, Worf goes, you certainly know a lot for logistics, clerk. And Sato goes, well, I know, you know, it's just common knowledge, dude. I got my rating code. Worf goes, did you know in Star Wars, they, you know, these aren't the droids you're looking for. He goes, it's pretty easy to pull off. And uh, then he says, I don't make it calls Worf a Patak or something. And Worf goes, you're looking not on a Klingon ship. Uh, and he says, remove this Tulsa from my sight. And, and uh, Riker goes, your knowledge of Klingon curse is impressible. But, uh, you know, as a Romulan might say, only a renewal, ver- rule, like a f- double F-O-O-L, would use such language in pu- public, maybe. Worf, you have him go to bed. Or no, he goes, Worf, go get his room ready. And then Worf goes, sure. And then the dude's laughing. Riker goes, what are you laughing about, man? And he goes, I like him. I understand him. Uh, you know, he's uh, like into it, uh, to the B-A-T-T-L. You know, he plays uh, whatever, uh, Mar- Mar- not the Mario Party, the other one. Riker schools him and swearing. Dude nods and laughs. Yeah, then there's a commercial break. Then Riker, Riker, uh, owns, looks around. Uh, uh, fool, start water, echometrics. Uh, okay, let me see. Riker takes him to his room. Is what happens. Uh, shows him. He goes. You can call me through the comp panel. Or we'll be back to talk to you. He leaves. And Sato goes, hey, water? And the thing goes, what temperature? He goes, 12 onkians or something. And the computer goes, I speak to metric system. And he says, cold, uh, on the cold side of whatever your system is. Uh, and he has a sip. He looks around the room. And he said, even Romulans need water. Can't Picard make a speech about that? Uh, 
And they get to use a metric system, unlike us in America here. And then he sits on the bed. He checks, like, this orange good luck chip. Uh, there's music and then a commercial. But I did want to run through the room here. So let's see. Now on the screen, he's talking. Okay, so here he goes. So it was, I thought it was interesting. Uh, in the room, they have, like, different things. Like, so... Okay, the water just appeared. It's in an octangular glass. Uh, like for the people would have a drink with the rocks. There's, you know, paintings, plants, uh, flowers. Then we peek into another room without the bed that has like, a, I guess it would be the dressing room. There's a dresser with a mirror, some plants. There's a bed, which is like a twin size uh, platform bed. There's also a chair, a sitting chair. So I look in the review. I mean, I always forget what's in these rooms. I mean, this seems like a really big room, though. I mean, again, I've never been on a cruise ship or a spaceship, uh, so I really don't know. Okay, so room. Okay, then we're on scene scene one. Scene one. Computer data and Picard are working. I don't know what the maybe it's the computer they're working on. Let me see what it says. Uh, Oh, yeah, Starfleet Tactics, oh, Science One Terminal, that's where they're at. Uh, they're working, Picard's got his arms crossed. Uh, oh, I said I would pause it here, too. Problem with it is, so they're doing a Starfleet Tactical Analysis of the Neutral Zone. Planets in there. Uh, 30, 30, 40 or something. Nothing super interesting. Oh, they do a zoom of uh, whatever planet they're talking about. That's when Picard crosses his arms. He says, yeah, Data. Well, we'll find out what he says uh, in a second. They're looking at it. Data's looking at it. Yeah, but it's on mute. So I'm subject Nirvana 3. Yeah, that's what they're looking at. Yeah, Data does look and uh, like look like he's thinking and analyzing things. Uh, uh, computer stuff, yeah. Prior, then Perkar gets a priority one message in his ready, ready room. Two hour and 20 minute delay. We get Pat Perkar's password. What was Perkar and Data talking about, though? Uh, yeah, nothing on the sensors, uh, but Romulans could be cloaked. Okay, what is Perkar's password? Just in case you need his computer. I think you need his voice, though, but it's uh, access 412 mark 80. Perkar Jean Luc. Uh, Starfleet priority code gamma. That's to decode the message. P four one mark eighty is what I put it. P four one two mark eighty. But that was wrong. What kind of encryption do they use? I didn't look that up either. And then the um uh the Admiral is like, dude, you're on your own for right now. On your shoulders, Picard. He says, I don't know if it's a trick. You know, we're trying to, uh, the Romulans said, yeah, they're, they're protesting your, uh, that you have the defector. Federation Council's convened. No doubt in my mind you're going to have, you're going to be the one dealing with this. Uh, so you have to decide if he's telling you the truth. Uh, but held towards still Nirvana 3. And then it went, the cool thing about watching these episodes like five or six times is I get to pick up on everything. So this is really, uh, Cool, because they leave this trail of breadcrumbs uh, in a well-done way. So Picard says, Worf, get up here. i got to talk to you in private, off-screen. And he says, on my way. So that's like a breadcrumb for the end. What else? Calls Worf. Oh, then the engine computer, Geordi, data crusher, Picard, strange movements, uh, zoomed crusher, and possibly nods. Uh, so let's see, we got a captain's log. Yeah, we're in the neutral zone near Milvana 3. If the guess is right, we got 21 hours till the base is ready. Yo, know, then the boss says, monitor and hood are on their way, but they're not going to get there in time. Uh, we sent out, just, uh, you know, an alert. Uh, and, you know, everybody wants peace, uh, but everybody's on yellow alert. Oh, the security's still in his office, so data comes in. Where is this? Uh, possibly. Okay, let me see where I am. Oh, no. So I jumped ahead one scene. Okay, so they're playing this thing Jordy discovered, which is like the ship's movements were coordinated, which they say, that's weird. Crusher's in on this, too. 
And they said, well, they went after the scout ship. Uh, and they said, well, maybe it was like a soft going after it. Uh, and Picard goes, uh, well, you think this is possible, Crusher? What do you think? You treated him. She goes, I don't think so. But it's a possibility. That's a zoom on Crusher. Uh, then the captain's log. Then the update, a second update from the admiral. Guards in his office. Uh, that was at an engineering computer, by the way. He's at FaceTime. Oh, first he's FaceTiming an Earl Grey. And, uh, uh, data. He goes, we'll send out a class one probe. Uh, every meter or something. Data, long pause. Sets down his tea to talk serious. There's a call back to King Henry. That will be all. And then he pauses right before sip and lowers his tea down and quotes Shakespeare, which we'll cover right now. So he says, yeah, you send out that probe data every meter of Novana 3. Data goes, is there something else? He goes, yeah, Data, you're clear, you're, ob- you're objective. Uh, and he goes, I want you to, he goes, I don't know what's going to happen with this situation. And it's kind of historical. So I want you to record it in a dispassionate way. And Data goes, I'll begin immediately. And then Picard goes, well, how's the crew feeling? And he goes, they're concerned but confident. Uh, can't you tell? And he goes, nope, I can't be like King Henry and disguise myself among my troops. Oh, and then Picard goes, yeah, he quotes something from King Henry. Uh, then we have Troy and Riker interviewing, uh, what's this dude's name? Settle, Seedle. He rhymes Nelvana 3 with you will see. It really, that made me laugh. Uh, or somebody did. Yeah, go to Nelvana 3 and you will see. That's what he says. Uh, and they're, they're really grilling him. He says it's irre- their questions are irrelevant a lot. Riker gets cool and stern. Troy stares hard like she's trying to look her way inside him. Uh, we also realize, uh, oh, so then uh, he says my boss is Admiral Jarrock. Uh, but basically, he's just complaining and uh, kind of thing. And uh, uh, then we see Picard and Worf. Because uh, uh, Picard gets a me- priority message from a Klingon vessel really quick. And he goes, uh, Worf, can you handle that uh, in a private? Take that call for me. Uh, let's see. Probe on course. Uh, Worf's with the LaForge. Uh, and Data. Or maybe this is just Data and Jordy. I really liked this scene. Uh, Jordy goes, geez, my gut's uh, telling me uh, we got to listen to this guy. And Data goes, your gut? And he goes, you know, instinct, intuition. And he goes, doesn't that re- re- interfere with rational judgment? Uh, and Jordy goes, sometimes. Uh, and Data says, well, why don't you stick to the facts? And he goes, well, you can't always rely on simple facts. Uh, sometimes they're wrong. He go, Data goes, they can't be wrong if they're facts. And he could, he could say, could you see into the future? But uh, they say they can lead to wrong conclusions. And uh, Jordy goes, what do you think? Uh, is he a defector? And uh, the facts today would lead to an objective conclusion that he is not. And then uh, Data, uh, Jordy says, well, I think we're going to catch the Romulans with their pants down, like he says. Uh, Data goes, his pants? And he goes, it's a metaphor. And Data says, because of your gut? And he goes, well, yeah, that's a gut. But he goes, you can't always go with your gut. And he goes, I'll put it to you this way. You got your gut, your hu- you got feelings, get in the way of human judgment, confuse us, uh, make us sick and guess ourselves, but we still need them to help it fill in the missing pieces because we never have all the facts. So then Data says, so you fill, fill in the missing pieces with parts of your own personality resulting in a conclusion based as much on instinct and intuition as fact. And Data goes, oh boy. And then Data says, but what if you don't have instinct or intuition? Which is a little bit of a twist, I don't know, emotional twist for me. And Jordy goes, oh boy, there's something interesting here. Uh, Let's see, pants down, what? A metaphor. Uh, Jordy does not answer Data's last question yet. What if you have... uh, because they say the probe, Picard takes a big breath when they say that there's some, something coming out of the planet, some kind of electronic emissions. And Picard says, that will be all. There's a slow zoom and ominous music. Uh, 
And that, like, okay, maybe there is something on Nelvana 3. Then we're at, uh, whatever, 9 forward or whatever it's called. And Data's staring at the Romulan who's having a drink. Uh, and the dude goes, you've never seen a Romulan before? And Data goes, incorrect assumption. And he goes, well, how about some privacy? And Data goes, I want to see what my guts are saying. And he goes, oh, you're the android. Uh, he goes, they'd love to look at you and, Rom- and, and, and Romulus. Uh, and Data goes, no, thank you. And Data goes, this is the best viewport on the ship. The dude goes, I don't care about viewpoint reports, man. It's not my stars. I like that. These are not my stars. Uh, even the heavens are denied me that I want to look at him. And he goes, What's it? can't you make a Romulan ale? He goes, we'd need the original to make it, and we don't know much about you. And uh, he goes, well, you're missing out. He goes, Romulus is, Romulus is the best planet, best ale, best everything. Data goes, you got some regrets, eh? He goes, I had to do it, man, but I'll never see the firefalls of a goth gull thawing again. And the spire is above the apex sea. What does that say? Firefalls at Galgaloth. Uh, dude even throw shade at Data a little bit. How can they bring Romulus, uh, but not Romulus Ale? Yeah, but uh, he goes, oh, he goes, uh, oh, Data goes, it looks like you're not going to get to go home. He goes, the cold reaction of an android. Data goes, well, I'll still be nice to you. Why don't we go try to look at Romulus, uh, and we see the spires and moons of a city. It's a valley of Chula. Uh, city's far off in a valley. And at first the dude goes, this is great. Uh, but then he, he goes, forget it. Uh, he goes, uh, he goes, call Picard. I'm Admiral Jarak, actually. Uh, this is my home now or something. He, you know, he goes, turn it off. Uh, this, you know, holodeck. I said, that's what I said earlier in the episode. Uh, but I got to make sure this wasn't in vain. Rorio, meet, greet Admiral Jarak who wants to see him. Okay. And then that's an ad. Then Picard's FaceTiming or whatever, messaging with the, the Admiral Hayden. Uh, source of info. He goes, yeah, that's Admiral Jarak, but he's an unreliable source of info. So, and Picard says, bring Jarak in here. And wait outside. He says, have a seat, man. No more time. Uh, uh, he goes, oh, the guy goes, I don't have time to sit. But Kirk goes, have a seat. Uh, he goes, I, and this was really good stuff. Again, the shoulder pads. Uh, if Picard raises his voice or deepens his voice, because uh, he, he goes, dude, we got to get to work, the Admiral Jarak. Uh, and Picard goes, you got to convince me you're telling the truth. Uh, irrefutable evidence. Uh, because you got no evidence at all. And he goes, Romulan uh, defector, that's an admiral? And he goes, well, I just want peace, man. And Picard goes, you're no man of peace. Uh, and the guy goes, that's why I went undercover. And he goes, you know, I'm a hero in our world. And Picard goes, uh, well, why should I still believe you? On what basis? He leans in on the chair uh, when he, he stands on that, like after he raises his voice. Uh, and he says, on what basis are you prepared uh, to uh, tell us the truth or not? And uh, the guy goes, well, I'm not going to tell on everybody. And he goes, well, you already made your choice. Uh, fully make your choice or cross over or don't. And then Jarek tries to shade Picard. He goes, oh, don't you have a family? And Picard goes, no. He goes, well, you work too hard. And Picard goes, man, this is where uh, Stuart is just so good. He goes, this is all very interesting. Uh, and then Jarek tries to go off again. And he goes, Picard goes, listen, dude, I don't care about your speeches unless I have unequivocal cooperation. You know, because he makes this long speech about kids and everything. Uh, uh, then we're in the ready room. This was interesting because there's like chit chat going on. People are looking out the window. The, the all the officers uh, before Picard comes in. Then they all go and sit down. So I said, "What do they? Who chit chats with who? And what are they chatting about?" Uh, they they also they rush to their seats. Uh, Picard. 
it, they give Car- Picard their full attention, and there's kind of a long silence. Uh, and Picard stays standing, and he goes, Jarrett gave me everything uh, we probably need, or hopefully it'll give us an edge. Uh, and uh, they all share a look on the news. Uh, he goes, he's going to be more valuable with his field command work. But majority says, great. And then he goes, well, don't depend on it, but set course for, number one, set course for Nelvana 3. Then we have second officer's log. This is data reporting. Uh, 43465.2, we're in a neutral zone. Violation of Treaty of Algernon. Uh, Romulans are probably cloaked and watching us, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, Riker does not like it because it's so quiet. Picard talks about the history of Custer. Nelvana 3 on screen. See, there's no sign of nothing. Nothing on the sensors. Uh, Picard, uh, Riker goes, too darn easy, holy hockey sticks. And uh, he goes, Data, get into orbit around the planet. Uh, and he goes, there's nothing around there, man. Just a subspace, or he goes, yeah, he goes, this ion and uh, subspace stuff uh, still there, but we can't find a source. Rye moving in an orbital path uh, with an 800 kilometer apogee. Uh, let's see. Riker leans on Data's chair while they're talking. Uh, maybe they left the planet. Maybe it's cloaked. Uh, Data goes, will there be distortion if it's cloaked? And now Picard's, like, not happy because Rogerak rolls in. Picard raises his voice right away. He says, uh, you're actually going to tell me why we're here, dude. And Riker goes, he means there's no base. And he goes, no, it can't be possible. He goes, I saw everything. And Picard goes, are you sure it wasn't disinformation? Like, didn't you get fired or something? And they knew you were a grouch. Like, maybe not every Romulan's a grouch like you. And uh, is it a test? And he goes, no. And then Picard goes, well, then they played you. Whatever, uh, what other exclamation point is or exclamation explanation is there? They let you escape. And then Picard says, uh, Jordy, get uh, permission to withdraw. He says, yeah, Jordy, get us out of here. Riker says that. Uh, Riker says permission to withdraw. Picard says, or uh, Picard also said, you know, they let you leave with an arsenal of worthless secrets. Uh, so then they go to leave, and then of course two Romulan ships appear. Uh, they like t- t- tap the uh, Enterprise a couple times. Uh, they say damage. They say a little bit. Uh, Captain's not yet. Ta- oh, they say, what well, should, well, should we do? Uh, Picard goes, nothing. It's just a tap on the shoulder. Uh, and then the wharf goes, they're calling. And uh, Picard goes on screen, it's Tomalock. Uh, he goes, Picard, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, what are you doing here in the neutral zone? And Picard goes, you know why we're here. Come on. And he goes, oh, well, there's no incursion here. We're not doing anything. Guy's so smug. Uh, he could run for office. Uh, let's see. All super pleased, smug look. Uh, and Picard goes, yeah, we just found these uh, subspace, uh, ion subspace emissions or whatever. And he goes, oh, that was just our probe. Uh, re- archaeological research. Uh, cloaked, though. And Picard goes, really? And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, uh, is that why you came all the way across the neutral zone, broke all the treaties? That's not right. And Picard goes, uh, yeah, whatever, we're leaving. And he goes, without even an apology, Captain? Picard goes, you really want an apology? I'll give you one. And he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, I'll save, save you the time. And Picard goes, what do you want? And he goes, some of the enterprise is what I want, uh, then Jarak goes, I can't believe this was like a trick on me to trick them. He goes, you totally used me. And then Tom Lex says, okay, before we take the Enterprise, just send this guy back uh, and then we'll, you know, let you guys give up. And this is when it really gets good because, uh, like, if you're a Picard fan, because Picard goes, uh, do you think I'm going to accept those terms? He goes, no, I expect you won't. It's just like... Uh, 
uh, the Austin Powers movies with Captain or Doctor. He goes, no, uh, Captain Picard, I expect you won't. He goes, you have 30 seconds to decide. And Picard goes, I don't need one second, bruh. And he goes, give up, man, uh, Picard. And Picard goes, if the cause is just and honorable, everybody on my ship's ready. He goes, are you ready? And he goes, idle threat, Picard. And Picard goes, Mr. Worf. Uh, and then all these Klingon vessels appear surrounding the Romulans. And the dude was, before the Romulans or the Klingons appeared, the dude was totally stunned by Picard's uh, uh, boldness. Uh, all fiction to test you. Oh, that was a very Dr. Evil. 30 seconds. Don't require one. Uh, Picard proceeds with some Shakespeare. What will it be, Gerard? Or what will it be, Tom Locke? You're surrounded by, uh, 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 what do you, you know, you're in trouble now. And, uh, he goes, uh, huh. He goes, we're, you, we're still get back at you guys. And Picard goes, uh, and he says, I'll look forward to our next meeting, Captain. And then the Romulans take off, uh, and he says, cancel red alert, thank the Klingon, Klingon's wharf, uh, aye, sir. And he says, take us back. Uh, and Jarek goes, I can't believe it. And he goes to, to, to the, uh, big, the big firefall in the sky because he's like, I can't, I'd rather not. Uh, leaves a letter uh, to his wife and daughter, which Riker finds. And they go, well, but we can't send it, Data says. Uh, and Parkar goes, today. But with others, with the courage of Jarak, uh, we will see a day of peace where we can send his letter home. And with that, the episode comes to a close. Let's see, a couple of notes that came up during this episode. So the play, Henry V, uh, history, uh, let's see, what's it called officially? Uh, Henry V, a history play by Picard, by Shakespeare. It was written in near 1599. And it tells, uh, it focuses on the event uh, immediately before and after the Battle of Agincourt. Uh, Agincourt. I, 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 uh, uh, it was uh, titled The Chronicle of the History of Henry V, uh, which became the wife of Henry V. Um, it's part of a series with uh, Richard II, uh, Henry IV, uh, Part One and Two. Uh, so the audience would have been familiar with uh, the title character. Uh, so this is interesting because I didn't really know that. Uh, so there's a lot of characters. Uh, I don't want to give you the synopsis. Uh, let's just see if there's anything really. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a great Shakespearean play. Uh, you know, I'm not familiar with it, but... Uh, uh, the primary source uh, was uh, Raphael. Holland Shed's Chronicles, uh, Edward Hall's The Union of uh, Two Illustrious Families uh, was consulted. Uh, readers and audiences have interpreted the play's attitude uh, with dealing with WAR in different ways, actually. Uh, so it could be read on as a commentary or on the complexity, or it could even be described as having multiple meanings. Uh, yeah, let's see. It's had a lot of uh, revivals. Um, it's uh, been adapted for film. Lawrence Olivier was in the first movie in 1944. And then Kenneth Branagh was in uh, 1989. And uh, Olivier played some scenes as comedy uh, in, in where Branagh played them more in a serious way. Uh, well, and then Tom Hiddleston did one in uh, 2012. Oh, and there's a 2019, there's probably another 2019 movie coming out of uh, The King. Oh, so it's all, all adapted from all of them. Uh, there's a, also, uh, David Gordon did a dance theater version, Dancing Henry V. Uh, Sweet from Henry V, uh, William Walton wrote for the Olivier film. So there's a little bit about uh, the play, just briefly. Who was Henry V, Scoots? Because I'm always here willing to learn more. Uh, it was King of England from 1413 until 1422. 
He was the second English monarch from the House of Lancaster. Short reign, uh, but outstanding military successes. Uh, uh, one of the strongest, made of England one of the strongest military powers, uh, immortalized in plays, and seen as one of the great warrior kings of medieval England. I guess depending on your, you know, who's, you know, where you're from. Uh, let's see. In 1450, Henry uh, started the ongoing Hundred Years War which, with France. Maybe that was his dad that did that. I guess they had to be over a long time. Uh, let's see. Then they had a union. Following the arrangement, everything seemed to be close to a union uh, between France and England uh, until uh, he went by, you know, went to the big farm in the sky. Had a riotous use, youth, youth. Um, so a little bit of. I mean, I'll link to it. So there's definitely a lot more you could read about it. Now, what about Ronald Moore? Uh, uh, those of you that are like me, Battlestar Galactica fans. Uh, uh, I haven't watched Outlander, but uh, I'm a big Battlestar Galactica fan. I listened to a bunch of the Ronald Moore um, podcasts when he was making that series. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I think he, uh, I mean, wrote some great episodes of Next Generation. Uh, let's see, in 1988, he toured the, uh, Star Trek Next Generation sets. Uh, he passed a script on to one of Gene Roddenberry's assistants, uh, and then he, seven months later, he got a script into somebody's hands, uh, which became that third series episode, The Bonding. And then he did, did do a lot of these Klingon style ones, uh, Sins of the Father, Reunion, Redemption 1 and 2, Ethics and Rightful Air. He's credited with writing or co writing 27 Next Generation episodes. Uh, he wrote uh, a lot of them with uh, Brandon Braga or Braga. Uh, so they had a lot of wor- working together. They also wrote the screenplays for the uh, two f- movies. Uh, Star Trek Generations and First Contact. Uh, then Moore joined Deep Space Nine, a uh, supervising producer, then became a co executive producer. Uh, let's see, they worked on uh, Star Trek First Contact, uh, Mission Impossible 2. They helped on that one and then the script for that. You got to expand a lot of the Klingon culture in uh, Deep Space Nine. And got to start engaging with fans, uh, which he did through uh, Battlestar Galactica. Worked on Voyager for the part of the sixth season, uh, but just a short part of it. uh, And uh, uh, then eventually 2004-2009, Battlestar Galactica, I mean, I think for me, is a great uh, place in my heart. Uh, yeah, I just remember, uh, yeah, I really loved that series, um, and he's been working on a lot of other stuff since then, uh, including Outlander, which, again, I haven't seen, but, uh, probably one day I will, uh, so that, that was the thing, I mean, because Apple, oh no, so then more, Apple also has a more series coming all, for all mankind, uh, so that's cool to know. Okay, one other thing I wanted to do is this uh, chip, chip and dip and cheese company, or chip dip and cheese company, hell of a good, H-E-L-U-V-A, good, uh, uh, exclamation point. We had this when I was a kid, and because Riker said it, I said, okay, what is it? So it's American company, uh, cheeses, dips, sour cream, and condiments, uh, is now owned by HP Hood LLC, so you can feel good about Hood, uh, they had acquired Crowley Foods in 2004. So now they're based in Linfield, Mass. Uh, you probably find it at Wegmans. Uh, let's see. They used to have a store in Wallington, New York, uh, east of Sodus, uh, where all the cheese products were plant plant. So that's why it was in Syracuse where I was growing up. It was founded by Sodus resident Perry Messenger in 1925. Uh, when he started making washed uh, curd cheese as a hobby in the basement of the A.B. Williams Company, for which he owned and managed at the time. Uh, the name or the origin of the name, a traveling salesman stopped by a messenger store one day and sampled the cheese. He said, boy, that's a hell of a good cheese after tasting it. Uh, 
1939, Messenger opened a cheese shop, established a company, and he had a little bit of an issue getting it, re- you know, the name certified. Uh, he was known for having a humorous uh, side. His executive officers were Father Time, uh, Taxes, uh, Geo Experience. And I think Father Time kind of was uh, the, the mascot of it. Uh, uh, then in 1955, he sold the company to George Yancey Sr. in Rochester, who would turn into a regional business. That's right, where I uh, experienced, because then it was, oh, okay, 84, Crowley Foods of Binghamton bought it. So that was about why, why I crossed paths with it. Uh, but I guess they're still using Father Time. They sponsored, the, like, their sour cream dip. Uh, I think in upstate New York, that was, like, a big thing was their sour cream dips. Uh, which I know, like, ever since I was a kid, I guess I like picnics and potlucks. There'd be a lot of hell of a good cheese, sour cream, and cheese dips. Uh, so that's just interesting. I mean, I don't know. Like, to me, it had, it had to be discussed. Uh, so that's everything. And here's some thank yous and good nights. All right, everybody. We're talking about uh, the uh, five, Sims of the Father with an N. Uh, just in case that word, uh, it's uh, from season three, episode 17 of the Star Trek The Next Generation. And it's around more episodes, so you know it's going to be good. And this continues kind of our uh, uh, getting to know Klingons a little bit better uh, series and Romulans uh, a little bit less so because, you know, they're still in the neutral zone, on the other side of the neutral zone. And we have kind of Worf to help us uh, ease, ease our, you know, get to get to know things. Uh, Star date, uh, according to Captain's Log, is like 43, 4368.5.2 or something. And we get an update on the exchange program. Klingon's going to be the first officer. Uh, this is when Riker and Picard are walking. Uh, use the term patronize. Uh, we'll, we'll go through some of the dialogue. Commander Kern, I think, uh, is the name of the person. Uh, what does it say? Request to energize? Maybe something like that. Uh, it's not O'Brien working in this uh, whatever transporter room. They put teleport here. Question that we'll answer later is how long are shifts on the Enterprise? Because uh, that came up. Uh, so Kern comes in. He says, right, because he's going to be the first officer. He says, you're relieved, bruh. Yeah, then he says he's ready for duty. This is really, there's a lot of, this is a, so definitely worth watching. Not for just the story and the content, but for the moments. Holy moments. Uh, just some classic uh, exchanges. Uh, so he says he's ready for duty. He has a stare down like, what up, Riker? I'm in charge now as they walk out of the uh, uh, transporter room. Uh, then he gives a, a spe- speech on the bridge, which is, he's no joke, this Klingon. He is a commander. Kern, uh, discipline, not what you're used to. What, what would... Oh, this is, like, stuck out to me. So Wesley and Data are whispering, and you say, like, WTF, like, no whispering on the bridge, especially when your new commander's speaking. And I don't know what, I mean, Wesley's a young person, so, but Data, I said, Data, what are you doing whispering with Wesley when your new commander, it's just, uh, it seemed like a lack of respect to me. Uh, or, I mean, I guess it's like a foreshadowing a bit, uh, and, uh, kind of a, like, a not a mini B plot, more of a plot to, uh, misdirect plot. But I mean, I would send them to the break. Uh, I mean, no, no offense. I mean, I would get in trouble for whispering all the time too. Uh, Crow awards orders, crew awaits orders, uh, at 2.35, uh, I think it's 2.45, because I'm looking, maybe not 2.35. Oh, no, yeah, it is 2.35. Uh, Kern sits down, a really classic moment worth watching. They head to the outer commentary commentary cloud, which is hard to say, because it's commentary, not commentary. But Picard is impressed, and uh, then the episode opens. Let's see if there's any, uh, they're reflecting on Riker's time at the pod. I'm going through the dialogue now. Uh, be sure the crew's prepared for any unusual orders. Uh, Kern's probably studied before he got here. He requested Enterprise specifically. 
he comes on board. He's rocking his uh, belt and everything. A yielding first officer, may I take my station? Riker says, what if I show you your room? He goes, dude, I'm here to work, not to lie around. Uh, then he says, yeah, you're going to address me commander or sir at all times. I know all the Starfleet. I know your files. Uh, and uh, with your permission, Captain, you know, I'll be a disciplinarian. Uh, and then he says, when Wesley's, uh, he says, we'll see if you live up to your resp- rep- 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 reputations. What are you doing whispering, Crusher? You got something to say? Uh, no. And then they head out. Uh, okay, then... We're at nine forward. Is that what it's called? Ten forward. I, I'm only welcome at four forward, four below. Like they say, you scooch you, you're banned from ten forward, nine forward, seven, six. They say you could go to four below, which is like a below deck hangout. It's just it was formerly a broom closet. Uh, and that's where me and Stan hang. Okay, they're at the bar. Riker goes up to Will. He does his classic legs uh, swing. Wes has a socket face. Uh, then Jordy comes in, also very grouchy. And uh, I, I, I don't normally comment. Uh, it, 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 Jordy's like, we're going to have to work double shifts. Even Riker gives a big sigh. It put, these These staffers are weak, man. Uh, I was not impressed at how we could say they say Riker goes, huh, let me get this conversation with Wesley. Something up with Commander Kern? Yeah, I can't do anything right. Uh, he's on my case. And then Riker says, problem, Jordy? He goes, yeah, with, uh, he goes, what did they find something in engineering? He goes, yeah, inspection, uh, while we're doing maintenance. And he goes, uh, oh, we don't do inspections during maintenance. And Riker goes, well, Riker first is like, well, it's different. They believe in strict formality of command. And Jordy goes, this isn't a Klingon vessel. He's got to loosen up. Kind of like he's a new cab counselor or something. Uh, Wesley, they're like, he's on everybody's case except for one person who wouldn't mind it. Then we go to Worf. Uh, let's see. And this is like the most non-passive aggressive, uh, just a full passive. He's going, Kern's going full baby mode on Worf. He goes, oh, very good. You handled that well. Worf's face at 640 is worth about a million dollars. Uh, then we switch to Riker and the, um, I'll go through the dialogue, but Riker's like picking his below his lip, thinking on the elevator. Oh, I'll also put down that Tony Todd is the actor playing current, a very famous actor. 156 trip to Captain's Mess for me. I don't know if that's a number. First, oh, this was the first time I went to the Captain's Mess in an episode, I think. Uh, a suggestion, question mark? Okay, Riker kind of has to, to, to talk, uh, uh, violate chain of command. Wasn't anybody paying attention when that fish dude that uh, was on that episode recently? It was, it was the same episode where Riker was on the thing, uh, but Riker raises his voice. Uh, there's a W. I, I said, WTF, dude. What kind of Starfleet third command are you? Uh, Riker glares. Then we're at the officer's message, turkey and comedy. Well, this was one thing I thought was funny. I didn't put the time at this, but Data's standing by. So, so I, I, I just presume Data doesn't eat. This is another thing I just don't know. And I could probably learn that if I paid attention or anything. But he's standing right by the turkey. As, uh, of course, Pat Picard's cutting, carving a turkey. He, I put, buy the food like a goof. Uh, he's just standing there. This is kind of awkward. Really see. Okay, I'm only comfortable talking to this person, and now they're carving the turkey. Better stand by them while they carve the turkey. Uh, we get a Caspian C shout out. Let's see. Oh, yeah, Worf and Kern. Oh, great job. Very good. Uh, you've handled that well. Worf doesn't like how easy he's going on him. Okay, Riker says uh, to Kern on the elevator, or the, whatever that thing is called, uh, you're you're very impressive, your knowledge, but I'd like to make a suggestion. The dude's like, a suggestion, bruh. Uh, haven't you been on a, like, a, really? I mean, I think if, like, uh, some people might handle it more diplomatically, but I think even Picard would be like, uh, 
he told the the blue guy, you talk to Worf, he's your commander. But Riker says, Riker's being passive aggressive. He goes, oh, when I was on board the pod, it was hard for me to uh, adjust to the crew, you know. I had to adjust to who I am. Maybe that would uh, I could help you. And the guy goes, no, thanks. And Riker goes, yeah, this isn't a Klingon ship, by the way, a super pad. And then he goes, yeah, now you would know it if it was, because uh, you'd already be out outside uh, floating by. Uh, then we have to, to a comedy about the turkey and the replicator. I did find it strange that uh, Kern doesn't like, uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call that, caviar, because he said, well, I want some something a little bit more edgy. Uh, so I thought that was, uh, it, and then Data tries to explain that. A lot of fun, well, really, this was your comic relief scene. They sit down to eat. He doesn't like the food. He, they say, uh, Troy says, how are things going? He goes, well, I almost had to take, you know, Riker. He says, it's just a really good scene. Uh, and Picard has to bring everybody in line. He says, yeah, the exchange program is about tolerance. Uh, and he goes, stay shaking up the status quo. And then Jordy and Riker still can't let it go. Uh, Riker has to say, well, he's keeping us on our toes. Jordy goes, and then some, no offense. Uh, and he goes, yeah, none taken right now, but I won't forget it, Jordy. And uh, yeah, he goes, if we were on another ship, you'd be a big, big trouble. And then, uh, Caspian C, let's see. Uh, orchids are on the table. Oh, it looks like they were drinking fruit punch or something out of flutes. Uh, also, everyone seemed like they had potatoes and broccoli. Both, uh, that's great, like boiled or steamed potatoes. Uh, smaller ones, like a selection of uh, colorful ones. I don't know if people call those new potatoes. I don't know why they got the term new potatoes. They say, oh, it's not one of these regular old-fashioned kind. It's a new potato. It's purple, red, and uh, other colors. A uh, dude would be good. Oh, yeah, this guy, I don't know, maybe he was on, uh, but this character, Kern, would be great in Game of Thrones. He's got a little bit of Tormund going, uh, early Tormund, uh, to Bland, Jordy, uh, the, oh, oh, Jordy goes, uh, oh, the food, Jordy also steps in, so he goes, when, uh, Kern says, this food's too bland, he goes, Worf seems to love our food, and they say, Jordy, uh, like, uh, uh, seems uh, okay. Then Worf uh, oh, seems to agree with Worf. Uh, oh, then we're at Kern's room. Doorbell rings. He says, "Enter." It's Worf. His hands are behind his back. Uh, Kern kicks back in a chair to listen. Then they kind of go back and forth like an old married couple. Mev yap. Uh, this is a purpose for a carve a league or old broomstick. Uh, I don't know, that is a purpose for Cavalier and older Browski. Uh, fitting in details, big news, the challenge, question mark, big music. Uh, oh, maybe it's older brother? Uh, that is uh, the purpose, repose uh, for Kevlogger and older Browski. Uh, filling in de- fitting in details. I mean, basically what happens is Worf says, dude, why are you on my case? not on my case by being on my case? And they go back and forth about being a true Klingon. Worf kind of goes, uh, Klingon. And he goes, by the way, he goes, it wasn't being hard on you. I just wanted to check uh, if you were a real Klingon. You had the heart of a Klingon because that's what I would expect from uh, my brother. And they go, then they fill in, oh, yeah, well, I was one when you went to Kitmer. Uh, Mother and father were supposed to be a quick work trip. Uh, Now Stan Lorg. And uh, that was this. Then uh, Worf goes, geez, I thought I'd heard you weren't around anymore. And they said, yeah, they thought I was Lorg's kid when when nobody came back here. And he goes, that's why you're on the Enterprise, keep an eye on me. He goes, well, I want to see what kind of Klingon you were. And he goes, well, you're, you're deceiving me. He goes, well, it's required. Uh, 
He goes, because your curiosity goes, no. The challenge to going on high council, father's a, a traitor. So it's a big music. Then Picard and Worf are meeting. There's slow zooms on both of them. As Worf says, my dad's uh, been set up or something, uh, so I got to go defend his honor. And Picard goes, well, what do you know? He goes, not much. I'll find out Duras was my father's rival. He goes, it'll disgrace our name for seven generations. I got to clear it. Uh, you know, it's uh, Picard goes, well, if I understand it co- correctly, uh, or first he goes, uh, yeah, I'm responsible for my father's mistakes. Uh, he goes, will you grant me a leave? And Picard goes, no, you know, respect a member of my crew. He's in a fix here, and your actions reflect on me and the Federation, so I should go with you, uh, be at your side. And uh, so this, uh, there was like a touching moment. There's a lot of nice touching moments, especially with Picard and Worf. Uh, will you grant me a leave? No. Bridge, uh, Kern, Empire, great look at 1545. Uh, Nine Ford, the brothers talk, Chadich. Uh, Worf does uh, the tough lean in on this ship. You, I obey you, but it's Chadich, you obey me. Yes, brother. Uh, then we see the Enterprise over a greenish blue uh, uh, planet. Uh, lightning, temples. Uh, we're on. Uh, well, well, cloud, mist, music, and then Riker, Worf, uh, Picard, and Kern, which again always seems like yeah, you just send everybody down there. Uh, they go right into a courtroom, and Worf uh, goes and makes a speech. Uh, so let's see, on the bridge they go to the first city of the Klingon Imperial Empire, and they kind of Worf and Kern talk at nine four ten forward or four below. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I need a chat each. Uh, will you be my chat each? Yes. Uh, sons of Moog or Mog, uh, stand together, family honor. And Worf goes, no, you're going to keep it quiet. Uh, you're my chat each. Uh, I'm going to take the heat. Uh, you're still uh, whoever that other dude's kid is. Also thinking, which we kind of already knew, is that uh, Picard has a lot of latitude with Starfleet to kind of do, do missions. Uh, I guess it kind of is a diplomatic mission. So when court starts, Worf says, yeah, I'm son of Moog. I'm challenging this case. Uh, and they say, are you prepared to take on, uh, like, things if the case doesn't work out? He goes, oh, yeah. And uh, who, he says, who are you? And Kern goes, I'm Chadich, man. I'm Worf's Chadich. Uh, and this Duras is a real, uh, you know, real, real J-E-R to the K. On Dwarf's case, talking, hear my own request. Uh, oh, Picard's here. He goes, so what are you wearing a kid's uniform for with outsiders? He goes, dude, I'm like Jean-Luc Picard. And Picard he goes, we've done a lot. Worf's done a lot. Very proud of him. Uh, and we're here to help. Uh, and the head of Kem, Kem, Kempak or whatever is, says, okay, I could see this your commanding officer. And Duras goes, at some point, the truth has got to come out. And now it has that Moog uh, is uh, so sold us out to the um, Romulans, of all people. And even takes a Worf's uh, thing off. Uh, and Worf goes, the day isn't over, bruh. Like, just wait. And then they say, well, let's take a break uh, and we'll do the case later. Uh, let's see, where are we? Well, you, okay. Calls out Worf up in his grill, takes off sash, good day, recess, back to the bridge. Uh, Picard, they go back to the bridge. Picard goes, day to get on it, uh, do this. Computers, give me these reports. Troy was with Picard, so I assume he was also consulting her before the scene started. You know, give me give me a breakdown of uh, the head of the judge and uh, high counsel and Duras. Uh, Worf and the judge just speak alone. Oh, someone also hands a, a, a secret note to Kern, like, hey, meet me at the playground in 20 minutes. Uh, and the head judge, he says, why'd you bring a challenge? Uh, why does it even matter, man? You don't even live here anymore because it's my father. 
And he goes, let the past be. Mechba, I think maybe that's that dude's name. He goes, why are you going to dishonor my dad? And then Data and Riker are doing some research, and then uh, they call it Dr. Crusher even. So really, this has happened before. You see, everybody gets behind the person who needs it. I guess Jordy wasn't there, but they said they don't know if they needed any engineering help, uh, no, if it, or no, or Wesley. I'm just, I'm just laughing at the facts, but uh, what does that say? I don't know. Then there's a secret meeting with Kern and uh, I think Duras. Uh, he goes, "We know your Worf's brother, man. We're all ha ha ha. Uh, give up the case." Uh, he goes, no, he's my brother. And then he, they try to send him to the Klingon, the the equivalent of the big farm in the sky for Klingons. And they go to a commercial. When we come back, we realize he's okay. He's at the med bay under Dr. Crusher's care. But he, they say, geez, Duras already knows he's my brother. And Crusher goes, Worf, you sound like you already lost. I thought, you, you know, I thought you were Worf, Positivity City. And everyone giggles at that. Uh, then Data has some proof. Uh, he says, you, you, he goes, look at it, I got some. He goes, actually, m- according to Moog's, Moog's, he goes, I got all these uh, communication databases, right? And he goes, Moog did send the, like, shield codes out. Uh, he goes, these are the real records. It's, it's Jordy and Riker, I think, helping him. Oh, so Jordy is helping. I'm sorry, Jordy. I forgot about you there. But then they say, well, there's gaps in the logs. Uh, and then Jordy goes, the time stamps fall out of sync. Uh, they're really digging into the metadata. And so they go, this has got to be a cover-up. The time stamps should have never fallen out of sync because they were in sync at one point, And then when the gaps occur, they fall out of sync. Yeah, then we have Picard and Worf. Uh, oh, because cover-up city, yo. We'll do some of that dialogue. Uh, not Duras, but the whole city council. Because the new Chadich, uh, I ask you, I'd like the gesture. Oh, this is a really touching scene. Uh, okay, so Picard and Worf are in uh, the red, Picard's ready room or his office, right? It's a bit like a Winter Soldier, uh, maybe, because he says, this is a cover-up, man. This is uh, goes to the top from the bottom, I think. Uh, and we'll figure it out, though. It, goes, it could be the whole council involved. And and then uh, Worf goes, well, I lost my chat each. i got to pick a new one. I'd like to pick someone from the crew. And Picard goes, choose whoever you wish. He goes, I choose you. Just like... Uh, you guys remember that Simpsons episode where Ralph Wiggum gave Lisa, uh, or Lisa gave Ralph Wiggum a, a Valentine and said, I cho- choose you. He goes, I cho- choose you as my Chadich. Cho- cho- choose my Chadich. That was a hit. Uh, anyway, uh, and he goes, well, don't you want someone tougher? And me, <laughs> right, Worf goes, dude, anybody tougher than you? Someone smoother? Worf goes, well, you're smoother than Riker, really. You're someone cooler. And uh, Worf goes, I can't ask a cucumber, you know, because they're not a member of the crew. They're a replicated uh, vegetable from Earth. And Picard knows some Klingon, so he says, I accept. Uh, Worf does say, I can think of no one I'd rather have at my side. Big breath on the acceptance from Picard. Okay, then we're at uh, Picard. Or then we're back in court. Um, Picard and Worf. Uh, and Picard goes, my, or Worf goes, my challenge will proceed. Uh, and then Duras, Duras is disrespecting everybody or whatever. And they say, what are you doing here? This isn't a spaceship, Picard. He goes, I'm not here to command. I'm the Chadich. Yeah, they say, Starfleet does not teach you or something. Uh, you... Oh, they give you, you like uh, somebody says, uh, you're not, are you really tough? Obviously, they, they go, he goes, uh, Ricard goes, you may test that assumption, uh, something, something. We'll look at that. It, but it, it reminds me, I wonder if the episode with young Picard was before or after this. Because when you've seen young Picard, you, you say, well, that's a mistake. But Picard's a bit B to the A to the D. 
to the A, to the double, to the asses. Uh, Crusher tells Riker, oh, is this like, uh, maybe, I don't know if this is the scene or not. Uh, Crusher, Crusher, oh, Cr- this is on the ship. Crusher calls Riker and says she found a clue on the Klingon central net. Uh, so this was, uh, again, how forward thinking the show was. Uh, then we go to Duras making the case, uh, to, like, uh, for the cover up. Oh, see, Starfleet doesn't teach you to be tough. Uh, Garrett says, you may test that assumption at your uh, convenience. So, yeah, then they find out uh, that they, they kind of have, like, uh, someone uh, that worked with Worf's family. And then Duras, uh, you know, totally makes the case. We also learn, much like grandparents and, uh, like, uh, with the uh, phones in movie theaters, the... Picard doesn't realize in the middle of a court case he should have his communicator on vibrate or on not on speakerphone when he answers it. He could he could answer with his headset and say, okay, I'll call you back. But he puts it on speaker. Yeah, I think he had it on, oh, like, one of those next, what those, remember those phones that were also walkie-talkies? Uh, but Riker calls, uh, he goes, dude, we got a crack in this case, Commander. Or Picard goes, sorry, I'm in the middle of a you know Supreme Court case. Uh, let me and I'm Chad each. Uh, let me just sneak over here. Uh, K- K- Kalest uh, was uh, someone. Uh, Picard tells Worf then, I got to go meet Kalest in the old quarter. This is another great moment. Uh, Thirty-two forty-five. Worf goes, I don't know if that's a good idea. You go into the old quarter. Uh, Picard goes. Hey, I'm your Chadich, uh, all smooth and calm. Uh, but Duras' lackeys are watching. We go to a commercial. Then I said a holy return of the Je- Jedi, for real. Because Picard's in full uh, Luke Skywalker at uh, Jabba's Palace in Je- Jedi undercover mode. Except he's more in a green, green quilt. And he goes up to... Uh, um. Kala's house. She, she says, what do you want? Uh, Kirk goes, who's the traitor? She goes, I don't know. But War- Picard knows there's something up. Uh, he goes, well, then Worf's in trouble. Uh, I gotta leave. She goes, leave then, uh, Jadich. And Picard goes into the mist. He goes, well, I guess Worf's case is lost then. And then he has to show down with, uh, Duras's minions, uh, and they get a taste of the old flyboy Picard from back in the day. And when Bart Picard needs his own shot, each Colest comes out in her bathrobe and sweeps, you know, sweeps it up. Uh, and then Picard gets an idea. He says, Colest, what if we, we just shake loose the truth? And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, you ever see a Tom Cruise movie with Jack Nicholson? All good, for good, all good men or something. It's called a few good men. It's called. And she goes, it hasn't come out yet. He goes, well, this will be a plot point, and it actually has. But uh, and you're right, depending on the timeline. He goes, we'll close this case. Uh, he goes, just like they did, it'll work. And then Picard rolls in, just different than the movie, but it, it seems similar. Uh, he rolls into court. He goes, you got an eyewitness, yo. And an open counsel, Duras, uh, talks about Kyle Est, uh, but the judge knows her. They used to date. He goes, it's good to see you again. And uh, then they sit down for a private meeting, uh, and he goes, I asked you guys to leave. Now it's come to this. Uh, and it turns out that the whole thing is a cover-up for Duras's dad because he's rich and powerful, typical, and, you know, Duras is a little B-R-A to the T. Uh, then Picard goes, well, then Worf's challenge is successful. And the dude goes, he never had, there was no challenge. This was a, just a, this was a, whatever, a straw trial or whatever they call it. And then we get a taste of Picard outrage, which is, you know, always good. Let's see if we can you know, dig up the uh, thing. Because the total thing with Kalas works, where they just ring her in for a minute. And they go, well, we just know what she knows. We'll just go to the press, you know, more or less like that. You know, if you won't do it in open court. But he goes, okay, so then the judge says, you, we just can't do this. It'll cause, a, like, a, he goes, don't you know, d- d- didn't your country once have uh, whatever they're called, arrested, whatever they were called, uh, 
you know, wherever all, and they go, oh, yeah, that's, uh, who do you think owns the company that makes uh, all the replicators? Uh, anyway, so then uh, everybody has a laugh. Uh, and they say, uh, oh, so Picard goes, uh, he goes, you can't, he goes, you can't make judgments here. You just, uh, he goes, we'll break up with the Federation. He goes, you can't just make orders, Picard. Uh, and Picard goes, the alliance with the Federation is not based on nonsense, Kempek. Uh, you could be, you could keep your secrets, uh, but you can't, you know, railroad this case and Worf and his brother. And Worf sets up, he says, and then Picard says, don't Worf. And he goes, Chadi should be silent. He goes, cover him up for my brother. Let him live his life. And I'll take the blame. And Duras goes, no. And Worf goes, I'll give you even something better. Uh, discommendation. And Duras goes, in open court? He goes, yeah, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll, I'll uh, blame my dad. Uh, and this really gets to Justice's uh, thing. He goes, wow, you really are a Klingon at heart. You're putting a Klingon home world uh, in the aristocracy. <laughs> You no, know, just like everywhere else, the aristocracy first, uh, you know, to keep the peace for everybody. And then Worf uh, rolls in up on uh, Duras and goes, well, you, you, even though your daddy's rich, he's uh, the one that caused the Kitmer thing. Don't forget about that. Uh, and then somebody says, no, I'm ready. Uh, let's see. Oh, then his bro- oh, now Worf says, now I'm ready. Uh, then his brother's like, why are you going to do this cover-up? Why are you going to cover up for me? I want to get blamed, too. He goes, uh, no, I, no, no, Picard has to tell his brother. He goes, he needs you, man. There's going to be another day. Don't forget this. Uh, we're going to come, we're going to make a comeback on this one. Uh, and they do a nod. And then everybody turns their back on, uh, everybody in the high council turns their back on, uh, and Worf uh, crosses her arms, turns her back. Even his brother has to because he's been, you know, ex- ex- hexed out or whatever. And then Worf and Picard energize out, and the episode comes to a close. Uh, in what was a very classic, uh, amazing uh, episode of, Star- of uh, Star Trek. Yeah, no, it was Star Trek. Uh, I don't know why my brain went on that. Okay, let's look at our notes. Uh, for SAT and patronize is a good word uh, because we have patrons. It's to act as a patron, support, or sponsor, uh, to go as a customer on a regular basis, or to treat in a condescending ma- nature. Uh, it's just uh, ironic, like the word gets used uh, both ways. I guess like uh, to be a patron with irony, you know, passive aggressive irony or something, uh, uh, like in, in sincerely, uh, but that's spelled P A T R O N I Z E patronize. Uh, okay. Look, I wanted to look up shifts on, um, enterprise. Uh, let's see, like, uh, technical data, physical arrangement, um, Operations. The bulk of people on Enterprise uh, could get off in four minutes, uh, which would happen at Starbase 74. Uh, there's places people could hide out. Um, shipboard life. Uh, average day aboard the ship. Uh, well, this was like in Data's Day. Four birthdays, two transfers, two chess tournaments, school play, promotions, and a birth. Uh, the Enterprise normally ran on three shifts. Uh, uh, increasing to four shifts caused scheduling po- problems, uh, like in chain of command. Uh, uh, so usually it's three shifts, which makes sense. as 8, 16, 24. Uh, commanders of instant rank were required to share crew quarters, but were allowed their own quarters of a promotion to lieutenant junior grade. Uh, families just shared quarters. Uh, ten forward was the center of the ship's social activity. Four below was where scoots went. And the holodecks were on 10 and 12, which I always wondered. For the crew, entertainment for the crew, it says there, though. Oh, here's the ship's directory. This is interesting. Deck 2, Wharf and Data had the rooms. Uh, deck 7... 
uh, maybe Worf had his room uh, at another point, Deck 8, Troy, Riker. They were only one room apart, according to this, 910 and 912. Uh, Crusher's quarters, uh, Troy's office, uh, uh, Row, R- Row, Lauren's uh, quarters, uh, also deck nine, uh, could have been Troy's quarters, uh, Jean Luc Picard's and 3601, which could be on deck nine, Crusher could be on deck nine. So this is interesting. Three shifts, uh, which I've worked at, uh, places that had shifts, uh, and normally they weren't nine to five shifts. I think they ended at three, a lot of them. And they were in the county. So I don't know if they were eight hour shifts anyway. Maybe they're eight and a half or nine because you don't get, you, you know, you only, you take a, you got to work your, your lunch break. Uh, I think you work nine and a half, eight and a half hours. You were at work for nine. And you're, I, I can't remember. You get to be at work for nine hours because you got a 15, two 15 minute breaks and a half hour unpaid lunch. So, eight and a half hours, I guess. Uh, but that also gives you overlap uh, when you're switching. So, three to uh, se- wait, wait, uh, seven to three, three uh, to 11. And then 11 to 7. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what they were on Enterprise because they simulated, uh, I think they said simulated days. Okay, let's talk about the great uh, Tony Todd, uh, who's uh, like uh, so many movies, uh, a lot of movies we've seen. uh, But like he was a voice in Transformers. and he's just been in a lot of movies, uh, like uh, the, like all the other movies are great movies. Uh, uh, he, he's from the Eugene O'Neill National Actors Theater Institute. Uh, grew up in uh, D.C. and Hartford, Connecticut. Uh, he's been in movies, uh, films, um, and uh, he's in a movie coming out next year. But he's also been on tons of uh, TV, Boston Public, uh, Law and Order. Uh, Hercules, Xena, X-Files, Smallville, Psych, 24, Charmed, Stargate, Andronima, Minds, 21 Jump Street, Chuck. He played two different roles on 24. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, he's in Star Trek, uh, Next Generation, and Deep Space Nine. Uh, Star Trek Online. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, just definitely someone you're like, holy cow. Okay. I know exactly who that is. Uh, when you see it, Caspian Sea, uh, is the world's largest inland body of water. It could be the largest lake or full fledged sea. It's a basin without outflows. Uh, it's located between Europe and Asia. Uh, on this broad step of uh, Central Asia, it's uh, 143,000 square miles, 33,701, 371,000 kilometers. Uh, that doesn't uh, count uh, detached lagoon. It has uh, 1, 2, 1.2% salinity. It's a third of seawater. Kazakhstan on the northeast, Russia to the northwest, Azerbaijan to the west, Iran to the south, Turkmenistan to the southeast. Uh, well known for a lot of uh, like uh, animal and plant diversity. It has its main uh, freshwater inflows from the Volga River, which uh, enters at the shallow north end. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, I just want to talk about his his formation is a remnant of uh, an ancient sea. Its uh, seafloor is the oceanic basalt, uh, basalt, uh, and not continental granite. It got landlocked over 5.5 million years ago due to tectonic uplift and the fall in the sea level. Uh, it's uh, yeah, the largest inland body of water, 40 to 44 percent of the total. Uh, Luca Stream uh, Waters of the World. So cool. I mean, I love uh, I love the sea. Uh, his characteristics common to seas and lakes. This is all from Wikipedia. It's not a freshwater lake. Uh, 
uh, but it contains 3.5 million, 3.5 times more water than all of the Great Lakes combined. And the sea level has uh, risen and fallen over the uh, history of it. Uh, and it, it has a lot of flora and fauna. You can read more about it via our link. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. We got 44 minutes here. So let's do a, a, a few good men and then we'll see what else we have. Now, I was really surprised. I didn't see this. In, this movie came out in 1992. I would have bet 99. And one of the reasons it's so catchy is it was written by Aaron Sorkin, which I didn't know. Uh, he originally had a play by this name. And it's a classic. Uh, again, I thought it was more modern than 92, uh, which tells me that a lot of people probably haven't seen it. It's uh, Tom Cruise, uh, Jack Nicholson, uh, Demi Moore. It's a Rob Reiner film. Uh, Kevin Bacon, Kevin Pollack. Uh, Kiefer Sutherland's even in it, uh, James Marshall, J.T. Walsh, uh, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Bodison uh, act in it. It's uh, produced by Castle Rock, uh, distributed by Columbia. Came out in the holiday season in 92. Uh, a little bit over two hours. Uh, budget was like 30 to 40 mil, made 240 plus in the, um, in the box office. Uh, and contains, you know, you can't handle the truth is the most uh, famous line from the movie. Uh, but again, really had this. Uh, you really, if you haven't seen it, it's a movie worth checking out. I, I remember the last time I watched it. It was probably in the last five or years, maybe six years. And again, I was somewhere else where I and I had something to do, and then it came on like cable at probably at a hotel room or something, and I just I got just sucked right in. And I said, "Wow, I forgot how good this is." Uh, and a, a lot of the roles, like uh, I think uh, Demi Moore and Kevin Pollock's roles, are definitely uh, very underrated. Uh, so definitely a movie worth uh, checking out. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, Oh, the Kitmer incident or whatever. Let's look that up. Or Kitmer is an inhabited planet uh, in the Kitmer system. And it was a vital role in the Klingon Federation Alliance, uh, as well as the site of the Kitmer co- 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 conference. Uh, uh, because when the Romulans uh, snuck in there, uh, let's see, that, that, I think that's like... Uh, it was a neutral site for the Federation of the Klingon Empire. This is like 2293 near the Romulan border. And that's when they had a conference there, the Kitmer Accords. Uh, and then in 2346, uh, the Klingons had a colony there. And then the Romulans uh, snuck in. And uh, I guess that was like uh, whatever his name is, Dad. And not Worf's dad, who's fully innocent, of course, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it was also in novels and other a few other episodes. Uh, but yeah, I did, I did want to learn a little bit about that. Um, let's see, what about Prince Caspian? Uh, oh, to be Prince Caspian, float upon the waves as fish sings. Uh, it uses from the film though. This is a fictional character in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. Uh, noble, handsome, brave, and merry, strives for fair, fairness and justice, a uh, devoted king, also known as Caspian the Seafarer, a young nephew and heir to King Miraz of Narnia. 1,300 years have passed. Uh, let's see. The, they have the mythical, the, the, like, uh, when he's a small boy, he hears all the stories about the history. He has to deal with his uncle. I don't want to. I guess I don't want to do any of that. Uh, uh, but he's in those books. Uh, also, was in. Uh, there's a television serial of it by produced by the BBC, and then the, the movies, which it didn't um, fully get made out. Uh, they, I guess they made. I don't know. I don't see the movies listed here. Yeah, but that's a little bit about Prince Caspian. What about Klingon? Uh, let's see. This is from Wikipedia page. Uh, 
They were developed uh, in uh, 1967 for the original Star Trek series. Uh, uh, feudal authoritarian warriors uh, and as the makeup effects things they were re- redesigned for Star Trek the motion picture that's when they got their foreheads and uh, kind of made out uh, to be a little bit samurai-esque I guess uh, and they were recurring antagonists in the 60s uh, Star Trek uh, and the feature films uh, then in Next Generation, they became a close ally of humanity. And in the 90s in Deep Space Nine, they all joined together. Uh, let's see. They have the Klingon language, uh, which was developed by Mark Orkland, uh, suggested by James Duhon. And uh, it's one of the most po- it is the most popular fictional language. Yeah, let's see. They were changed for the motion picture. And uh, no Klingon characters were in Wrath of Khan, uh, but they were in uh, Search for Spock. And they got deeper uh, depiction in The Next Generation uh, with Worf. Uh, and uh, let's see, there's a lot here, so I'll link to it. Uh, changes in appearance, uh, biology. Robust and enduring biology. Uh, let's see, the spiritual people uh, that took over their own gods. Uh, uh, they, they, instead of the big farm in the sky, they can go to Stove War Core or Grey Thor. Uh, so that's where, instead of the big farm, spiritual leaders Kalas, a uh, messianic historical figure. Uh, she, she, she has her own sword, a uh, sword of Kalas. And uh, let's see, they have their own language, as we talked about. Uh, you know, they have their own ships, cloaking technology. Their home world has several names, uh, like uh, just like we call Earth, Earth, or Terra. You know, they just call it home. What the heck? This is our home. Uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, yeah, that's about it. I'll link to that. There's just a little bit more about the Klingons. And yeah, so that's tonight's episode. Another uh, great uh, Worf uh, related one where we get to know Worf even better. Uh, so good night. Here's some thank yous.